Prova, uno, due. Two, three, prova. At nine, see? Yeah, people are still coming in. Right? Yeah. Now is this working? Still not working. No? Hello. saw. Nora's trying to find a, a video of it we can show later if we can find it. If, if somebody else finds it, let us know and we'll, and we'll show it. Okay. Uh, a small change to the schedule is that um, the Jefferson's talk at 1140 this morning will not occur because he didn't get his flight. As I understand, it got canceled. Uh, so we'll probably just expand through that, that time which is comfortable. But in the afternoon, Nick Perga, per, 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 I can't, Nick, Nick's talk won't occur either. So we're going to move Arpad Kisa's talk, where is he, uh, to, uh, to this afternoon. Oh, okay. You found it. Okay. So where's Arpod? There. Okay, let's have Arpod talk this morning in the Jefferson slot then, and Gong can show Nick's slides in the afternoon, okay? And if Nor wants to, he can come up and show the Artemis. Is this working? Is this working? Maybe that one is better? And after... We all get out of your way. Manuel Cuesta is going to be the chair this morning, and uh, our first speaker can take a nap. <laughs> No.
not working. I don't think it's working. Hello? Hello? Who no do it? Oh, that one's working. Okay, use that one. All right. Um, thank you, Nor, for the uh, Artemis launch. Thank you for the Artemis launch. Uh, so I think we're going to start today off with uh, Francesco Pecora. He is going to be giving a talk on the uh, relaxation of the turbulent magnetosheath. 
This one is, finally. Let's see. <laughs> no. 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 I'm going to try and diagnose during the talk. <laughs> is it working? Hello? Ooh. Hello? Ooh. Ooh. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well. All right, so uh, this first talk of the morning is about relaxation in the turbulent magneto sheath. Uh, what relaxation is, we will uh, see in a bit, uh, just a list of the collaborators of, of the work. And relaxation occurs in turbulence, meaning that turbulence, turbulent system likes to reduce the magnitude of their nonlinear terms. Uh, probably the easiest uh, scenery in which we can look at what relaxation is, is the 2D hydro case that I will present in a bit. Then we see how it get more complicated in 3D MHT. Then we will see what we can study about this problem in the solar wind. And the big upgrade that we uh, can have in the magneto sheath by using MMS. So in 2D hydro, we have the we can have the 2D incompressible Navier-Stokes equation, uh, which uh, you are familiar with, and the nonlinear term is the usual b dot grad omega. Uh, this term can be written by using the stream function psi that generates the velocity field and omega in this way. So in order to reduce the strength of this term, the, you understand that this grad psi and this grad omega vectors have to be proportional to one another. They have to be either parallel or anti-parallel to one another. So Servidi et al, 2010, made 2D incompressible uh, hydro simulations and measured the angle between these two vectors, made distribution of the cosine of the angle between these two vectors, and found that this distribution is skewed toward values of minus one and plus one, indicating that these two vectors tend to align or anti-align, or in other words, they, they tend to be proportional to one another in order to reduce the strength of this term. So it's a natural tendency of the system. Sure. The, the, the difference in the, uh, I think that was due to the fact that the simulation was initialized with a finite uh, uh, velocity field with, with a finite uh, correlation between velocity and omega field. So it, that's why it's skewed toward one plus one rather than minus one. It, it, well, you can force some alignment, but we will see it's physical and not due to random processes. So in 3D MHD, of course, you, you see it gets uh, much more complicated. Uh, so we have the MHD equations, and to get the, the relations that the fields want to have to one another uh, in order to reduce the nonlinearity of the system, one has to solve this uh, minimization problem by keeping the energy constant uh, while keeping the cross helicity and the magnetic helicity, uh, so min minimizing the energy by keeping the cross helicity and the magnetic helicity constant. When this problem is solved, and there is a full literature that does that, one obtains these relations uh, between the fields, where alpha and phi are constants, they're Lagrange mul multipliers, so those are constants, so we have uh, direct relations between the fields that, as you can see, uh, are quite uh, common, like this one, where the field goes in an alvan state, the state is alvanic, or force-free, or Beltrami, and all these pairs of fields reduce these nonlinear terms. So when the fields become uh, proportional to one another in this way, all these nonlinear terms uh, tend to vanish. So again, Servidiero, 2008, performed 3D MHD simulations and found that there, there is, uh, dis the distributions of the angles between the fields are skewed toward minus one and plus one values. Again, saying that turbulence evolves toward uh, relaxed states. The only exception is the Beltrami, B and omega, which is flat. 
this means that the velocity field and the vorticity field uh, are sort of distributed randomly with respect to one another at each point. Uh, in the solar wind, again, Servidio 2014 uh, measured these, tr these kind of alignments uh, by using cluster. Uh, however, the separation between cluster spacecraft is sort of too large to get a complete answer to, to this problem in the solar wind. And then Osman, uh, 2011, uh, again looked at the solar wind and how, since in the solar wind we, we have uh, mostly single spacecraft missions and that's why we're also waiting for Helios Worm here. Um, the, the only state that can be really uh, investigated is the Albanic state. So they measured the alphanicity or basically measured the cross helicity in the solar wind, which is this red line. And you see is the, the, the degree of alphanicity of the solar wind is even larger than the one obtained in MHD simulations. And they also compared, and now getting back to, to your question before, they also compared that with fields that have random faces. So in the degree of alphanicity of the MHD simulation is larger than that that pertains to fields that, are, that have random faces. So it means that the, this property, which is even larger for the solar wind, does not uh, come from random states. It's just, it's, it's a property that pertains to turbulence itself. Uh, in the solar wind, uh, the scale, uh, I, I, I don't remember the details. It's not, it's not but, but it's not the increment, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's just, I, I don't know the cadence that, of the measurements they use. But it's point wise. No scale it's not scale dependent quantity. It's, it's just a statistical angle. Yes, yes, yes. It's, it's a time, time series of the angles. Yeah, I, I don't know that time resolution. Well, for sure, it's an MHD range. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but I, right. There is no problem about this. It's not. Uh, I think in this work, they um, sector rectified the, the intervals in order to have outward propagating, uh, they, they sector rectified in order to have outward propagating waves, and so it's mostly skewed toward plus one, that's why. And I think, no, not in the simulation. So now, again, in the solar wind, we have single spacecraft, so the alvenic state is the only one that can be really investigated. Um, so we're now attempting to close this gap in literature by using MMS, uh, because of course MMS allows us to measure curls and gradients so we can uh, proceed in understanding how relaxation works in space plasmas. Uh, so we used 1,100 uh, intervals in the magnetosheath. Some of them are reported here just to show where they are. And their duration ranges from a few tens of seconds to a few hundreds of seconds. Uh, so their, com their duration is comparable or larger than the correlation time in, in the magnetosheath. So all, mostly all of them uh, give a, a good statistical sample to investigate these properties. And of course, this is a statistical uh, property of systems, this relaxation business. And we 
do not expect to have aligned in all the samples of, of solar wind. Uh, so I, I give you two examples. One that has, as we can call, good alignment. So we have this particular time interval where all the fields show uh, some degree of alignment and some others that do not. So uh, basically this difference uh, is not inconsistent. It's not, it's just these are two complementary uh, phases of the same problem. Uh, that's because this, uh, the relaxation has to be observed as a statistical quantity. So it's a statistical property of the system. It's not something that we want to have point-wise. And these two uh, different pictures actually blend together into the picture of cellularite turbulence, where we can imagine to have sort of a good alignment in very large structures that are you know, prone to be disturbed, while we have bad alignments or less relaxed states in regions where there are strong shears and reconnection and strong gradients going on. So all these two, these two different uh, sceneries blend together here. No, no, we did not look at the properties of alpha anisis as a function of beta or temperature or whatever. It's just, it's be, yeah. separate the magneto sheet in quasi-parallel and quasi-perpendicular because mm. the, no. the plasma is completely different in both. Uh, maybe this is why... Uh, That's another thing we can... Because the quasi-parallel, you have all this, uh, you have the connection, you have current sheet mm -hmm. and all these uh, discontinuities. But this is incompressible, right? <laughs> but this is magneto sheet <laughs> measurements. Okay. Yeah. So the the simulation is compressible, I think so. No, it's because the downstream side of the, of the bus shock is highly compressed, especially mm -hmm. the, in the quasi-parallel part. It's just uh, okay. in order yes. to set up the simulation uh, according to the properties of the environment. No, but we're not doing any simulation at this point. Okay. Uh, no, this is not a simulation that pertains to this work. It's just an example to show where one can imagine these two things to happen. I, I was not in, um, I mean, this work is not to compare simulations. This is, but, uh, well, but, for another work, and, but basically it is showing the, the color map of the angle between uh, the velocity field and the magnetic field. So, yes, in this region it goes to zero, so it's less organic, yes. Anyway, this is a statistical, the relaxation business is a statistical property of the system, and if we average over all the 1,100 intervals, we see these kind of distributions. So, wherever, whatever the conditions upstream are, downstream, compressible, non-compressible, whatever, we, if we average over all of them, so we do not take into account any properties or any other plasma parameter, we get something that is like, so we have uh, the system that really tends to be uh, relaxed. Again, as in previous work with simulations, we find the Beltrami state to be an exception. These were sort of puzzling, and we went back to 1985 and make a, made a connection with 3D hydro simulations uh, from Peltz et al. And it was interesting to notice that in w when one performs a simulation of a flow in a pipe, 
does not recover the Beltrami state if this alignment is looked at throughout the whole channel. So it's interesting to see flow in a pipe behave very similarly to space plasmas, and that's something we need to investigate more. And they were able to recover the Beltrami state looking in very particular regions of the flow. So maybe there is some deeper connection to, to be made in the future. And again, going back to what you said, um, how fast this relaxation occurs. Because if the tur turbulence, um, when reaches 1 AU, has had several nonlinear times to evolve, uh, so it may be not surprising that we have something which is in a more relaxed state. But if we look downstream, where, we, where the turbulence has been recently processed by the, by the bow shock, we have sort of a younger turbulence. And one effect uh, can be uh, seen here. Well, one of the major problems is that we are not able to follow a single parcel of plasma from one point to another. So, but in this work, uh, we were able to find one, one uh, sample of solar wind that was observed first by wind and then downstream of the bow shock by MMS. And if we measure the degree of alphanicity in, in wind, is this solid line here, which is pretty high. But in MMS, the same uh, interval has this alphanicity in, in, in this parcel of solar wind has been mostly disrupted. So it means that the turbulence is being processed by the bow shock and the, these relaxation properties uh, are being you know, processed too and mostly disrupted. No, no, that's so, we, with wind, it's in the solar wind, and then it goes downstream uh, and measured by wind in downstream of the bow shock. Uh, so they looked at the uh, plasma parameters and also at the angle that the, the solar wind had uh, at the beginning with the radial direction and with the, uh, with the position. They made that sort of a triangulation between the plasma parameters and the directions of the flow with the two spacecrafts. And they saw so that uh, within 20 degrees, it is most likely to be the same parcel of plasma. And that's the thing, right? The, the shock is going to be reprocessed. Yeah, uh, right. So yeah, but, but the plasma parameters are become, are, you know, kind of similar, and the flow was in about that direction. So it's, it's the best thing we can do, right? Uh, it was... Uh, I think it was a few minutes, but uh, I, sh I should check again. I'm, don't take my words for that. Uh, I'm not sure if, if it does matter uh, if, the, if you have the same uh, parcel of plasma. Mm -hmm. Because if you, uh, if you make multiple measurements in the solar wind and in the microchip, probably you uh, will get these two. Yes, yes, curves. that's right. There is a, OK, maybe I'm not. OK, yes, you're right. If you measure these kind of properties downstream, uh, they're less uh, skewed toward the uh, equilibrium. Sure, that's right. Um, okay. <laughs> Still, the fact that the this equilibrium is disrupted is, you know, sort of interesting because we still have something that is quietly neat in equilibrium downstream. And my last point. Um, it's about residency times. So how much time does the system spend in these equilibrium states? So if we set a threshold on the angle, which is this gray bar, and we measure how long the system stays in this down uh, threshold or up threshold states, uh, we can have a, sort of an indication of for how long the system is in the, in the different uh, equilibrium states. And it is surprising, or actually nice to see, that the distribution of these residency times, which, has, which are these curves here, and these vertical lines are their um, mean values, or actually their, their first moments. Um, and the, in particular, the Alvenic, the system, 
stays in the alvenic state, so an average as long as the correlation time is. Better rephrase that. So back here, it, the gray bars are the histogram of the correlation times measured in the 1100 intervals. And the mean value of the time, of the residency time of the of the plasma in the state sort of coincides with the maximum of the correlation time, sort of indicating there is a connection between the large structures of the system with the alvenic state. Uh, as the picture of before of the large flux tube uh, whose dimension is about the correlation time. And the system spends about that time in the alvenic state. The other pairs of alignments, uh, like Beltrami and Force Free, and the other two down here, uh, sort of travel in pairs. Because and this can be sort of understood because they involve uh, gradients. So we have omega and the current density for this one, and two vector, two gradients here and two gradients here. So these two types of alignments, uh, you know, are do involve so they're more they're related to faster time scales rather than the larger uh, the larger time scales of the correlation time, and they all fall. In the uh, in in shorter time scales, so I think that's it, and I leave the conclusion. Up. I think if you if you split the statistics in the two, mm -hmm. it, it maybe the the trends will be even more clear than uh, what you get now. Mm, okay, that's an interesting point. And then for the comparison between wind and MMS, if you show the the data, so you see the structure, maybe it will ah, help. Sure. Uh, okay. Just to comprehend. Okay. Thank you. I think one point about the, w that we know from the simulations is that all of these features which emerge in both observations and simulations, they take a couple of eddy turnover times or maybe a half, somewhere between a half and a couple of eddy turnover times to appear. So if you start with random phase initial conditions, none of these things are there. They're all absent. You run a code, 2D, 3D, hydro, MHD, doesn't matter you get some kind of reduction of the strength of nonlinearities in about, in about an eddy turnover time, let's say. So the, the moral of the story seems to be that when the turbulence is, has time to relax, it will go to these states. But if you hit it very strongly, like by processing through a shock or stream-stream interaction or something, it drives it away from the relaxed states. And that's also consistent with the picture that Chicho sh showed, where if you have the big relaxed islands, you get better alignments, and in between, it's, it's messy. So there's a general principle at work, I think, that it goes beyond, the mag say, the magnetosheath or, or any individual. Probably the same thing is true in a tokamak, I would think.
So for our next speaker, uh, Zoltan Vodos, he'll be talking about the energy budget in the turbulent magneto sheath. Then we have a non-local pressure. 
pressure. Okay, which means that if an LED evolves in a space at one location, it sends out pressure waves and then uh, these pressure forces uh, change uh, at, this, at larger distances. So there is large scale, small scale interaction by, by pressing the cascade. It's textbook, okay. Then another approach, also in hydrodynamics, that uh, if we take the velocity tensor and we use the uh, usual splitting into symmetric and asymmetric part, which means vorticity and, and strain, then according to Zinnober, 2004, uh, there is a functional relationship between the, the vorticity field and the strain for given boundary conditions, and these are the den determining the, the last k flow. It's again non-local interaction. In plasmas, <coughs> Shekho Chikin proposed that the uh, eddies uh, somehow stretch and fold the magnetic field, and then across the magnetic field, we, we, we have uh, very small scale structures with opposite. Dilations, <laughs> and uh, when uh, this uh, uh, magnetic field uh, structure is reaching the, the size of the flow due to magnetic tension, again there can there can be a non-local interaction between the magnetic field and the last scale flow. Okay, and of course we can see in the microsheets some kind of stretching and folding of the magnetic field. So, the moral is that if we want to understand turbulence, we have to look into gradients. And I think the right way to look into the gradients in case of collision of space plasma turbulence is using these equations, uh, which are coming from uh, recent numerical simulation by Young, Bill, and so on and so on. Uh, this is a combination of Maxwell equations with the multi species collision and Maxwell equation. These are the first three moments. This is the point in the theorem, okay? And we have uh, electromagnetic energy, uh, fluid flow energy, internal en energy, uh, time variations versus these uh, terms. This is the G dot E, which is usually considered in reconnection physics. And we have this pressure state interaction term. And <coughs> the idea is that here is the thermal energy, and on the right hand side, we have the pressure strain interaction then, which means that the pressure strain interaction can uh, be associated with the increase of thermal energy, not G dot E. So if we make averages, we can uh, neglect these divergence terms because these are transport terms. And now <coughs> what I want to show you, here are uh, recent simulation 2.5 dimensional kinetic field simulations by Young, and it is showing how the different energy forms are evolving in time. This uh, omega C I is the ion cyclotron frequency. Okay. And now you can see I, I, I use the color code for in the equation the same color code here. Uh, we can see that the after some time the thermal energy of ion Electron fluctuations is the same as the integration.
The good news is, if there is no inertia range, in, in the same simulations, comparing the 2.5 and 3, 3D simulations, in 2.5 <coughs> there is inertia range, in 3D there is no inertia range, but this is only simulation because we have different sizes of simulation boxes. So there is no inertia range here, but if there is no inertia range, we can still use the, <coughs> the pressure strain, strain term to estimate the energy transfer rate, while epsilon from the Yagon law cannot be used. Okay. So the good news is that instead of 17% 17, 17 of Mamesh's time intervals, when using this pressure strain, we can use 100% and make much better statistics. And <coughs> indeed, <coughs> if we took the average fluxes, uh, which are which are averaged and filtered, you can see that over the fluid case, this Yagno law dominates. But when we are approaching the electron uh, fluid scales, then it is uh, decreasing, but the pressure strain uh, term is increasing. And this is the uh, energy which is con conserved over the case. So if we estimate the energy from the pressure strain here, it is actually the epsilon. Okay. <coughs> now, there are <coughs> two distinctive features in turbulence, which uh, was pointed by Bill, by Young, and so on, that we have covalent structures in plasma turbulence, and when we smooth and filter, uh, then we, we see some cascade like properties. So, covalent structures versus cascade. If we look, <coughs> into coherent structures. We, we see coherent structures in current density, in pressure uh, strain, in G dot e, in temperatures, in all this. If we overlap, for example, current, current density, current density plus epsilon, current density plus epsilon plus G dot e, we, we see that the width of the coherent structures are widening, so these are not fully overlapping. These are region, regionally correlated structures. <coughs> now, if we <coughs> look into one interval, uh, this is MLS in the Mandushis, quasi parallel Mandushis. We can see here is the magnetic field, the curvature of the magnetic field, the current. We can see from the current density that it is really fluctuating in a <coughs> very intermittent manner. There are several sub-intervals which uh, have been analyzed, uh, identifying magnetic reconnections, strong current sheet, electron scales, signatures of magnetic reconnections, so on. I'm not going into details. <coughs> but if we calculate the G dot D, because these, these uh, coherent structures are sometimes very narrow, and we have to <coughs> take the electric field from the generalized zones. So if we take the the G dot E, the moving frame of the plasma, and G dot E coming from the uh, uh, divergence of the electron <laughs> pressure, then we see the same coherent structure, <coughs> and we can see that all the structures are uh, somehow uh, associated or, or correlated with the currents. So it is <coughs> a kind of old result that when we make conditional statistics, <coughs> if the current is increasing, then we, we see increase in G dot E. So at current, we have increased energy conversion. Another result of the same type is from just a piece. Again, <coughs> when the current, normalized current is increasing, we see increased energy conversion or temperatures, electron temperatures. Now, <coughs> if we look into the pressure strain, Interaction terms, this is by Joseph is again. So we <coughs> look into the pressure tensor and the velocity tensor, taking the symmetric part because the velocity doesn't play too much role. So we, we calculate the V theta, which is the compressional channel, and this is the PID with the symmetric part of the velocity tensor and pressure. This is the <coughs> uncompressional part. We, we can again make correlation, correlation here is the current shift with the increased electron temperature and then we have this V theta and V I terms here. <coughs> Obviously, it's not so simple.
simple because if we compare two cases, <coughs> sometimes we have increased electron temperature, but here we have, according to this pressure strain terms, an expanding and cooling plasma, and here with the increased electron temperature we have compressed with heated plasma. So it can be associated with some transport, which means heat heat transport, which means that the transport terms have to be uh, uh, accounted for as well. Now, <coughs> if we go, go, go back to the same MMS interval, we calculated is the, the current and then the ion and electron PIDs and ion and electron P theta. This is the compressional channel and this is the uncompressional. You can see that, for example, here is some enhanced currents, and both the electrons and ions show some energy conversions. But here, for example, only the electron the electrons show some response. So uh, it has to be understood what is happening at different current sheets, what kind of energy conversions are going on. So. In the project, we have proposed not uh, conditional statistics only at currents, but conditional statistics at uh, each individual current structure. And obviously, if we say that we have enhanced fluctuations, wave activity, non maxwell identity, and all these at current structures, all this has to be investigated on the basis of conditional statistics. Uh, this example is showing magnetic lake connection for MS, <coughs> showing that. We have uh, this lab base and rather heavy drift base associated with this current sheet. Okay, so this is in the turbine under sheets. Now, if we want to calculate the, the cascade like smooth quantities, so we can, uh, we can take the local energy proxies. Uh, Luca used local energy transfer. But not only transfer, but we can consider transfer conversion uh, all, all these terms together. And we can take, as in uh, Hadid, we can take the absolute value uh, or, the, or the average of these uh, local energy <coughs> boxes, but those might not convert. Okay. <coughs> we can we, we could take filtered labs, as in simulations, but then we have to average in space. And as a as a uh, option, we have we can take cumulative zooms, sums at one scale of the diagram. What it, what does it mean? <coughs> a cumulative sum in, in a in a time is just the sum of the all previous uh, IP theta. So for example, here is the IP ion uh, P theta, <coughs> conventional channel. It is very difficult to say if this is going towards large scales or towards small scales. But if we take the cumulative sums, you see, <coughs> in each coherent structure, there, there, there is a step function which is going in the positive direction or going to the negative direction. And when, it, when there is no change here, there, then we are in between coherent structures where there is no energy conversion. So we can sum up minus and plus energy and separate it, okay? And we can say what is going to the largest case. Oh, unimportant, unimportant, unimportant. Now, what I want to uh, show, this is the electron PID cumulative sum. And this is the electron temperature along the field and perpendicular. And this is the heat flux along the field and perpendicular. If we compare the heat flux with the temperatures, we don't see very good correlation. But if we go to the cumulative sum, actually from the PID sum you see nothing. But if you take the cumulative sum, whenever it is changing here, there is temperature misotropy. Change can 
around it. We have to understand those equations. If, if we understand the energy content, then we can uh, better, better understand gay particle interactions. That's it. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Uh, yeah, very interesting stuff. I, I have a comment and a question. The comment is that um, th there is some similar work done uh, also by the local group here in Florence and led by Petra Ellinger about calculating the energy flux and with similar conclusions about the, the including the, 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 um, the string tensor, mm -hmm. uh, the pressure tensor and uh, um, yeah, and the contribution to the cascade. Yeah, uh, and so uh, so it will be good to compare those because we, we have results from simulations as well. So, and the question is: so, in in, in light of all these, uh, do you think then that our approach uh, about temperatures and anisotropies and so uh, in quantifying the heating that we have should be all revised? And also, when we look in the solar wind and we look at how temperatures scale with distance, not necessarily. Uh, there is a space for expansion, okay? In the molecular sheets, there is less space. And also, the temperature, heating, anisotropy can have different sources. Mm -hmm. So it is not about revision. It is just to say that if this uh, uh, flow shear is one mechanism which in the molecular sheets can produce this, generate this temperature anisotropy. It's not yet published, but we are going to submit it. But, but, okay, do, yeah, but do you think that similar processes can be at work in the solar sure. wind? Uh, and, okay. and, and, and of course, in the solar wind, and again, what I am saying, there is no way uh, about going about those uh, energy terms in the solar wind. We have to calculate gradients. There is no other solution. We need multi-point. With high resolution, fully equipped, $5 billion mission. That's it. So one thing occurred to me, Zoltan, when you were just answering uh, Lorenzo's question, is that there's this kind of related phenomenon that I think Osman saw, and again, it was Osman and Servadillo and others uh, 10 years ago. They looked at the PVI, which is the, the roughness, of various things, the density, the velocity, the magnetic field, and found that the high PVI regions of everything are found at the boundaries of the Brazil plot, which is interesting. And I think it's related to, sure. to what you're talking sure. about. Sure. Gradients in general, yes. I think, yeah. can produce kinetic <coughs> responses. Yes, yeah. Emilia will talk afternoon about PVI in the solar wind. However, I would say that PVI is an approximation. No, yeah, just it a is not a real gradient. Right. It, okay. It yeah. is showing some way for comprehension and understanding, but it is not the final answer. Right. It's just supposed to be a quick way to find interesting yeah. things. Right. <laughs> I, I had another question. You referred a number of times to the project. Is this something that you're proposing to? Yeah, we have submitted this project. It was uh, <laughs> rejected. <laughs> Uh, but I think for formal reasons, and we have resubmitted it now, we, we hope to get some funding for, for this work and some postdocs. Well, I would certainly encourage you to proceed. Thank you. Very nice work. All right, I think uh, we need to switch on to the next. Thank you. All right, so. Yep. All right, so uh, the next presenter is Massimo Matarassi. Uh, he'll be presenting uh, Chaos and Predictability in VTech time series.
Should I use the microphone seriously? Yeah, you yeah, perfect. Can you hear me now? Much better. Great. So, um, I'm going s uh, slightly inner, uh, closer to the, to, the, to the planet, because I'm speaking about uh, the ionosphere, and in particular, the question of predictability. That is, how can we say whether we are sure via uh, prior or empirical models to uh, predict and within which uh, time and uh, within which time scale we can predict the behavior of uh, an ionospheric proxy. It's not that uh, necessary that I remind you that the Earth's ionosphere, <coughs> the Earth's ionosphere is basically uh, an open system, open and uh, undergoing um, fluid uh, magnetic fluid mechanical stress of the solar wind and uh, the tuning and uh, uh, overall, um, let's say, activation by the solar, by the solar radiation. Uh, all in all, we can say that the Earth's ionosphere is a dirty plasma, very rich and uh, inhomogeneous, uh, responding to many forcings. Uh, it is a complex system, and uh, we shouldn't take uh, its uh, predictability for granted. Our central question is whether uh, one can quantify the predictability of the ionospheric behavior, which is, on the one hand, extremely interesting from a theoretical point of view, because we are uh, debating whether the ionosphere should be uh, treated via uh, deterministic or partially stochastic um, models, and also very important from uh, a user point of view, so to speak, for navigation, positioning. And, uh, okay, um, the role of solar cycle in the predictability and regularity of the ionospheric behavior should be, of course, uh, investigated. We are... Can you hear me now? Okay, okay, great. So, uh, the two quantities that I'm going to use uh, is the Hausdorff dimension of the ionospheric trajectory, so to speak, within a suitably constructed, I'm gonna tell you how, um, uh, phase space that should represent the motion of a parent, so to speak, system generating the proxy, the ionospheric proxy that we are uh, analyzing. And the Kolmogorov entropy rate production K2, which is a quantity telling us uh, how long the memory, so to say, of the trajectory is kept by the evolving system. Or, if you want, uh, its, its inverse is uh, basically the um, predictability time threshold of the, of the system. Um, the physical proxy that I'm going to use is the vertical TC, total electron content time series that I'm, that I'm defining in a while. And I am we are making the comparison between the analysis, the calculation of, this, of those quantities um, in two years, uh, one of solar maximum and one of solar minimum, because we expect these to distinct, be, mm, let's say, to investigate two different physical conditions. So, a few words about such a popular quantity in the community of ionospheric physicists, the total electron content. Basically, the total electron content is the integral over a given, typically, straight ray path um, of the... Uh, I'm, I'm going to use this... of the um, free electron density. I, if you make the integration of the free electron density along a given uh, path gamma, you are getting something which is proportional to the ionization contribution to the uh, optical uh, ray, um, to the optical path of the radio wave propagating along this uh, path. This is why uh, it is very popular in terms of uh, um, radio uh, of radio uh, physics of the ionosphere. If you want to characterize the local ionosphere on the top of a given uh, location 
in terms of uh, radio propagation properties, you can define the vertical total electron content, which is trivially the total electron content on the vertical from the Earth up to the quote of GNSS satellites. Okay? So, we are starting with a very presumably trivial example, uh, a mid-latitude location that is Matera GNSS uh, station, uh, considering the two uh, one, long, uh, one year long time series of uh, the uh, maximum and the minimum, 2001 and 2008, as you may see, the time series of total electron of vertical total electron content on the top of Matera uh, are roughly uh, similar in terms of seasonal structures. Only the excursions in the uh, during the um, maximum solar maximum year are much wider than in the solar minimum. Okay. Now, when you have this, uh, when you have this proxy that is basically uh, some kind of, uh, uh, let's say, values uh, time series, scalar time series, you would like to reconstruct a, a finite dimensional but multidimensional um, uh, dynamical system, uh, the trajectory of which should produce uh, this uh, uh, scalar time series. The process that you adopt is uh, the so-called uh, um, embedding procedure. So you consider, you assume that the, um, let's say, configuration of this multidimensional parent system is given by the elencation of M, which is the dimension, tentative dimension of this, of this system, uh, M subsequent values uh, of the time series spaced by a certain um, amount of time delta. This delta is chosen uh, not being too wide because actually all these values should represent the, comp the independent components of this multidimensional um, uh, vector at the same time as a snapshot. Okay? But on the other hand, this, the, uh, these um, components having to be independent uh, on each, uh, of each other, uh, you have to take uh, delta big enough so that, for instance, the self-mutual information of two subsequent values is smaller than a certain threshold, that in our case is 0 0.4, and then you get, for our vertical TEC, a delta of approximately 40 uh, minutes. Uh, now, you have the development of this once you have chosen your M, and I'll tell you how, uh, you have in this finite dimensional but multidimensional parent space the evolution of your uh, system that should give, should have the same properties from a complexity point of view of your uh, time series from which you start. The correlation dimension D2 of the evolution is calculated as the Hausdorff dimension of the resulting trajectory according to Grassberger and Procaccia formula, which is here. This is the correlation of the of two, let's say, instance of this uh, parent directory. Now the Hausdorff them here I assume here I am assuming that I have already understood which is the best uh, dimension for the parent uh, system. Now I'm going to tell you uh, in a while how you choose it. But the key point is that I am, um, I am trying to calculate the Hausdorff dimension of the trajectory of this parent system. Why? Because the Hausdorff dimension of the trajectory does characterize the regularity of the system and its dynamics. Integrable, predictable forever systems have, of course, a one-dimensional trajectory because they are regular, so this D2 should be one. In the case of chaos, various degrees of chaos, you have very little predictable systems and they have a larger than one uh, Hausdorff dimension, which has, of course, to be 
smaller than the uh, dimension of the space uh, containing it, and this, give, this gives rise to regular trajectory within strange attractors, typically characterizing chaotic systems. So this is much less predictable than this, and uh, if you have a Hausdorff dimension that goes to the dimension of the full uh, containing space, then you should think about stochasticity, fully probabilistic system that de facto can jump everywhere at each single, at each single time, filling your space. So actually, when you try a given uh, dimension M for your parent uh, system, you, you uh, can calculate once the uh, attempt M is uh, fixed, you calculate D2, the Hausdorff dimension of the trajectory, which clearly grows, as tends to grow, as you try larger and, and larger parent uh, dimension. When do you have to stop? When this quantity, as a function of M, uh, saturates, okay? then you have included all and not more that you need to know from the dynamical parent system. In both years, uh, solar maximum and solar minimum, this parent directory, uh, so sorry, parent uh, system, of course, uh, has dimension equal to three, okay? Uh, which is pretty interesting, and uh, at a glance, here you have section of the trajectory of the parent system in the maximum and minimum of the solar uh, cycle, at a glance, uh, they are very similar to each other. And when these uh, glancing considerations, so to speak, are put into numbers, calculating explicitly the Hausdorff, the Hausdorff dimension of those trajectory, surprisingly, apparently surprisingly, you get the same dimension. So the degree of... Uh, so to speak, irregularity of your um, attractor of the motion of this parent system giving rise to VTC in both years are the same. Which is, uh, okay, first consideration, this 2.78 Hausdorff dimension within a three-dimensional space is a very big number. So actually your attractor is a very thick one, a very thick cloud, and this means that the system is highly regular. Your ionosphere overall, along one year, is very irregular. Even if we are starting from a mid-latitude, very boring, nothing happened place. Uh, from the ionospheric point of view, Matera is a wonderful town from many other <laughs> perspectives. Uh, <coughs> the surprising thing, the other surprising thing is that apparently apparently there is no difference between solar minimum and solar maximum years. And this is surprising because you know that in solar maximum years you have many more storms deeply influencing your, presumably, your ionosphere. But we, here we have actually uh, not distinguished quiet and stormy periods. We have put them all together within one year and this possibly averages away the differences, the, the, the uh, physical differences in terms of this uh, chaoticity measurement. So, once the irregularity of the trajectory is uh, discussed, let's, let's pass to uh, the time horizon of uh, predictability, which is calculated via a quantity uh, named uh, uh, Kolmogorov entropy rate, uh, K, K2 in, in uh, Grasberger and Prokasha formulation, which is, uh, okay, in few words, it is uh, the ignorance amount about the precise location of the trajectory that the system generates in its dynamics while going from one uh, moment, one, one instant, to the next one that you have sampled in your time series, okay? Um, so namely, the inverse of this quantity is the time after which the predictability of the system uh, trajectory position lacks of more than one bit, which in practice means <coughs> sorry, that the system is, how to say, 
losing memory in a sense, in an in a information theory sense of its uh, precedent po position. If you have a fully predictable uh, system, that is if you find k equals zero, uh, of course the system has uh, infinite uh, time, uh, provisional time, so to speak. Uh, so the system fully predictable is uh, predictable forever and k equals zero. With larger than zero k you have predictable within some time, like for instance the weather forecast. I can't tell you uh, whether on Christmas it's going to snow, to rain or, or whatever, or be very sunny and dry. Uh, but I can reasonably expect that tomorrow the weather on Florence will be very similar to, to today. And this is basically what will happen in our chaotic system. Last but not least, if you had a stochastic system, uh, this quantity should go to infinite because this must go to zero, being de facto delta correlated in time, uh, the position of the system that throws the dice every time. Now, what do we find in our case? We find, okay, finally a difference, we are very happy, that during the solar maximum, the system is slightly less predictable than in the case of minim solar minimum, because, okay, uh, the time horizon, time predictability horizon is sorry, predictability time horizon in the solar maximum year is 7.64 uh, uh, minutes, while slightly more than 8 minutes is uh, in the case of the solar minimum. So one minute of difference. So apparently the stronger influence of solar wind, sudden impacts, I mean storms, uh, magnetic storms and substorms, uh, at solar maximum renders less predictable the ionospheric uh, evolution, the ionospheric local evolution. And this is uh, expected. Now, what is uh, to be... Okay, thank you. What is to be uh, clarified is uh, a little apparent paradox. However, how can... Okay, if you look at the total electron content, which is a degree of... Uh, uh, ionization on the top of, of, of uh, a place on Earth. Uh, so how can this, uh, if you look at this uh, uh, quantity, basic, basically it is quasi-periodic with a quasi-period, so to speak, of 24 hours due to the insulation, the, the rotation of our planet. So how can be the quasi 24H periodic VTC uh, minute predictable. How can it have minutes of predictability? If I look at the, 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 the track of the VTEC and discover that it is almost periodic uh, in, in 24 hours. Actually, the point is that as we didn't distinguish, uh, uh, we, we not only didn't distinguish uh, quiet and stormy periods, within one year, but also we didn't separate, um, let's say, the time scales forming our uh, time series. So the point is that one year long time series have been analyzed without distinguishing different time scale contributions. So we didn't separate this uh, apparent, peri apparent real periodicity from the small uh, uh, fluctuations, and what happens is that this analysis is suggested, which is already, uh, I mean, we are already doing it, uh, by making a multi-scale analysis of the VTEC time series and re-interrogating uh, them uh, about the Hausdorff dimension and the Kolmogorov entropy rate. Okay? So, I would go to the conclusion. We have found that a three-dimensional phase space contains the dynamical system associated to the Matera GNSS station, uh, VTEC time series. 
there are no sensible uh, difference in the topology of the trajectory of this parent uh, dynamical system because the Hausdorff dimension of the trajectories that is of the attractor is uh, the same uh, in the two years. There is slightly better predictability of vertical TEC during the solar minimum, uh, just one minute, slightly more than one minute of difference. The future work, in order to understand better the predictability in physical terms, which is what we are interested in, is that uh, we have to investigate different locations on the Earth, so <coughs> different local physics of the ionosphere, and uh, different magnetic activity period, because I will be very curious of, of what K2 and D2 do before, during the, the sudden commencement, for instance, of a, uh, a, a magnetic storm, the recovery phase and after it. And we have to face different time scales separately, for instance, via some empirical model decomposition, in order to disentangle those riddles about scales and time uh, predictability horizon. Okay, this is all as science is concerned. Politically speaking, I have to say that I am indebted with my cat Jungle Boogie because he has landed his favorite laser to me just to, just to make this presentation. I thank you for your attention and patience. Thank you very much. Uh, we only have time for about one question. You, you mentioned at the end that there is this tau, the, the time scale that uh, impact your uh, analysis. If you were to, you have this m equals three when you do this uh, d two. I'm sorry. Say it again. the earlier yes. part yes so that what you meant by if you want to change to a different uh, time re time scale to to redo this analysis yes but not just like uh, Fourier analysis with some more sophisticated uh, uh, tools like empirical mode decomposition if I correctly interpret your question uh, I, I guess my question is if you use different tau to get this m equal to 3 so if you use, instead of 0.4 hours, you use 5 hours, whatever, then are you still going to get the same dimension that the D2 oh. will still be 2.87 or something like that? We have tried this, uh, this uh, approach, uh, of course, because we had to understand which is uh, the, better, the better delta. And basically, that delta that we, we were speaking about is the right is the right thing because uh, it is a compromise between uh, okay i mean uh, small enough and big enough uh, i'm sorry possibly i have misunderstood your question uh, we can speak uh, sure. later together thank you very much thank you thank you oh you have a question oh is it quick Okay. Uh, just a curiosity question. Is it possible to do this type of study also with, with, a, with other kind of uh, proxy like uh, radiocarbon or radio beryllium or probably cosmic rays uh, in the time series of... Uh... Well, yes, in principle, yes, of course, of course. I'm not an expert of, uh, of cosmic rays and so on, but actually... I think that uh, the point is that basically whenever you have uh, a scalar proxy, you imagine that this is uh, a function depending on the point, uh, approximately, of uh, uh, in, in a suitable, so to speak, um, phase space. Okay? There is a parent system, uh, possibly a complex system, uh, and, and you have this, uh, y your proxy is a scalar field in that space. Okay, so if you, there is a theorem showing that, that this um, uh, embedding theorem, that if you take uh, suitably 
spaced uh, subsequent values of this of this uh, scalar proxy, you have something uh, diffeomorphic to a local map of your uh, parent system. So um, the the key point is uh, I agree. I mean the answer is yes, definitely you can do it with whatever uh, proxy y you want. Uh, on the earth, but you have to understand what you're speaking about precisely. For instance, uh, cosmic rays, okay, I guess, I guess uh, you have to select the direction, possibly the source, because speaking about all the cosmic rays uh, reaching a point from every possible direction, what system are you speaking about? You're mixing, I don't know, this, this galaxy here from that and, and that uh, quasar over there. I don't know, I don't know, I'm not an astronomer, you know, so... Yeah, 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 yeah. And of course, all those uh, quantities uh, that you can measure in the, in the um, geospace plasma are definitely prone to this analysis and I would like to do it very much. All right, thank you. Um, speaker is going to be Giuseppe Ciardullo, sì. and he is going to be presenting a new investigation of a tropical cyclone, uh, observational and turbulence analysis for the Faraji hurricane. USB. Ah, okay. Go ahead and come closer. Oh, USB C. USB-C, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, ah, okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, this is a new uh, preliminary work uh, uh, with a new investigation of a tropical cyclone. Uh, that this is based on two different uh, kind uh, of analysis that uh, are compa are uh, linked each other. Um, this is the case of study. Uh, this is, is Faraji hurricane. It's the most powerful hurricane of the Indian Ocean uh, tropical season 2021. And uh, I applied this, uh, uh, these two, two kind of analysis based on the two different, uh, uh, two different satellite database uh, that is geostationary from which uh, I apply uh, also a kind of turbulence analysis that is not really turbulence, but uh, uh, is, uh, is, uh, we call turbulence like uh, a random superposition of uh, the energy transfer related on the different scales in the, in the cyclone uh, structures. And uh, a polar satellite analysis based on uh, a comparison, a technical comparison of uh, the physical quantities calculated by manipulation of the data. This is the, these are the two, uh, the complete database, and these are the, 
the two different data sets from uh, geostationary satellites, especially Severi, that is uh, the radiometer of uh, MSG8 uh, satellite platform, uh, from which uh, I, I have uh, uh, 93 images available. Uh, and these images are, uh, uh, had a have a dimension of uh, 350 per 350 pixels square. Uh, and uh, it, they show a total sensing period of the life day of, of the cyclone of uh, 23 hours in a uh, sen uh, sensing time step of 15 minutes. For the, the other data set, the polar one, I choose uh, four different uh, satellites with three different radiometers, that is MODIS from the satellites EOS, uh, Aqua and Terra, uh, the SLSTR, uh, the radiometer from Sentinel-3, and VIRS from SWAMI MPP. And uh, I choose this for to uh, show uh, the different uh, uh, the different special resolution from the geostationary one in a time resolution of uh, uh, two images per day uh, in average and a total uh, data set of 33 images. From the geostationary satellite uh, analysis, I choose uh, this type of raw products from the data set of uh, VIRS. In uh, each image, the pixel contain uh, the values in digital number from which I can obtain the uh, radiance recorded at the sensor using uh, G and B parameters, that is uh, calibration parameters from the, the satellite, uh, from the instrument. And after that, inverting the plant's law, I obtain the brilliance temperature field, uh, fixing, fixing the the value of the central wavelength, like the wavelength of the thermic infrared uh, spectral band. And uh, after that, I apply this uh, uh, empirical equation from, uh, from, uh, from which I calculate the value of the altitude of the uh, cloudy system associated with the cyclone and the effective temperature, like a really uh, uh, closest value of the temperature uh, always associated with the, with the cloudy system, uh, fix it, this value, that is uh, the, air, uh, the air temperature uh, at two meters recorded from, uh, from the forecasting model, the global forecasting model. And after that, I apply a proper orthogonal decomposition that is uh, an empirical uh, spectral decomposition on all the snapshots of the, uh, of the cyclone on the, scalar, uh, the, the, te the effective temperature scalar field. Just a quick question. So you have the, the intensity of the image and you have some temperature data. Yes. Do you have velocity data too? Uh, not not uh, in this image, but I, I'm looking for uh, uh, images uh, about the... the Uh, yes, but in this kind of analysis, we uh, I I did uh, I didn't use this this type of uh, is an analysis uh, based compo uh, based on uh, a scalar field uh, the the scalar temperature field and uh, from the time averaging uh, temperature field of Faraji that is the effective temperature I use uh, the image like. Uh, I choose uh, all the snapshots uh, uh, for to to apply the uh, to DFFT, and uh, from the KX KY, KY plane, I apply a shell integrated spectrum uh, time averaging in all the the sensing time of the snapshot, and I obtain uh, a, a spectra of the energy like uh, the uh, the square module of the temperature. Uh, on the on the value of the module of the wave vector, and this is the first promising result because uh, uh, from uh, this type of spect uh, of spectrum, it's possible to see that uh, we have three different uh, zones of the spectra, and uh, for this reason, I uh, I choose to define this uh, these three different zones like. Uh, uh, Zones uh, related to uh, macro scales, the meso scales and the small scales of the of this of the, the central structure of the special component of the cyclone. Because 
from the POD is possible to uh, fr uh, uh, is possible to extract the eigen functions that uh, uh, ha uh, ha has uh, that have uh, the or uh, orthogonality property from which it's possible to factorize the special component from the temporal one. From the special component, I obtain this spectra, and these, these uh, are the eigenfunctions that has, uh, that has related with uh, the, uh, 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 respectively with the macro scales, meso scales, and small scales, from which it's possible to see how to the structures in the cyclones evolving into, into the different uh, scales of uh, the special component. And uh, for, every of this, for, for, uh, for each of these uh, game functions, uh, I, uh, we apply also the shell-integrated Fourier spectra, from which it's possible to see that the max value of k is uh, always shifted for, uh, towards the, the, the highest value of, uh, of, uh, of k in uh, in the special uh, in the special component, so uh, I, the the maximum value of k uh, is shifted towards uh, is uh, always higher towards the the small scales the, the smaller scales, and this is for the special component. This uh, this is uh, uh, for the the temporal component because from the the temporal evolution of the POD. Uh, coefficients from uh, always from this uh, this type of uh, of analysis uh, it's possible to obtain the temporal evolution in red uh, for the for the pod coefficients and then uh, the fourier spectra of uh, of the same coefficients using the the, the same time uh, the same type of uh, of uh, evaluation in the uh, uh, in the maximum value of the frequency that is uh, that is moving shifted towards the, the, the highest value of, uh, of the omega. And from that, uh, it's also possible to calculate the energy spectrum from the temporal evolution of, uh, of the cyclone. And also in this case, we, uh, in, in, such, in such a way, we can obtain uh, three different uh, uh, zones with the, with the, the uh, spectral uh, slopes that uh, are uh, always in all the, in all the zone. Uh, closest to the, the, the indexes to, to minus two. And this is uh, uh, another, another result for this uh, new kind of, uh, of investigation. In the last, uh, in the last phase of the, of the analysis, from the orthogonality of the, the again functions, it is possible also to apply a reconstruction uh, of, uh, of the temperature field uh, using the partial sums. And uh, uh, in this slide, I show that uh, uh, I obtained for this work these reconstructions at uh, the different scales. That is, for the micro scales in which we see the central structures of the cyclone with the, the, the real values of temperature. And then this kind of structures is, uh, uh, is going to, 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 to become a uh, uh, filament structures in the meson scales and also the sp uh, only the spots uh, of energy in the small scales. This is also uh, comparable with, uh, which I, uh, with which I obtained in a previous work in which I, do, I did the same uh, kind of analysis but only on the brightness temperature field, not in the effective one. This is, yes. Yeah. The panels below represent the reconstruction via partial summing of the panels above. I mean, the panels above are the truth, uh, so to speak. The and panels above is based on uh, a brightness temperature field okay. that is obtained directly ah, okay. from the data. Okay. Yes. Clear. This is Sorry. Uh, Sorry. Uh, uh, applying a manipulation of the data with, uh, with, uh, the, the, with the, the calculation of the altitude and effective temperature. I of the first slide that yes, you gave in exactly. the Thank I, you. Thank uh, you. I reuse this type of analysis on the, the effective temperature field. For the second part of the, the work, uh, we have uh, uh, this, uh, this kind of analysis that is uh, uh, also based, uh, uh, this, 
This is based on the, all the space-borne imagery that's acquired from the three satellites uh, that, that I showed pre previously. And uh, for, uh, only for MODIS, for the, the MODIS uh, sensor, it's, uh, uh, I need to, to, do, to do in a preprocessing phase a georeference and pixel resampling. And uh, after that, for all the images, for to, for to have uh, um, uh, images comparable uh, each other, uh, I apply a resizing uh, preprocessing phase. After that, uh, obtaining the brightness temperature, I apply, uh, I, uh, I, I build a temperature map, and then uh, I, I calculate for the first calculation the same uh, altitude and effective temperature like in the question in the previous slide. And uh, from the, uh, just from the altitude and effective temperature, I evaluate also in a qualitative uh, empirical way the temperature gradient, just like a variation of the effective temperature to varying the, the, the altitude in the, in the different layers of the, of the clouds uh, associated with the, with the cyclone. And uh, after that, I calculate also from the effective temperature, the scale 8. Yeah? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and fr uh, fr uh, from the scalate, also, uh, I, I did a calculation of the atmospheric pressure using the, this exponential law, with the H is the, in which H is the altitude. And uh, at the end, I apply also a comparison of the analysis between the three different sensors, so the, between the, uh, all the imagery from the three, the three different satellites. Also comparing a temporal trend of the pressure in the eye of the cyclone in all the life days uh, or that, that, that I consider. This is uh, the results from MODIS. From MODIS, I have uh, uh, um, this kind of, uh, of raw products just from the satellite. And uh, uh, for this reason, I need to, to apply uh, um, uh, a georeference application from which you obtain this kind of new image. And from that, I apply also a resizing, just to focus uh, the, the cyclone in, the, in, in, uh, his, uh, in his central structure. From this kind of image, I apply the temperature map, in which I consider uh, all the, temp the brightness temperature interval, and I divided this into different uh, sub-ranges, uh, to, which I, uh, to which I relate a uh, different color for to, for just for to see that uh, from this kind of images that, that has, has a higher special uh, resolution, uh, that, that uh, it's possible to see, to better to, to, to visualize the, uh, the zone of the eye and the, the eye wall and all the, out, uh, the outermost uh, region with the different value of brightness temperature. That became this kind of image if in terms of altitude and this kind of image in, in terms of effective temperature. From that, I apply the vertical gradient and uh, it's possible to see in uh, this uh, kind of, uh, of representation that uh, uh, we have a different value of the, the vertical gradient that is uh, uh, higher in the outermost region and uh, is uh, uh, lower in the, in the central structure, but always uh, is, uh, uh, is, is uh, over the the, the cutoff of the vertical gradient in the uh, stability condition of the atmosphere. And uh, after that, uh, this is a representation of the pressure field from which it's possible also to see, the, just to visualize in this case, uh, the, the value that is near to the, to the minimum of, yeah? Yes, exactly. Yes, it's, uh, exactly, yes. And uh, so this is uh, 
just to see how the, to the pressure evolve in the different uh, special in the different zone in the different uh, structures of uh, uh, regions of the structure of the cyclone. The same is doing for uh, SLSTR that is uh, from Sentinel three, in which we have uh, a kind of uh, uh, similar uh, image, but not in the, in that case is not. Uh, uh, is not applied the georeference because the, this is the product, uh, the, the, the visualization product, the raw product from the satellite. This is the temperature map, and only just to see also the same uh, kind of analysis. Also, also here we have uh, this, the same uh, uh, the same procedure steps, and uh, finally also from Veers that it seems that uh, is the. Uh, the, 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 most, uh, the most important in terms of special resolution visual, uh, visualization, because uh, in this case, for an example, it's possible to see, to better to see the value of the, the, the pressure uh, in, uh, in, in the eye of the cyclone and also the, the, uh, the outer regions that is uh, comp okay, that composing the, the, the regions of the high wall but also the, the outermost regions one. This is just uh, f for all, all, all also for uh, the previous case. This is just an image, uh, an, uh, an example of the image data set for uh, for this kind uh, for for the cyclone. We have also the same procedure, and uh, finally we arrive to a, a kind of uh, qualitative comparison from this polar satellite result in which I insert um, a comparison of the zoom in the, in the eye zone of the, of, the central, uh, of the central structures for the cyclone for all the uh, images that, is, that, that are closest to the most uh, significant intensification uh, time of, uh, of, this, uh, of this hurricane. And, uh, from uh, uh, this is also to, to vis this is only to visualize like uh, uh, the, it, the 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 higher quality of the higher special uh, resolution of the of this kind uh, uh, of polar satellite. Uh, from that one, uh, it's possible to see uh, to calculate in, in the way that, that I show previously. Uh, it's possible to calculate all the value of the pressure in the eye of the cyclone for all the, the sensing times. It, from this, uh, new, this, this new kind of, uh, uh, of investigation, it's, it's possible to see that VIRS is uh, similarly, from, uh, uh, if, if we compare uh, the, the, the previous, the, the, the pressure values obtained by manipulation of the data, with the, the NASA storms map from uh, Zoom Air database that are, that are that, from which it's possible to see how to evolve the, uh, how it to is uh, recorded the evolution of the pressure in the eye of the cyclone in all uh, his uh, life days. And uh, yes, this is just for to summarize. And uh, uh, because of this kind of work is uh, really new uh, and uh, is uh, really pre preliminary uh, for, from, uh, from the, uh, for this analysis. Uh, the new starting points are based on amplification of the data set, like Bill uh, uh, like Bill say <laughs> after uh, uh, b before, and uh, using uh, some kind of products with different uh, data, like wind speed or uh, relative humidity, just for to uh, to to better perform this kind of analysis, not only in terms of uh, the qualitative analysis from the polar satellite results, but also for, uh, for uh, the, um, the, ge the geostationary one and uh, for to, to, inv uh, to, invest to investigate in the energy transfer in the different uh, uh, scales for the cyclone structures. Another important comparison that uh, we start, to, we start to do in this period is a comparison with the 2D and 3D simulation models for a generation of a vortices in a, an atmospheric-like uh, turbulent background. And also, the, the, a really important uh, uh, way is to applicate the same analysis of 
on several different cycles. In my case, I start to do this type of analysis on uh, the, the, dynamic, uh, the dynamics evolution of the medicines. Medicines are tropical-like cyclones that, uh, 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 that is the interest for, for the Mediterranean region. From the, uh, just from the word is Mediterranean medicines. And uh, this is a, a, new, a new work because, uh, and this is really interesting because uh, in, in the recent years it's possible to see an high formation probability of this kind of events in our uh, latitudes. And so that's all. Uh, yeah, we have about time for one or two. Okay. But I like uh, your color pro plots, and uh, in, in the last uh, one we could see that the green color and the <coughs> the red color are mixing. Like that there are some fingers for maybe indicating yes. interchange instability, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe it is important how the hurricane is dissipating the energy and finally disappears. Yes, and. Um, Mm, this kind uh, of analysis is based only uh, yeah, uh, if uh, uh, in that in that oh, okay in the middle yes this uh, is only to visualize how the hurricane uh, the, how is the hurricane evolution in the uh, in the in the closest sensing time of the most significant intensification, but uh, it's also important to analyze the, this kind of, uh, of uh, to use this kind of analysis also to, to visualize how the hurricane, uh, how is the hurricane evolution in the, uh, in the first, uh, uh, in the first part of his evolution, in the formation, but also in the uh, weakening, so in the, in the last part. Uh, Yes, 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 and uh, for this uh, for this reason, I we uh, I just want to investigate uh, more deepening in this in this case. This this is only preliminarily for uh, for this moment. Yes. Uh, I have a quick question about your uh, analysis. If you go and go to the slide where you show the power spectrum of the temperature. The uh, no, no, the where you show the spectrum. Ah, the spectrum. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, not this one. No, the previous one. This one, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I, 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 I just have a question. How do you get to that spectrum? Because the the image here, uh, how do you process your image? Because the image is not periodic and so on. So you, if you apply some Fourier analysis, you may have like a Gibbs phenomenon or something going on there. Yeah, and, I. Uh, and the, this this kind of analysis is based on a uh, we we have a, an uh, uh, we apply a Fourier spectra in uh, no not a Fourier spectra an FFT from which I obtain we obtain a wave vector uh, space and uh, from the wave vector space uh, uh, we apply the um, uh, the, sh the shell integrate uh, 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 a shell integration that is based on uh, uh, to dividing this plane into 2D con uh, concentric uh, spheric. Uh, okay, no, no, that's clear. Uh, I okay. don't get so, but the, the figure is not is not clearly a periodic box. So how do you get rid of edge effects or non periodic effect when you calculate the spectrum? This uh, um, uh, um, okay, yeah, just for the, the yes, the non periodic. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, I, I use uh, uh, 93 images in which uh, uh, the cyclones in, is in this case is uh, uh, in the in, in the 24 hours of its uh, most important intensification, and from that images, it's possible to see always the the central structures of the cyclone in the same uh, background. So the 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 um, the non-periodic, the non uh, 
the, the non-periodic uh, visualization is in in uh, is in, in this in these cases uh, uh, really uh, okay it's possible to consider like a periodic uh, a, a periodic uh, background of the because it's based on the 2D map uh, of the cyclone or on the 2D image and it, in every image has uh, this kind of uh, I, okay in this way in this moment I didn't have all the images, but this, this kind of uh, structure is present always in this uh, uh, period that, uh, that we have considered. I don't know if, okay. I, I don't know if. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Sorry.
già buono. È, è un posto 5%.
let's see. It is this one.
on doit être très brave. Uh, all right, perhaps in an attempt to stay on schedule, uh, I will go ahead and present the next presenter, uh, Claudio Meringolo, and he is going to be presenting microphysical plasma relations from relativistic turbulence. Thanks. So, hi everyone, I am Claudio Meringolo, and um, I am a PhD student at University of Calabria, and the title of my presentation is Microphysical Plasma Relations from Relativistic Turbulence. So, starting uh, from the sun, we know uh, very well the, the plasma in the solar wind. We know, for example, the spectra of the magnetic turbulence. Um, we know uh, the PDFs. Um, we know anisotropies in temperatures. But what about the plasma near uh, black holes? Here, uh, there is a picture from Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. M87 and Sagittarius A star, the two supermassive black holes. And um, <clears throat> what about, for example, the particle accelerations, the particles energy spectra, and uh, the ratio of temperature between electrons and ions? There are two inspiring works for me. Uh, the first is Bal et al., APJ 2018, in which the authors uh, initialize the plasma with a single current sheet and then uh, compute the uh, energy spectra for particles. From the spectra, they compute the slope and the efficiency in, in production on thermal particles, defined here. 
both slope and efficiency is in, are important uh, for modeling GRMHD simulations uh, for compact objects. But we think that the turbulent, the turbulent plasma uh, near black holes is not with only a single current sheet. But uh, for this reason, the second inspiring work is Commission in Cironi, PRL 2018, in which the authors initialized the, um, uh, the turbulence with random phases in the Fourier space, uh, random perturbation uh, at the um, magnetic field. Also here, the, um, the authors compute the slopes and uh, they propose formulas for particle accelerations. So, inspired from these works, we used the Zeltron code. Zeltron is a full particle in cell uh, code develop, developed by uh, Cerutti. We performed the 38 uh, 2D simulations spanning different orders in the plasma beta and in the uh, transrelativistic regime. This means sigma uh, similar to one. Uh, we initialize uh, uh, the plasma perturbing the magnetic field in the Fourier space with random modes. And we use uh, realistic mass ratio between electrons and ions. And also a Cartesian box of side L larger than 5,000 uh, electrons in depth. So first we have to fix an initial ratio of temperature between protons and electrons. So we define tau zero, uh, defined as the ratio between the initial electron temperature over the initial proton temperature, where we compute the temperature from uh, the uh, tensor pressure. Here I show uh, the joint PDF for the ratio in function of the plasma beta for three different simulations namely tau zero equal 10, equal one, and equal zero one. And we can see that uh, at final time of two alpha in time, the three configurations uh, reach the, the same place. Uh, so different initial ratios gives, give, give, give us the, the same final configuration, and this allows us to set the same initial temperature for, for protons and electrons. Uh, this means tau zero equal one. As the turbulence uh, takes place, there is a change in the topology in the magnetic field and a conversion from magnetic energy to uh, particle energy. Here there is a multiplot in which I show uh, the number density, uh, sigma, the magnetization, tau, the ratio of temperature, and the out-of-plane current density. I also overplot uh, some uh, particles trajectory of uh, some particles, protons to the left and electrons to the right. And with the same colors in bottom, in bottom panel, there are the um, <coughs> time history of the Lorentz factor for the same particles. And here, there is a movie. Again, uh, with same colors, uh, I show uh, protons to the left, electrons to the right, with the, the time history of the Lorentz factor. Alpha in time? 
Yes, yes. How does that convert to any turnover times? Uh, sorry, I have a problem with... Yes. So that outing speed that you use to get that time is the one from the outer plane magnetic field. Uh, yes, yes. I'm just wondering how, what's the conversion factor into nonlinear time scales? Maybe terms of times. Yes, I, I can convert this, but I didn't. OK, so. Uh, we computed also for each simulation the energy spectra for particles. Uh, and from uh, the spectra, we measured the slopes and the efficiency in production on thermal particles uh, by fitting uh, the final spectra with uh, a Maxwell Newton distribution. In the top panel, uh, there are several spectra with uh, a fixed sigma equal 0, 3 and different plasma beta. While in the bottom one, is uh, there are uh, different sigmas with fixed beta. Uh, as sigma increases, uh, the amount of uh, magnetic energy increases and the, the spectra uh, shift toward uh, higher energy. And here we present true D uh, fitting formulas for uh, important plasma quantities. From the left to the right, uh, there are the kappa slope, the efficiency epsilon, and the uh, ratio of temperature tau. In the bottom row, there are our simulations. So each circle is uh, a simulation, and different colors means different sigmas. In the top row, uh, there are two D uh, fit in function of sigma and beta. And to the right, uh, we present our fitting formula formulas in, uh, in function of beta and sigma for the slope, kappa, for epsilon, and for tau. Yes? In the bottom? Is yes, it's the value. The value, for example, for k, for epsilon, and for tau. These formulas are very important to, uh, are very useful to uh, GRMHD simulation, to model plasma around compact objects, for example, jet and disk, and also to model shadow of supermassive black holes. So in conclusion, we used uh, uh, a relativistic full peak code, the Zeltron code, spanning uh, a wide range of parameters uh, in order to explore the plasma near compact objects. And uh, we provided uh, formulas in order to fit, uh, in function of sigma and beta, uh, kappa, the efficiency epsilon, and uh, the ratio of temperature. And uh, these formulas are very important in GRMHD simulations for modeling uh, supermassive black holes. And in future works, we, we want to extend uh, in a fully 3D geometry and span over a larger range of parameters. Thanks. Is this working? Hello? Yeah. Oh. Uh, okay, so uh, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. Is there any questions? And if no. Uh, 
Ah, uh, yes. Uh, but this is very similar to, I mean, uh, Kappa and Epson are very similar to the results from Bal et al. Uh, the new results uh, are tau, the ratio of temperature. Uh, yes. No, because uh, in the x-axis uh, there is the initial value of plasma beta for our simulations. In the y-axis is the value of tau. Ah, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's go ahead and move on then. All right, so the next presenter is uh, Hello, I am Giuseppe Prete, a PhD student at the University of Calabria, and today I will talk about a recent work that we are developed uh, with my co-authors. And the topic of this work is, inter is the interaction of a supernova remnant with the background interstellar turbulence. So this is the outline of my presentation. In the introduction, I will talk about the, shock, the shocks associated to the explosion of the supernova remnants and how they can interact with the turbulent environment. In the second part, I will talk about the numerical simulation used trying to reproduce this kind of phenomena. In the third part, I will show the comparison with Chandra data. And finally, I will give you the conclusion. So, supernova explosions are among the most events in the universe. It is widely believed that the psych Mach number shock associated to these explosions are sources of galactic cosmic rays with energies up to at least 10 to 15 electron volts. That is the knee of the cosmic rays. Uh, supernova are also sources of strong emission of radio, of radio and uh, X-ray. And uh, in these high energy processes, the magnetic field is of a great importance. Uh, also in the process of particle acceleration. This is uh, an image of SN106 in the X-ray. Okay. Uh, and the interstellar medium, we know that it is turbulent. Uh, the galactic magnetic field it is observed to be of a few microgas and it has a uniform and a fluctuating component that are in the in equipartition. When a shock is propagating inside a turbulent environment, it can interact with the turbulence and this can lead to the formation of a the formation of these shock ripples that we can see from Nogebayer and Giacalone and the increasing of the level of the fluctuations 
in, okay, Bayer in Jack alone in 2005 propagates a shock inside the turbulent environment and as a consequence of, it, of the interaction between the shock and the turbulent environment we can see the distortion of the shock surfaces. Also Jokipi and Jacqueline in 2007 did a simulation in which they propagate a shock inside uh, an environment which they had a uh, density fluctuation. I don't know if you can hear me, but because, okay. Uh, and uh, the interaction between the shock and, uh, and the, this turbulent environment caused an increasing of uh, the density fluctuations in the downstream side, that this, this part. And as a consequence, uh, they obtained also an increase of the magnetic field strength. Trott et al. in 2022 uh, found, several, uh, found similar uh, results, varying the level of fluctuation in their work, and now is it possible to see when the level of fluctuations increase, increase also the distortion of the shock, and also the uh, level of fluctuation in the downstream side. As a consequence of the increasing of the fluctuation in the downstream side, um, in, the, uh, power, in the spectra of the um, particles, we can see uh, uh, an increase of the uh, a larger um, spectra, a larger, sh uh, a larger shape or behavior of the spectra of, of particle when increase the level, uh, when the level of fluctuation are increasing. It is possible to see from here, the, the black line is the, the, the value of delta B over B0 is zero, and the red line is the value of delta B over B0 equal to 2.1. So, let's see what are the numerical simulations used trying to reproduce an explosion of a supernova. We use the Pluto code that is, it, that it is designed to integrate a general system of conservation law. Uh, this is the general system. U is a state vector of conservative quantities. T is a tensor of rank. And S is the source term to simulate the evolution of a blast. We, we, we use the DMHD module of Pluto. At this level, uh, we do not take into account of this term, okay, because j these are just preliminary results. So we uh, do not take into account of the acceleration terms and of the optical, uh, of the term of the optical thin radiative losses and heating. This set of equations is properly closed with uh, an ideal equation of state that gives us the possibility to write the total energy density in this way. So. The direction of the mean magnetic field is chosen using spherical coordinate. Following the work of Reynoso et al., in which they found that the direction of the mean magnetic field forms an angle with the galactic plane normal of about 60 degrees, we choose theta tilde as 90 degrees and phi, the angle phi, as 150 degrees. So we simulated that a shock wave propagates within a turbulent medium following Guo et al. 2012. Uh, in order to reproduce this evolution inside the turbulent environment, the evolution of the, the blast wave, we uh, uh, coupled the MHD Pluto simulation with synthetic turbulence simulation. We've got an isotropic uh, uh, AZ uh, spectra uh, from which we extrapolate the, the, density, the magnetic field density components. And this, uh, the, the, this fluid, the, the, the the components of the fluctuation as a spectrum as a, uh, of a Kolmogorov type, like this way, the blue line showed in this picture. So, let's see what are the results of the simulation. We developed a 2D simulation with a resolution of 2048 square. So, in order to better reproduce what we saw for, from the data, we varied the value of delta, delta B over B0 and we choose the best parameter that uh, reproduce the, 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 the best image, image. So we choose delta B over B0 equals to zero, uh, 0 0.5, yes. This is the density field um, of the supernova. Um, and how it is possible to see the white line is the uh, orientation of the mean magnetic field. And uh, the first thing that appear in this figure is at the region with the highest uh, compressibility are the regions that are oriented uh, um, uh, along the mean magnetic field. These are the parameters that we have in our simulation. We are in the presence of strong shock because we are in a supernova explosion, so 
this is the, the we, this, this is what we expected, and we study the plasma anisotropy uh, with the shock wave. We built the autocorrelation function inside this ring. Okay, so from the autocorrelation fun uh, function, we found something like this. The, this is what we found from the autocorrelation function. The red line is the autocorrelation length, and now it is possible to see is that uh, the region in which we have the highest uh, autocorrelation values for the autocorrelation length is the region in which the structure are perpendicular to the mean magnetic field. And the region in which we have the lowest value of the autocorrelation length are the region in which the structures are parallel to the mean magnetic field. So the scope, the aim of this works, or the scope is the same, uh, is trying to reproduce uh, with the numerical simulation what we saw from data. Data are pro from Chandra data. Data are provided by the advanced CCD imaging spectrometer instrument on board of Chandra that gives information about the energy, the position, and the photons, uh, and the arrival time of the photon. This is the brightness field extrapolated from the data of Chandra. And what it, it is possible to see immediately is that the emission of the X-ray of the X-ray photons are in the region in which Reynolds et al. found the direction of the mean magnetic field. Okay, so we again applied the ring shape, the, 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 the ring mask on this uh, plot, and we calculated again the autocorrelation function. And what we found is surprisingly because we have a similar result of what we found for the simulation. In order to see a, a, comparis a visual comparison, we've got this. We show this, okay? So uh, this is a very surprising result because uh, this is not uh, a density field, but it's brightness field, okay? Uh, something similar to a density field, but okay. Uh, the, the the shape of the autocorrelation function looks very similar. Looks very similar between them. And finally, we tried to extrapolate the spectrum from three cuts of, uh, at different values of the angle theta. Uh, the angle theta uh, is the angle between the structures and the mean magnetic field. From the numerical simulation, uh, we found what is expected from uh, an MHD compressible simulation, and we found a spectra that goes as k2 minus 2. We tried to do also the same in the case of Chandra. But in this case, the, the, the things appear uh, very difficult to do because this is just, uh, I want to stress that this is, these are just preliminary results. So um, we found from the spectra the three different values of the angle, thank, th something that is not very clear. But we tried also to, we tried the same to put a power, a power law with the three different spectra. So, uh, we studied the evolution of a shock wave associated to a supernova remnant with the help of the MHD Pluto code simulation coupled with the uh, synthetic turbulence simulation. We found a strong anisotropy uh, when we have a mean magnetic field in the simulation in the case in which we don't have a mean magnetic field that is not shown in this presentation, we exhibit the, the autocorrelation function exhibit anisotropic, anisotropic behavior we found a preliminary good agreement between numerical results and Chandra spacecraft data, also in the behavior of the autocorrelation function. More study have to do, has, has to be done in order to better understand the properties of the supernova evolution in the simulation, such as the evolution of the speed shock waves, the radius of the shock, etc. If uh, uh, you want to suggest some ideas, we are very glad to follow. Uh, your ideas. And so that's all. That's it. Thank you. Relax. Yes. <laughs> uh, question and a suggestion. Yes. My question is what equation of state are you using? In the ideal equation of state. Uh, the ideal equation of ideal, state. Okay. Yes, yes. So you're not, not polytropic? No, 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 no. Okay. So that means that you have the possibility of non-barotropic pressure yes. and the generation of vorticity. 
Okay. Yes. Good. I think that's an essential feature here. But the other thing is for the real supernova remnants, there's going to be a, f a f the cosmic rays are going to be there too. Yes. And the, the pressure gradient of the cosmic rays is actually going to interact with the yes. density field that they provide. Yes. Also. Yes. Yes. This is the next level of our work. To add, yes. Yes, 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 yes. There, there is the possibility, there is a module in Pluto that can help you to do this. Uh, sorry, I cannot. I cannot hear very well. <laughs> like the okay. old television. A number of people have uh, modelled S antenna six with the magnetic field perpendicular to the way you have it. Yes. And I don't quite. Uh, I mean, what, what, what your direction it corresponds to the galactic plane, which is yes. a natural thing to assume. Um, Difference value of the of the mean magnetic field. Are you are you, are you saying that the inclination? The inclination. Well, what what we, we we did this proof with the, the other members, but what it is changed is that the direction of the region of the compressibility are always elongated the, along the mean magnetic field. So we can see the 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 change. Of this region, if we put a, a, a mean magnetic field in the y direction, we can see, uh, I'm sure about that, um, the region of compressibility in this region, in the region in which we have the mean magnetic field. If you want to see, we have also the, the, the simulation in which we don't have a mean magnetic field. I just prepared this as terminal slide. This is beautiful, I think. <laughs> I really like this picture because we can see also the, uh, this kind of structure that is formed that are relate, relate Taylor instabilities. And the, 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 the very beautiful thing of this, of this picture is that if you apply on a ring mask the autocorrelation function, you found some that is uh, isotropic. And this help us to say that we are doing something, in, uh, I think, in, in a good way. Ah, yes. I don't know why uh, uh, it is, there is a slide in which I put the, uh, this is, uh, yes, I had this picture, I had this slide, but it, it is not showing, I don't know. We started following, we, we followed the, the parameters chosen by Orlando et al. in 2012, in which they started uh, from a supernova time of about 10 years, and we followed the supernova until 10 to 4 years. That is called, and this value corresponds to the real radius of the supernova of, of SNTN6, of, of that is of about 10 parsec. We choose this... Uh, this, this time, because we are in the set of Taylor phase in which the energy is constant, yes. Sorry, I don't know why, why this slide it doesn't appear, but... Uh, 
Ah, okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. I think we have time for just three more questions. Three. One is enough, I think. <laughs> okay, no more. <laughs> okay, I can ask. I can ask about the correlation that you did. So, in H alpha, we do see the shock corrugation, for example, mm -hmm. and from that, you can estimate the level of turbulence that is in the upstream. Mm -hmm. And the other issue is you should pick care when you compare with Chandra data to select the non-thermal band of Chandra mm -hmm. between 4 and 6 kV because the thermal component comes from line and it's patients and they might have... No, 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 from Chandra we take the, the, the data from the 3 kV channel, yes. 3 yes. kV is a bit too low. A bit low, okay, okay. Okay, okay, thank you. Yes, but okay, you destroyed my work. Okay, <laughs> no, no, but, but the, the results obtained from Chandra are just preliminary. We have to to do some other works. Yes, and we we now we are going to we are going to take into account of this suggestion that you just say to us. Thank you. Was there any more? Yes, but just this just as I said, ju this is just a preliminary result. We just tried to calculate this spectra inside the ring with the autocorrelation function. But this is what it is expected from an MHD compressible simulation. When you go to Chandra, we do not obtain the same. It's just um, a way to see if we can find something similar. But okay, it's not. Uh, um, a strong result. It's just preliminary, and uh, we want to say how d was the behavior of the spectra in, in, in the same region in which we calculated the autocorrelation function in the, in the spectra for the simulations. I think uh, I think that's 20 minutes actually <laughs> with all those questions. Thank you. So our uh, next speaker is, uh, where is this? Ah, Arpad Kis. Yes. Uh, and he is going to be presenting turbulence in 3D magnetic reconnection. Uh, not really. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm so we're <laughs> doing diffusive shock acceleration characteristics at the Earth's ground shock as a function of distance. OK, so the confusion comes that I am a jumper. So I, I'm in, instead of uh, Jefferson, I would 
have been supposed to give this talk uh, tomorrow morning, but maybe we, everybody will be happy to sleep a little bit, 20 minutes m more, maybe after this evening. Okay, so if you see, uh, this is the name of the, our institute, and uh, probably you had never heard about it because it's a very new one, it's, it's one year old. But to move to science, uh, of course, you know, everybody knows this picture. We have the Earth's bow shock, we have uh, two regions, basically quasi-parallel, quasi-perpendicular. The quasi-parallel is more uh, interesting from our side of view because it's uh, more turbulent because of the uh, outstream particles. And here we have two distinct populations most of the time. We have the so-called field align beam, which comes, uh, it's uh, uh, reflected uh, solar wind particles uh, on the quasi-perpendicular side, and we have the so-called diffuse ions, which can be found in the foreshock region, which is an extended region dominated by waves and, and particles. The two populations have a, a di distinct uh, characteristics and a, a, a certain history, I mean, a different history. The diffuse ions, they are very highly isotropic. They have energies between 10 and 300 keV. They are Bauschock accelerated ions. And while the field line beam ions, are, it's, of the field line beam, it's, it's a, a, a consistent beam-like structure in the velocity space, which is, you, you can uh, distinguish between the two. Now, the major mechanism which is responsible for uh, particle acceleration by shock waves, uh, well, at least for some, <laughs> it's the diffusive shock acceleration, which, uh, or the first order Fermi acceleration, which is fer Fermi acceleration. It's so good to say this in this building. The concept is very simple. Basically, we have particles bouncing from two different sides, from up, uh, between upstream and downstream, uh, and uh, this is how the energy is gained in each step. Uh, the concept is simple. Most of the particles, they are going downstream, going uh, through the shock, and they are getting uh, heated by the shock. But uh, some of them, some luckies, are just uh, going in to have some ping pong, uh, uh, some tennis playing. And these are particles that they are getting accelerated, and they, the, these are the so-called diffuse ions, which consist of between uh, several percent of the incoming solar sort of wind particles. So, well, the bow shock has been studied extensively for decades, but uh, not every detail of the shock acceleration is completely understood. Uh, what we need to remind is that for the acceleration to work efficiently, uh, we, there are some important conditions to be satisfied, as it has been shown earlier. And one of these conditions is that uh, we need to have a kind of mechanism which is pre-accelerating uh, particles. This, this is the uh, injection. Uh, the other is that uh, there should exist scattering centers that to be able to bounce between the two regions. So we, we should have a pitch angle scattering. And also we have a third one, which is the so-called uh, free escape boundary, because the particles need to get away from this, this mechanism. <clears throat> Uh, I will not enter into injection because uh, uh, we have uh, not so, many, so much time. We, we have done some work on this, so let me just skip. If you are interested, we can talk about it. But I would like to focus on the pitch angle scattering. So what is in interesting, really, that the pitch angle scattering of diffuse ions is uh, done by waves. But also the excitation of waves is done by diffuse ions. So it's a, a kind of... Uh, uh, interesting system where the diffuse ions are scattered by self-generated waves. And this is uh, influencing uh, constantly. You remember that you, have, you need to have waves on both sides. So m this means that uh, these are two physical processes which uh, are very linked together and form a highly complex feedback system. And uh, this is what ultimately results in the acceleration of ions at the shock. So the result of the spatial diffusion against convection is that we need to have an exponential profile for the density, for the density of uh, ac accelerated particles. Simple like this, simple sketch. We have the source, we have a convection, and uh, the density should look like uh, an exponential. If you put this into a linear logarithmic scale, it will be a line, 
obviously. And uh, this, uh, the exponential, the, uh, I mean, the line of the exponential can be uh, characterized with a so-called uh, e-folding distance, which is a characteristic distance over which the density value decreases to its uh, one point e value. So it uh, characterizes the steepness of the exponential. Uh, in order to prove that indeed the, these so-called diffuse ions are subject to uh, diffusive accelerations, we need to show that indeed we have an exponential, exponential profile for the diffuse ions. And there's some work had been done previously, which uh, definitely showed evidence of uh, clear diffusive transfer process, but uh, this has, had been done on a statistical basis. So you had to take multiple events and put it together and uh, have one profile. But since we have cluster MMS and uh, Themis uh, before that, we can see, we can use individual event, events to explore. And this is, can be done that we have two spacecraft at di different distances from the shock. So uh, what we have done is to, sorry, uh, how, it, the important point in this method is to determine the distance to the bow shock and to determine the ion density gradient. So what we have done is that we have used the dynamical bar shock model surface, and we scaled the model to the actual observed crossing. And we have modified this according to variations in the sort of in pressure, because we, and you, if you use a, a whatever model you use, you can choose whatever model, but it, it's, it, it's not good for individual events, because the bar shock would be most of the time, not in the case when it's indicated from the model, because it's an average model. So you have to scale it for every each individual event. Okay, so you just have the, the gradient. And indeed, what uh, we, we can see is that if we plot the gradient against distance, we have a nice line, which means that we have an exponential. And this is here you, you see the e folding values. This has uh, for here is the energy, here is the e folding distance, and then as we can see, the energy is increasing further, further away. And this has been done earlier uh, based on cluster data. We have done a simulation study, which means a perfect uh, match between the two. And, uh, but what I would like to come to the point that there is a question that how far this exponential slope of energy's ions does it extend? So it's, uh, how does this work? We have an expon and uh, we have done this. So let's make an analysis versus distance from the Barshock surface. And uh, I would like to show you what we have found. Here you see we have the distance to the Barshock versus density gradient in logarithmic scale, of course. And uh, we see that you have a clear exponential up to this point. And here something happens. And you can see that it's, it's a, the exponential basically it breaks down at this point, at a certain distance from the shock. Something different is happening. And uh, this is uh, for the ions between 24 and 32 keV obtained by the uh, uh, cluster HIE instrument. And the same goes with if we have between 18 and 24 keV and 13, 18 keV and between 10 and 13 keV. But what, if, you real, if you observed the breaking point where the exponential is something else happening, as you can see, let's, let me go back, it's, different, it's uh, happening on a different distances. At high energies, the exponential goes way up to nine uh, three radial distance from the shock. If you go to uh, lower energy, it goes up to eight. If we go a little bit, it's, it's uh, between seven and eight, and for 10 and 13, it's around six and seven. It is the same spacecraft, same measurements, same event, nothing has changed, so this is not related to uh, some data fluctuation or whatever, uh, what you can see. Which raises a question, so the exponential goes further away from the bow shock, which raises the question that this might be, if you take a look at the uh, foreshock 
structure and the bow shock structure, you can see that uh, somewhere, uh, obviously, this uh, foreshock ends. So what if, what if this, this might be the escape boundary that is dependent on ion energy? Let's say that so the energy, the energetic particles are getting energized up to a point when they can, their exponential slope is reaching to the uh, region when it, it's going away, just like that. And also this defines the maximum energy of the shock, of the shock accelerated particles for the, every each uh, shock event. Okay, so this is uh, basically all my, what I w wanted to show you. And to summarize, uh, we have an exponential profile of the energy ions. It's well represented by data. But uh, above a certain distance, which is uh, pr pretty much, we can define this distance, uh, the exponential profile breaks down, so something is different is happening. And this critical distance depends on ion energy. The higher the energy of the ion is, the further away it goes with this exponential slope. Uh, one might think that this has to do something with, uh, some, something is changing in the physics. Maybe we have first order f Fermi acceleration. And, uh, and above this distance, we might have, m m the system might turn into second order Fermi acceleration, so which, which, which is a stochastic acceleration. Okay, so this is all I wanted to present you. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, yeah, so we have some time for some questions. Yes, actually a quick one. Uh, but what you call critical distance is basically the diffusion length, or not? Of the, uh, of the ions? Uh, no, no. And how Definitely this is not. compared with the diffusion length, which of course also depends on the, on the energy of the ions and then uh, the diffusion coefficient? I haven't checked that. Ah, okay, but probably it's worth, uh, it's worth checking okay. something like this because this is fundamental for defining the transport parameters of the, of the ions. Okay. Thank you very much. That's good. slope, that gives you the diffusion uh, coefficient kappa. And if you take kappa divided by u, that gives you the length scale beyond which you're going to not have acceleration. So what happens here is you have two different decay. So it's the location where you have the red line is where you have the excited ion get this kappa and this background kappa. So these are two different kappas, gives you two different decay slope. The first decay over there allows you to get a kappa, and then if you divide by u, that gives a distance when you yeah, match. Exactly. I also had a question. Uh, so yep. in these plots, whenever you're going from higher energy to lower energies, what you say as clear exponential seems to be coming less and less of a clear exponential okay, um, the, <laughs> visually. Uh, this has to do with, with uh, uh, okay, the level of turbulence and uh, because in the foreshock we have a, a high intensity, day, I mean high intensity waves. And uh, if you're getting closer to the shock, you, you're getting higher and higher, higher intensities. So the magnitude increases, the magnitude of the fluctuation as we are getting closer to the shock. I think even uh, the same way as the, uh, it's exponentially increasing. And uh, it seems to be that most of the time, yes, you're right, because if you take a look at uh, of, uh, uh, lower uh, energies, they are more scattered. It's, it's not so clear. It's not so clear. It, I don't know the reason why it is, but uh, it, for high energies, you have a, a nicer picture. Right, right. Any other questions? All right, let's go ahead and move on then. Thank you. All right, so the next presenter is 
uh, Davide Manzini, and he is going to be presenting local energy transfer associated with turbulent magnetic reconnection, uh, presenting both in situ data and Vlasov simulations. And the 
reflect on the, on the, on the field is that we get a coarse representation. We lose the high frequency detail, we are low passing the field. And the neat thing that we can do is that we can write equations for the large scale energy fields. And in particular, we define this one to the phi at a given scale L, which we can vary at will, which is the, the evolution of the large scale energy density, so it's space, space dependent, due to nonlinear interaction. And this we call the cross scale energy transfer. And so the idea is very simple, I will go very briefly. The, we choose a filtering scale L, and then we divide our range of scales into the large scale, which is larger than L, and the small scales. And so we are describing with our equations only the dashed box, the large scale equations. But we have in the large scale energy equation, we have spatial transport, so terms mixing energy in space and not across scales. Then we have the effect of energy injection, and large scales, we have the impact of large scale dissipation, uh, and then we have the transfer, which is the spy, which is because it's the only way to communicate be between large and small scale. It's the only cross scale term, and it's with the star of this work. Uh, very briefly, a uh, comparison with, uh, with standard theories, so Kolmogorov like theories, and here we, we try to express the cascade rates of the amount of energy flows across scale as a function of field increments, for example, delta V, and the most famous example probably that you know is called the Yadam's law, which has been mentioned before many times. Uh, so we want to express this cascade rate as a function of the inference. However, we require a set of hypotheses, which is uh, it's listed here. It's, it's basically fully developed turbulence, so homogeneity, stationarity, and isotropy, and the absence of the, uh, uh, and the existence of the inertial rate. So a region far from energy injection and energy dissipation. Uh, there have been some works, actually. For example, Yadam's law does not require isotropy. We can get rid of the incompressibility constraint. However, we are we cannot get rid of the homogeneity because we need to keep those spatial average. Actually, in theory, it's an ensemble average. Which then we, we we compute the space average uh, assuming the ergodicity. So we cannot use this kind of theories to compute localized energy transfer, which is what we want to do. We want to diagnose energy transfer associated with one single connecting curvature, which we can do with course training model because. The, the model is local in space, so we can use it. And another very interesting thing is that, of course, if we space average uh, the coarse grain theory, we will rip over the Pomogoro theory, which is to be expected. Here, for example, is the comparison between uh, axons so of Pomogoro theory, which is in particular <coughs> incompressible volume HD by and the, the dot uh, is the coarse grain average over the simulation box. And you can see that we rip over. Uh, so we are extending basically third order of laws. Uh, and of course, just, just very briefly, uh, as I would mention, this course training is not something I invented, of course, it's, it's, it's structured by a good legacy, dating back on fluid dynamics for from the Yves and Dalloy, all the way down to, the, to fluid formulations uh, done by the Matthews Group and Yan Yang, uh, very recently. We did it for the blocks of Maxwell. Blood of macro system, yes, but you take the moments of blood of equations. So, no, we, I we, we scale filtered the, the results to get, to get and compared it to the Agron law. Okay, January, I, January this year. Okay, okay, go. Yeah. And uh, so now that we have this, this new powerful tool that allows us to diagnose cross scale energy transfer at a precise location, we thought to apply it to magnetic reconnection. And uh, both in, from in situ data with MMS and from numerical simulation, which are done from with the uh, uh, hybrid plus of code that we have in PISA. Uh, so, first, uh, some experimental evidence with MMS. Uh, we've got these three panels. So, up here is the magnetic field. You can see that these are very active regions. This is after having is the MMS in the sheet after crossing the magnetopause. And we've got this very dynamic magnetic field, which in turn creates very strong current sheet. And you can see that, for example, the Zenitani measure J.T. prime is very, very active. And here in this panel, we have the 
small scale energy density, what's the amount of energy going between the two yeah. at this precise location? I agree that if you, if you take large scales, you're, you're including other, uh, other effects, which is not just the current shift. Uh, so let's say that the magnetic reconnection is also multi scale by itself. You need some large scale magnetic field reorganization to get some uh, thin current shift which can reconnect. So the, the magnetic reconnection is not only that thin current sheet, but uh, why... Uh, in, uh, You're talking about random. Yeah, yeah. Right? Nevertheless, the correlation length, for example, in the magnetic sheet is from 10 di, I, I, I initially arranged to, let's say, 100 di, so it, it's a very limited region, but still I think magnetic reconnection is converting energy from the magnet of the magnetic field to flow energy, so there are different scales involved, for sure. But uh, to get back to your question, I say that it's from large to small scales because it's supposed to be is positive. If it were negative, so it blue in color, it would mean that if you look at the, at the, at the, at the equation itself, it, a positive pi tells you that locally, large scale energy density at large scales is diminishing, and instead you've got uh, the small scale energy density at that location is going up. So if, it's, if, it's, if it's pi is positive, the transfer is in one direction, if pi is negative, the transfer is in the other direction. Okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. And in terms of magnitude, you see that this effect, this cross scale and transfer is not effective at large scales, so up here, and becomes effective at sub ion scales. As in, and if you integrate over, for example, this Peter bar, you see a net transfer towards the, the small scales. Because the large scale reorganization of the magnetic field is not involved in this measure. Exactly. It's not involved in the, in the yeah. cross scale energy transfer. I right, mean. right. Okay, so we have got supporting results from simulation where it's clear we can observe the current sheet and there's two examples. And you can see this is phi computed at a given scale, 0 0.3 rho i, for example. And you can see that the terms which are more involved in this cross scale transfer are exactly the x point that one would expect and the output. And we've got this strange, this strange behavior where the, the O points, the, the magnetic ions, appear to be negative uh, in, in terms of energy transfer, so energy flowing from small to large scales. Excuse me, sorry. Yes, yeah, since this is a, really a zoom in of your simulation, yes. you really have the resolution enough to see this kind of secondary instabilities here, because here we really need like 10 to 4, 10 to 6 to see this locally. Do you have it? Is such a resolution? Yes, yeah, the simulation is actually very deep. It's, it's more than a billion square. No, 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 no. But uh, uh, so first we imply a reduced mass ratio um, of 100. <coughs> but you it, it's so you are solving also the electron mass. No, it's fluid. Your electrons. It's inside. It's so we've got so the kinetic ions and electrons. They they are. We describe them via their own slope, including electron inertia. So you've got dj over dg, which is basically the uh, electron equation of motion. Mm -hmm. And we resolve, uh, I think, uh, thinking now, I think we've got a 10 points per uh, electron inertia length. Okay. So the resolution of this would be what is the local Reynolds number? Uh, well, let's check. I have got the. Because it's. it's okay. cool. The local Reynolds number. I, I will look into that. Thanks. But so yes, in space, the locations are what we would expect to be important, so alphas and x points. And we can do similar plots to what we did with the MMS. So we can do a one-dimensional cut. We can imagine we throw a space rod in here that crosses the magnetic current shield. And we've got, yeah, we've got the shield magnetic field and all that. Out of play uh, electric field in the electron rest frame, so the locations where we are violating uh, ideal on flow where we are reconnecting. And you can see that the pattern is very similar to what you observe. At the reconnection locations, we've got intense transfer at sub ion scales and nothing going on at all. Okay? So this fit in a way the pictures that we were explaining before. And so this is the, the whole simulation I was talking about and this is the zoom in that I was showing. And here you can see the evolution of the <coughs> pi at, at 0 0.3 rho i as the, the magnetic current shift reconnects, and you can see that it is most intense when it's act actively undergoing reconnection. And here is the effect on the spectrum. Of course, if you have a cross scale energy transfer, we expect to fill up the spectrum, and this is consistent with Francis' work and uh, Charlie's work, that you see that as reconnection, uh, after we underwent reconnection, we have performed as uh, a power tail that was. 
looks like a, a tearing mode and reconnection mediated turbulence, which, which you can find, for example, in the recent Checo Chicken paper or, or body mm, Yes, exactly. I compared with body and prediction and Lorenz prediction, and it's, it's consistent. They, they go from minus 2.8 to minus 3, so uh, almost there. So, some concluding remarks. Yes. So, the first thing that we observe is that locally, at the x point and the outflow, so we are driving cross scale energy transfer. And this transfer becomes effective at eigen scales, the I or I. And this is actually a huge question, which I think is important also for magnetic recognition itself. Which one of the two scales is relevant, depending on the plasma parameters? And I've been working on that with some uh, unpublished results. Uh, and lastly, of course, this consistently with, with what, with what was observed in 2017, this is reflected in the power law spectrum, which, however, is not the main point that we should watch. We should actually look at the stroke scale energy transfer, which then reflects back on the spectrum. And finally, so the, the, the main uh, things that I would, I would say we can take away from this is that magnetic reconnection can be one <laughs> of the mechanisms, of course, if not claim it's the only one, that can drive a line turbulence in the absence of the inertial range. And one last comment, since we have many authors of the French papers here, uh, the interpretation that they gave for magnetic reconnection forming this sub eigen scale is that magnetic reconnection injects energy at the electron scale, and then we've got an inverse cascade of the way up. Instead, what we observe here, and we have to model the scale. Electron scale, because we didn't have the uh, dual simulation. OK, no, but in the, in the plot that you, you showed, you so, so KDI, and then you, you Sure, the magnetic reconnection goes to smaller Just scale. Below key ah, okay. 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 Yeah, okay. Okay. So, so the interpretation is, is, is the same. You inject energy at minus scales, yeah. then cascades down. Okay, thanks. And that, I think, was all. Thanks for the attention. Um, so this is very not similar, but it's complementary, I would say, to, to what we found also in a later paper in 2019, where uh, looking at the evolution of, of turbulence, because you have the same thing, you have a, decay, a system that evolves toward turbulence, at some point you trigger reconnection. And uh, so in, in the paper where I'm, where of course, I'm the first author in that case, uh, I was looking at, the, at a similar measure that is the nonlinear time at, at, at a given scale. And I could clearly connect the, the mm, let's say that uh, the nonlinear time at a smaller scale was getting the, uh, let's say, you could clearly see a clear correlation between what, what happened to the nonlinear time value at the smaller case scale with the triggering of reconnection. You could, you could clearly see that when you have reconnection entering and then also later on, you have that Basically, you are injection of energy at a smaller scale because the linear time at the end of the day is the energy that is deposited at that scale. And you could clearly see in that plot that I think it showed it very well, but maybe it was not understood at the time because also my co-author had some times, hard times to understand what I was plotting. Uh, it clearly showed that you have energy deposition at a smaller scale and then while, uh, uh, while the, the simulation evolves, you have that this, this let's say, this energy gets get broader and toward the larger and the larger scale and then become stationary in the statistical sense. So actually this is uh, really yeah. pretty nice.
uh, right, but in, in the spectrum we see in this small scale scaling uh, in the magnetic uh, spectra, okay? Yeah. And every reconnection paper starts with the sentence, magnetic reconnection is converting en magnetic energy to flow energy and uh, thermal energy. So the magnetic energy is practically eaten, okay, by the reconnection process itself. And therefore, the, this magnetic spectrum should uh, uh, deform somehow. This is one point. And second point is that uh, what is uh, Sheko Chikin proposing in the 2004, he, he, his 2004 paper, that we can have uh, this small-scale dynamo uh, ni ni near the ion case, sub-ion case, which, is, uh, which can uh, accumulate extra magnetic energy and also maintain this cascade. So not only the magnetic reconnection can work, but also some small-scale dynamo. Okay. But this is speculation. Yeah, um, this comment is a, a little bit semantic, but I think there's some physics in it as well. Uh, you, you don't need to have an inertial range to have scale, scale transfer of energy. In fact, going back to C.C. Lin and von Karman in 1950, they pointed out that the von karman Howorth equations are correct even when the Reynolds number is low. Kolmogorov 41 becomes accurate when the Reynolds number is very high. And I'd just like to point out that using the von karman howorth equations in the recent era was Peter Hellinger st sort of started that recently. And those equations are exact all of the time, whether you have an inertial range or, or not. So, uh, and you can always calculate the divergence of the Yaglum flux even when there's no inertial range. And it's still meaningful, it's just that it overlaps the dissipation function and the time-dependent term in the von karman howarth equations. So I think it's a mistake to say, I mean, I think your work is very nice, but I think it's a mistake to say there's no inertial range, so therefore all of these other things like the von karman howarth terms are irrelevant. I, I think they are relevant. I perfectly agree. Uh, yeah. The Adhikari paper. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. And I think that's very interesting, but for example, for applying to this, we were discussing just before we do the answer. You, need, you still need homogeneity to do this von Karman Howard equation. Because, I mean, it's true even if you don't have the inertial range. But if I remember correctly, when you, when you do the derivation, you need to simplify some terms. For example, in the fluid case, you've got V, V, V prime, you average, and you say, oh, this is equal to minus V prime, V prime, V average. So that's like homogeneity for you. For an infinite system, yes, but for a periodic system, it's always equivalent to homogeneity. It's exact for a periodic system, no matter what. So I think Petter, I mean, Petter really was the first guy to do that in the recent era, I think. I think hydro people knew that a long time ago, but... But, but still don't understand the Von Karman equation. We don't, or in general. In general, in general. Okay. Yeah. Some of them, but... And very briefly, uh, uh, it's true. The, the other thing that I would like to point out is I think that this one is more convenient for computing in space for data. Because for the von Karman hour, at least the formulation that I know, you need divergence in still space as a function of L, which is not very convenient to compute in space for data. And instead, in this one, I'm All right, thank you. All right, so our next presenter is Francesco Malara, and he will be presenting exact sharing flow magnetized hybrid kinetic equilibria with inhomogeneous temperature.
Okay, so um, this is the outline of my work. Uh, I will uh, give a, a brief introduction, then I will describe a stationary hybrid solution for a shear flow, and uh, then I will uh, give a particular solution for magnetopause configurations, and finally conclusions. Okay. So, uh, magnetized plasmas with shear flows are present uh, in many contexts in nature. I, I just give some, some few examples of, of the, this situation where we, we have shear flows and uh, why they are interesting. For instance, some applications are, in the case of, of stable shear flows, that is to say when the jump in velocity is smaller typically than the alpha and uh, speed, uh, the, 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 they are stable. So in that case, one interesting case is to study how waves which um, propagate in, inside this kind of, of configuration are modified and uh, how, um, sh uh, how small scales are, are, are created. Uh, vice versa, in the case of uh, unstable shear flows, that is to say when the jumping velocity is larger than the alpha speed, they are, are unstable with respect to the kelvin elmont instability. So this is also an, an, an interesting case. This is the case, for instance, of, uh, of uh, the, the magneto, magneto sheath in, uh, in, in, in the Earth case. Um, of course, uh, in the case of a, of a collision or of a collisional plasmas, collisionless plasma, uh, it, it is better to describe this kind of situation in, in the context of uh, a kinetic description instead of a fluid one. And uh, so the point is how to build up uh, a stationary st shear flows in the case of collisionless plasma. Uh, this, is a, this problem is not trivial in the, in the context of uh, kinetic theory. For instance, if we consider the case of a shifted Maxwellian, uh, it is easy to see that this uh, kind of uh, um, distribution function is not uh, stationary, is not exactly stationary. If you, you, use, if you use this kind of uh, initial condition, you see that a, a soon a, uh, oscillation will, will be generated that superpose on, on the this kind of conf configuration. Uh, some work have, have been already done, of course, in order to build up this kind of solutions. For instance, uh, uh, in, the case, in the case of fully kinetic uh, approach, uh, there have been results in the case of parallel B or perpendicular uniform B or perpendicular non-uniform B. However, this kind of solution have, be, have been employed quite rarely um, in, for instance, to, de to, to describe the, uh, the, de the de development of, uh, of um, kelvin elmos instability, I guess because from the numerical point of view, they are not very manageable. Uh, um, if we are interested uh, to, to phenomena scale, at scales of the order of the annual scales, and uh, the alternative approach is to use the, the hybrid vlasov maxwell model, uh, which have been uh, well developed and uh, used in, in several cases. Uh, in this model, as, as you know, probably ions are described kinetically and uh, electrons uh, are treated as, as a, a massless fluid. And uh, within such approach, uh, the hybrid uh, class of Maxwell, uh, they have been derived already uh, both approximately stationary shear flows, there is not, not exact, but close to, uh, or even exact solution in some particular cases like a uniform parallel or perpendicular B, or also variable directed, uh, directed B. Why it is important uh, to use uh, exact stationary shear flows? Of course, we, if, if we are interested in uh, study wave propagation, uh, this is important because otherwise, if I start with a solution with an equilibrium which is not exactly stationary, I will mix um, waves with, uh, um, with the oscillation which arises in consequence of the non-exact uh, uh, equilibrium. But even in the case of uh, 
uh, Kelvin Lemos instability, starting with uh, an exact stationary equilibrium is important uh, because um, we saw in previous works that, for instance, both growth rates uh, and uh, the saturation level of the stability changes according to the fact if we start with uh, an exact equilibrium or a non-exact equilibrium like for instance a shifted Maxwellian. Okay, so uh, what we did in the present work. So we moved uh, within the, the uh, Vlasov Maxwell uh, framework uh, and we had uh, two objectives. The first is to extend uh, the previous work uh, to, mm, to, to derive, to find a more general exact uh, stationary shear flow solution, which uh, uh, could uh, more realistically represent the Earth magnetopause. So uh, I mean that we try to include, uh, to find a solution with a planar shear flow, a variable directing magnetic field, and uh, different temperature density uh, in the magneto sheet and the magneto pose, in magneto sphere, sorry, uh, sides. Okay, and uh, the second point was to derive detailed models for some particular configurations uh, that, that that have been effectively observed uh, in the in the in this context. Okay, so let me start to describe uh, in more detail our our work. Um, so. Um, these, these are the equations that have been considered, the Vlasov equation, the, uh, uh, the two Maxwell equations, and, and the generalized uh, Ohm equation. And we also used an, an, an adiabatic closure for the electron fluid. Um, and this is a sketch of the geometry we used. Uh, okay, so... Uh, Mm, we um, all quantities, uh, vector or scalar, depends only on one direction. The, this is the, the x direction, um, which is the direction crossing the magnetopause. Um, um, we have, uh, we want to obtain a sheared uh, um, f bulk uh, uh, velocity, which is u in this uh, in this uh, uh, sh uh, slide. Uh, we also include uh, uh, a magnetic field which changes direction when we move along x, uh, but keeping the the um, the intensity constant and. Uh, the new ingredients are possibility to have uh, uh, a, um, a density which varies along x and the temperature of protons which also varies along x. So, um, in particular, uh, the density of the magnetosphere should be much, typically is much smaller than that of magnetosheath and the temperature of protons is the, the reverse. So we want to describe this, this kind of situation. Okay, how to build up uh, a stationary solution for for the set of equations I showed uh, in the previous slide. The, mm, the, the classical approach in this sense is to uh, look for, to express the, uh, the, mm, the distribution function as a combination of constant of motion of, the, of single particles. Okay, so the first step is to derive constant of motion. So uh, we can write down the Lagrangian for uh, of particles in, in this kind of, of configuration. And since uh, in, uh, Y and Z are cyclic coordinates, sorry? What is A of X? Okay, A of X is the, um, the uh, vector potential, okay. which is normalized to... Okay. I the okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, it is not capital because uh, I put... Uh, is normalized such as uh, b, b, okay, this normalization. Okay. Um, so uh, since since uh, uh, x and z are cyclic coordinates, we can derive two constant of motions, which are the, this form here. Essentially, these two uh, gives a relationship betwe direct between the position x of of the particle and the components v z and v y of of the velocity, and if we use this relationship, um, we can end up with a, a one D motion equation of the particles in in the x direction. So it will reduce the problem to the one D problem. 
uh, and this is the motion equation. And from that, it is easy to derive uh, an, an, a sort of energy conservation equation like that uh, with, with uh, an, effective, an effective potential, which is a complicated form, which is given by this expression, okay, in which uh, both the uh, electric potential and the vector potential components appear. <clears throat> okay, so uh, if we consider what happens far away from the, from the shear layers, it is easy to see that the defective potential behaves quadratically on X. And this implies that uh, um, there is a sort of a potential well which trapped particles to bounce go forth and back in the X direction. So, uh, in practice, this, this gives the information that uh, X and VX are periodic in time. And uh, uh, in consequence of what I uh, showed before, also VY and VZ are periodic in time. So, in the, in the velocity space, each particle follows a closer trajectory. And uh, in, um, as a consequence, we can calculate the, the, average, the time average of uh, the velocity components and of the, uh, of the uh, position in the X direction. Uh, uh, these quantities are constant of motions. So this is the constant of motion we will use to, uh, to construct the, the um, distribution function. Okay. In particular, these quantities are, are interpreted as, uh, as the guiding center uh, velocity and position, respectively. Okay, so uh, we, try to, we try to express uh, the distribution function as a, fu as a function in terms of, of, of these uh, constant quantities. This is a sketch to describe how we uh, use uh, the, uh, the, these quantities. From a heuristic point of view, we can say that if we have uh, an electric field uh, perpendicular to the magnetic field, this induces uh, a drift velocity in that direction perpendicular both to E and B. And uh, this is, is this component here, the blue one. Uh, but we want to have a, 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 a bulk velocity which is directed along Y for any X position. And this uh, implies that we have to somehow to add uh, uh, another component uh, of drift of, of particles uh, in the direction parallel to B. Okay, uh, so um, based on this idea, we postulate a sort uh, um, um, uh, a distribution function, which is a sort of uh, total, I, I said, total energy Maxwellian, in the sense that there is a total energy inside the exponential of the, of the Maxwellian. When we subtracted the, the, the parallel, the energy, the, the kinetic energy associated to the perpendicular drift, and uh, we also added a, a drift in the, in the parallel direction, uh, that must be chosen in, in, a, in a clever way. Okay, uh, it is easy to see that if we use this, uh, this expression in this particular case when E and B are uh, are uniform, this expression reduces to a shifted Maxwellian. So this reproduces what one expects for, for a, in the case where there is no, uh, no, no shear in the problem. Okay, uh, so uh, using the fact that the Vz prime is equal to the parallel component of the guiding center velocity, we finally end up with this expression for the, uh, for the distribution function, which is completely expressed in terms of, um, uh, of uh, constant of motion. This is stationary by definition. Okay, the sense that if I put this inside the Vlasov equation, I will find that it does not evolve in time. Okay, uh, in this expression, uh, the quantity V VTH is, uh, represents somehow the, the thermal speed of protons. Uh, we have also uh, U parallel, which is the, the, um, the, the drift, uh, par the parallel drift, the velocity, which must be chosen in some way. And uh, uh, we also impose that there is a, a proton pressure balance on the two sides of the, of the shear layer. Okay, 
this is the, um, the particular configuration we, are, we have considered. We have two um, shear layers opposite, uh, which corresponds to, which represent uh, the um, shear layers between the magnetosphere, which is the central region, and two magnetopoles on the two sides. Okay. Uh, this gives us, uh, we also choose an, a particular form for phi, which is the angle between, uh, I go back, sorry, between the, no, it's not, yes, it's this angle here between B and Z, so we allow magnetic field to change direction going from the magneto sheet to the magneto pose and back. And, uh, and this is the value for the for the thermal speed of, of protons, uh, which can also change from inside to outside the magnetosphere. Okay. Uh, we also verified that if, if we insert, if we use the, 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 the form of the distribution function in Faraday's ohms and, and the adiabatic equation, we find also that uh, uh, it is compatible with the time independent magnetic field. Uh, uh, electric field and electron pressure. So globally, it is uh, um, it is uh, stationary. Okay, uh, the the method, of course, the the two mean three minutes. Okay, the above form of of uh, distribution function is implicitly written in the sense that we don't know uh, which is the values of constant of motion. So how we manage these these things, we. Uh, set a grid in the, in the phase space, uh, the four-dimensional grid space, starting for, for each point, we, f we integrate the solution for a particle in the fields we, uh, we said before, and uh, then we calculate the time average of the quantities we are interested in, and inserting the, those values into the expression, we find the, the value of f in at each good point. So, so in, this, in this way, we construct the form of the of the distribution function uh, in the phase space. Okay, so we did this for two particular configurations. This is the first one. This is measured from MMS1 data. And in, in that case, the magnetic field is almost the same direction in the, in the magnetosphere and in magnetosheath. Uh, so uh, in that case, uh, it is easy to see that the the electric field component uh, must change sign from the two sides of the of the of the sheet of the um, uh, of the not current sorry of the velocity sheet uh, and uh, we use uh, these two forms for e and u parallel and uh, this is the results these are the profiles of uh, pre of density and temperature which follows what one expects. And these are the profile of the bulk velocity. We see that uh, the only mm, important component is UI, the one in the, in the anti-sunward direction. And the other components are negligible. So we, uh, in this case, we effectively uh, obtain a quasi-planar flow. Uh, please note that the asymmetry between the two shear layers and this is uh, a typical uh, kinetic effect uh, because uh, in this, the two shear layers uh, we have an op opposite uh, vorticity and gyro motion uh, orientation. Okay. Um, inside the shear layers, these are the form of the shapes of uh, of the distribution function. We can see that there is a, a temperature and isotropy, and also an agyrotropy, and the difference between the two shear layers. Here I show you another, the second uh, um, configuration we considered. In that case, uh, the magnetic field uh, makes a much larger rotation going from one side to the other of the, of the, of the sheets. And uh, in this case, uh, in the magnetic field must keep the same values on the two sides uh, and goes to zero at uh, the center of the two sheets. And uh, okay, this is the form we use the for for the for the U parallel. Okay, I show you the results in that case. Again, we obtain the varying temperature and uh, um, density for ions. In that case, the 
the bulk velocity is uh, less good, uh, to say, in the sense that uh, there is a non-negligible component in the Z direction, so the, the, the shear flow is not exactly planar as before. And uh, also the, the distribution function inside the two shear layers presents uh, more prominent, I would say, um, non-Maxwellian features. And again, uh, the asymmetry between the two shear layers. Okay, so these are the conclusions, and I stop here. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we should move on in the interest of trying to get the lunch on uh, in some okay. sort, of, sort of fashion. <laughs> so I think the last speaker before lunch is, uh, here we are, Gietano Zimbardo. Good morning to everybody. Um, as you can see, I have a strong cold, but yesterday in the evening uh, I went to a pharmacy and made the test, and so the test is negative, so it should not be COVID. It is just a normal cold. Okay, so the title of the talk is Probing the Density Fine Structure of the Solar Corona with Comet Lovejoy. This work was done uh, with a number of people, from Giuseppe Nistico to Silvia Perry and uh, uh, Nakariakov, uh, Dukenfeld and Ruck Müller. And so, w what is the idea? Well, this is the line. Uh, we have uh, some grazing comets, like uh, Comet La Joy, which was also referred to yesterday by Giuseppe Nistico. And uh, in the tail of this uh, comets, uh, there are observations, some uh, striations, which are called the striae, uh, which, have been see which uh, are seen, for instance, in the UV by SDO. Now, we make a modeling of this striae, and we consider the collision times which we have in the corona, because we are in, uh, at heights uh, uh, not so high, maybe 1.4, 1.5 uh, solar radii. And we make the comparison of, of the modeling of the striae with the observations, and we get some results, some information on the density in the corona, in particular the density along the striae, and we discuss the implications for coronal physics. Uh, now, this is an image of the solar corona taken during the eclipse, the Great American Eclipse. Uh, this is an image obtained from the ground, uh, um, processing, I think, about 70 images. Um, okay, so we can see that, of course, we can see the magnetic structure of the corona, and also we can see that there are these very thin um, rays uh, coming from the polar regions, but actually everywhere. Everywhere we have a, a density variation, because these are images in white light, so that they are, it is a light from the sun diffused by electron density, and, and so uh, the luminosity reflects the electron density. And we have the same uh, in seen, for instance, in the uh, observation by um, Metis coronograph aboard the solar orbiter. Uh, now, this was not processed, so the resolution is less, but you can see rather clearly that there are uh, very fine here, too. That there are fine structure here, too, and in here, too. And again, this is total brightness, so this means uh, that uh, the, the structure, uh, the, um, the luminosity is due to the electron density. Now, some grazing comets uh, can be used as probes of the solar corona. Um, these are those comets which come uh, very close to the, to the sun uh, and uh, are seen as a, a small uh, bright, spot, uh, bright spots moving in the images, in the, okay, in the various images. And Comet La Joy was observed by the Atmospheric Imaging Assembly on Solar Dynamics Observatory in the extreme UV in December 2011. And this was uh, very close to the solar surface. The perihelion was just uh, 0 0.2 solar radii above the solar surface. And uh, it, uh, it, it was not destroyed. So it was uh, coming from one side and emerging from the other side. It, it was not destroyed. 
most uh, sun grazing comets are destroyed in the interaction with the corona. Um, um, so we, we, we make a study of this uh, um, uh, trails uh, left by the, um, by the comet, uh, this tail striation which I'm going to, to, to show now. And uh, from this we get some information on the coronal density. Now, um, uh, here you can see some images uh, published by Downs et al. The purple line is the comet trajectory here and here, but there are these uh, uh, signs, these uh, bright uh, regions, uh, which are not along uh, the tail trajectory. They are at some angles, and uh, considering the various magnetic structure, one can see that these uh, striations are along the magnetic field. So these are in the ultraviolet at uh, 1.71 angstrom, and so the understanding is that uh, this is uh, uh, UV emission from uh, oxygen ions, which have been uh, um, eroded by the cometary material. Uh, they, are, they get ionized in a short time, and then once they are ionized, they move along the magnetic field. So they not move uh, along the comet trajectory, but they move along the magnetic field and form this uh, striations. But these striations are not uh, everywhere, at, at just at some discrete locations. And uh, these are our images which we, um, which we obtain. So there are these signs, uh, not perpendicular, but not parallel to the comet trajectory. You, you, you can see one uh, rather clearly here and others here. Uh, so we want to understand uh, what are these striations and then uh, uh, find some uh, information. We model these uh, striations as the result of a uh, uh, cometary injection, uh, injection of cometary material, uh, the beam motion of these ions, and then a diffusive spreading of these ions. So this can be seen as the comet, it is moving this way. Once the material which is uh, eroded by the comet uh, is magnetized, it moves uh, along the magnetic field with the projection of the comet velocity along the magnetic field. So it is a kind of beam, and also these beams get ionized from uh, uh, o plus 1 to O plus 5 and plus 4 and plus 5, which are the ions which emit in this uh, 171 uh, um, angstrom line. And so they also go to, um, through progressively higher ionization states. And so after some time they disappear in the sense that they are going to emit in other, in a, in other lines. Um, okay. Uh, we model this like uh, um, a beam uh, which is slowing down uh, because of collisions. Uh, this is the velocity, this is the position of the beam. And then we model the density of uh, oc emitting uh, oxygen ions as the superposition of this uh, source uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, oxygen ions uh, which are moving with this uh, velocity. Um, uh, times the probability of diffusing uh, from one side or the other. So we have a probability of diffusion, which is, uh, is the Gaussian propagator. And, and so we consider that the ions which are emitted after, collision, after colli making collisions, they spread out uh, in the solar corona along the magnetic field because they are ions. And so we can get the total density in this way. It is just a simple algebra. We have uh, some uh, parameters in the model, which are the time for collisions uh, for a beam, um, for the slowing down of a beam. So this uh, time depends uh, on a number of parameters, like the ion mass and ion charge, and, uh, um, and the, the, the beam velocity too, and of course also the electron density. And then we have another process, which is uh, diffusive dispersion. Again, we have uh, the de dependence on the mass and charge, uh, the Coulomb logarithm, and again, the electron density. So we can um, obtain these times uh, from uh, obtaining the diffusion coefficient from the fits, which I'm going to show. Uh, we also make an assumption on the velocity of random, on, on the random velocity of ions uh, going uh, through the corona. And so from the fit which I'm going to show, uh, we can obtain the slowing time and the diffusion time. And then uh, we can get the electron density from uh, these values. It is necessary to make a number of simplifying assumptions, so like uh, constant density, constant temperature, and static corona, and also uh, rect rectilinear magnetic field. So there are some simplifications. Uh, the data from um, AIA is uh, uh, rectified on a, on a new grid, it is uh, reinterpolated, and so it is the, the comet path has been straightened. And then uh, we have uh, some uh, 
uh, of these striations, uh, uh, which are this one with the blue, blue dots. And we can get uh, from the observation the intensity of these striations also as a function of time. For instance, a, a, a data, um, an example is here. The, the blue line represents this intensity uh, as a function of time. So we have a stronger intensity at start, and then uh, these ions are diffusing around. So we made this, uh, we made this for a number of cases um, here, for instance. So, uh, again, the, the blue line uh, is the data from uh, AIA, and the red line uh, is the model, f the, the model which we use to fit uh, these observations. And we can do this uh, as a function of time uh, by choosing properly these para the parameters like the slowing down, slowing down time, uh, the collision time, but also the, the beam velocity, uh, which is not well known because uh, we don't know di the direction of the magnetic field. So we can get some information from the velocity in the images which we get, but uh, we don't know very well the direction of the magnetic field. So we, we, we made a, a number, of, we, fit, we fitted a number of cases. Um, so the fit is not perfect, but uh, overall is not too bad. Uh, we have done this for several striations. striations and so again, we have the, the red line, which is uh, uh, fitting the observations. Also, we have a, a decay in time of the intensity just because ions are going to higher ionization states. So, so by fitting uh, uh, these um, uh, six different uh, uh, striae, we, we can get uh, the, uh, the times, uh, which I was referring to earlier, the corresponding density, and then the, the average density, which is obtained as the, the average of these two density, referring to the slowing down time and the diffusion time. And we have this density for the corona as a function of, of the distance from the sun. So we have the density at the height corresponding to the um, position of the, of the striae. Stri stri uh, so they the, are um, of the order of five times the 10 to the seven uh, particles per uh, cubic centimeter. Uh, these are our data points uh, with the error bars. Uh, and we can compare this with the uh, density profile ob obtained for instance, assuming a hydrostatic equilibrium, which is a simple exponential. So in this case, we, we, if we plot back, this would imply a density on the solar corona, on the coronal base of the order of five or 10, part, five or ten times 10 to the nine particles, which is perhaps too much. Uh, we also made a comparison uh, with the other data obtained for the coronal density, for instance, by uh, Zuc et al. Um, these are uh, observations by OS SDO AIA obtained from uh, the emission measure on integrated along the line of sight. So these are average densities. And these are the density which we obtain. So our density are larger than the average density. Um, and similar conclusions were reached by Raymond et al, who also studied the, the, the stria and they, um, they plotted the intensity um, as a function of distance along the comet trajectory. So one can see that uh, there are these different uh, striations uh, and uh, well, they also give an estimate of the density. So what we find, what, what we find is that the density are larger by, um, by a factor of two or three with respect to the average density. And uh, if this is the average density, and these are the peak density due to the striations, this means that the density in the corona is uh, made up by lower and higher density regions. So uh, from this uh, ratio of about uh, two or three, we can get a, a density ratio between uh, the peak density and the minimum density of, the, of order five or six. And this is consistent with the study of Raymond, which, which was done in a different way anyway. So his, they said that the, the ratio of density in the stria, uh, between the interstria space and the peak is at least six. And also from the observation, we can get uh, the distance uh, uh, between the different stria, and this is of the order of 5,000 5, kilometers or less, uh, or less. So in conclusion, we can say that the coronal density appears to be finally structured with a peak to valley ratio of, of order six or more, over distances of uh, 5,000 kilometers or less. And this corresponds to what, what, what is seen, actually. So we have a, a loose, at least two questions. What is the origin of this uh, density structuring? I don't know, 
But one possibility is the one which was uh, described yesterday by Rawafi. Maybe it is the result of a magnetic reconnection in the, in the, at the coronal base, which is injecting material up. Um, so we have to ask, what is the origin of this uh, density structure? And then what is the influence? Because this uh, varying density is going to influence, uh, for instance, uh, the propagation of waves uh, in the solar corona. And uh, on this, um, uh, we have uh, several studies which were, were made by Francesco Malara in the course of years. On the, for instance, the formation of small scales uh, via half wave propagation in non-uniform media, non -uniform media. More recently, they studied uh, by means of several uh, MHD, whole MHD and kinetic simulation, the propagation of half waves in a in homogeneous plasma, which can lead to the generation of uh, kinetic affin waves uh, and to uh, enhance the dissipation, even to, um, to well, can lead to phase mixing and uh, uh, resonant interaction with particles. And, and you see, this is the, this uh, picture is taken from this paper, so it was not done for this talk, but uh, you can see the alpha speed is changing this way. And, and this clearly is going to influence the propagation waves. Now, this was done uh, changing the strength of the magnetic field, but we, you, you have exactly the same if you change the plasma density. So this study is already a, a good starting point to understand what happens when the uh, coronal density is um, structured in this way, so with these uh, very fine structures. And also we can get uh, the, uh, we have the, the ratio of the density in the high density region, low density regions, and the scale. So we have the scale of the gradient density. So we can, this can allow for quantitative studies. Uh, that's all. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. I think it is time for lunch, but do you want to say a quick question? I'll have everybody. Sorry, very quickly, get out. Uh, just a question. Uh, do you assume that uh, the striae um, are located where the, the coronal density is higher uh, or, or not? No, no. This is a result of the, st of the study. We, we take the striae located where, where they appear in the UV images. Uh, and we, we make a, a, a slit with the, to obtain the profile of emission along this striae. And then fitting the emission with the model, we can infer the density in that striae. And since this density is uh, regularly larger than the average density which is obtained, uh, for instance, integrating along lo the line of sight, uh, we, we can say that this density is larger than the average density, which also means that the nearby flux tubes have a lower density. So uh, on average, there is a, from this study, there is a ratio about five or six uh, in, in the density be between the peak and the valley. But, but the, the conclusion is also that the striae are due to the high density regions because there were other high assumptions or other hypotheses to understand the, the original striae. All right, thank you. I think yeah, yeah, uh, we have one more question. Oh. Um, the fact that we see the striae in discrete Russian, do we have any information about the rotation rate of the nucleus? I mean, why I'm asking about that because we expect that the emission from the nucleus is not uniform. You have like yes. geysers yes. around the nucleus. That's probably the reason why we have them uh, in discrete fashion. So do you have any information about the rotation of the nucleus? Um, um, in some cases, yes. In some cases, one can see that the... the the tail, um, yes, the, the tail of the comet, no, the, the signal which comes from the tail comet is moving, and there is a rotation. Um, it can be seen here. Uh, in this feature, it is seen that uh, this is the comet tail, and uh, here the material is going this way, and here it's going on the other way. And so if, if one looks at the movie, because one can make the movie, it, it can be seen that this region is uh, rotating like this. Uh, did I answer? Be because we, we don't have uh, uh, information directly uh, between different striae. Um, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, let's go to lunch. And I think uh, the intent is to come back on schedule at 1420.
Grazie mille. <laughs>
prova, prova.
Good afternoon. We can restart after lunch. This is the section about particle acceleration by turbulence, reconnection, and shocks. And the first speaker is Silvia Perry that will talk about interpretation of flat energy spectra upstream of interplanetary shocks. You have uh, 15 minutes plus five. After 10 minutes, I will tell you five. Okay? Uh, so I have to say just uh, a brief uh, uh, introduction. Uh, this is, of course, the list of my co-authors, but I have to say that this idea of studying this problem uh, born uh, in, to, in uh, the Arcetri meeting in uh, 2019, just uh, before the, um, the pandemic, discussing with Giorgia Calone, who was uh, present uh, in, the, in that, uh, in that uh, edition. Then, unfortunately, there was the pandemic and all the mess you know uh, better than me, and uh, the, the evolution of this, uh, of this project was a, bit, a little bit uh, delayed. But uh, now uh, we are uh, getting close and, uh, to an, a, a probably reasonable interpretation of this problem, and uh, uh, I hope that uh, the paper will be submitted pretty soon. This is uh, an outline of, uh, of my talk. Um, yeah, I will just uh, make a very, very brief review about uh, the interpretation of uh, flat energy spectra uh, in, uh, in literature, uh, what uh, we know the possibilities for uh, this kind of uh, phenomenon. And then I will present the analysis of uh, three shock crossing by the ACE and uh, the WIND uh, spacecraft. Uh, at one AU, uh, and then I we will uh, I will <coughs> talk about uh, our interpretation of this uh, of this phenomenon. These uh, uh, these two figures are from the paper by Larry et al. 2018, um, and uh, these are two events which actually I'm uh, going to examine in details uh, after uh, afterwards where. Uh, there are intense solar energetic particle events associated to two interplanetary shocks. The solid vertical lines indicate the, the position of the shock wave here and here. These are the fluxes of energetic particles in this range of energies. Uh, these are, this is uh, the, uh, the, the bulk speed of, uh, of, uh, of the plasma, and this is the intensity of the magnetic field. Uh, for example, in this, uh, in this event, you see um, a, a continuous increase as the spacecraft approaches the shock of the uh, energetic particles, and in a given range of energy, you see what? You see a superposition of the fluxes of in... Uh, in uh, in these energy channels, and uh, for a very long uh, time uh, window in the upstream of this shock. This means that in this region, the spectrum of these energetic particles is basically flat. Okay? Uh, after that, uh, they start to increase, they continue to increase, uh, and uh, there is a sort of uh, energy selection, as we will see later. And uh, he, this is another event. Uh, these are both from the ACE, uh, um, from ACE uh, EPAM instrument, uh, and for the very high energy, there was also some detection from uh, the GOES 11. Uh, but the same event was also detected by uh, the wind, by the wind spacecraft with the, the same kind of features. So by two different spacecraft with the same kind of features. So uh, the mechanism probably related to, to the particle escape from the close to the shock region uh, to the spacecraft position. And this means that uh, probably some uh, uh, transport properties involve, uh, involvement, involvement is, uh, is present. Interpretation. There is a paper by Goethe et al. 2003 
where they uh, constructed the model in which uh, energetic particles couples with, uh, uh, with um, accelerated aftershock couples with alpha waves uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the plasma. And uh, high energy ions streaming away from the shock going back tends to amplify uh, the, um, the upstream waves. This, of course, this process will uh, uh, regulate the low energy particle behaviors, which uh, are going to be, in uh, some sense, scattering and trapped, continuously interacting with these waves, which are generated by energetic particles. This will lead to uh, a flat energy spectrum. Again, you see the profile. This is as a function of time in uh, their model. You see that there is an overlapping here, but this is pretty short in time, which is uh, at variance with, with what has been observed in the, in the observation, where also you have this superposition up to 12 hours upstream of the shock. Another interpretation was also uh, discussed by Prislu et al. in 2019, when they consider uh, solving the transport equation a competing effect between shock acceleration and adiabatic cooling of particles. Um, at uh, one AU, they found indeed some flattening, as you see, of the energy spectrum. Uh, but when you approach one AU, uh, this flattening involves a very short range of energy, and uh, <coughs> we, mm, which is, uh, in some sense, sometimes at variance with. Uh, with observations. Okay, let's discuss uh, a little bit more in detail the events analyzed. Uh, this is uh, uh, an ice uh, shock crossing, this is the interplanetary shock, and this is the, the, as the leading edge of the associated interplanetary C uh, CME. Uh, these are uh, fluxes over this range of energy. Uh, and uh, uh, the shaded region wants to highlight the uh, wind of the time window where you have these over positions of, um, of fluxes. These are the three uh, inert magnetic field components, and you see basically that the magnetic field in this region all over upstream is almost radial. And you see here the flux rope of the CME. This is the shade region downstream, and this is the Density. Uh, there are some uh, data gaps in the ACE instrument, so we over we uh, over um, over plotted the wind. Uh, the wind density shifted to the ACE position, and this is basically the angle between the radial magnetic field um, uh, and uh, the, the radial direction and the mean magnetic field. Just to uh, better show that in some, in some uh, interval, the, uh, the, the, the field is really radial. So in, in this case, we are basically well connected to, to, the, shock, uh, to the shock surface. And these are uh, the parameters of the shock. Uh, just I wanted to address that, of course, the determination of the theta behind the angle between the shock normal and the, and the magnetic field is sometimes tricky uh, in the sense that we use different methods, which, of course, can also give to large errors because of the high variability of the magnetic field um, across, across the discontinuity. These are the typical parameters, so it's a very strong shock uh, with, uh, with a velocity uh, of about 800 kilometer, kilometer per second. And again, as I mentioned before, you see this overlapping of the fluxes for more than 12 hours upstream. After that, you see that they start to separate it. It's not very clear from here, but trust me that here, it, a sort of energy selection is again recovered, and uh, a, a steep energy spectrum is, uh, is observed. Uh, uh, what uh, uh, we, uh, we computed is the power spectral density of uh, the magnetic uh, field uh, turbulence in the regions, both where there is this overlapping of the fluxes of the energetic particles, but also close to uh, the shock. Uh, this is the, uh, the spectrum in this region, close upstream and far upstream, and these are the scales corresponding to the gyro radius of the energetic particles of the which uh, I, showed, uh, I showed before, of, co of course. Uh, and uh, uh, you see that at these scales, the uh, far upstream spectrum tends to be 
pretty close to the uh, to Kolmogorov, while uh, far upstream, uh, close upstream, sorry, there is at these scales uh, an index close to minus one, and there is of course more power associated. So uh, in some sense, uh, uh, the presence uh, it, 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 we can probably guess that it, it can be a sort of. Uh, mm, how to say, magnetic energy injection, injection close to the shock at the scales corresponding to the energetic particles. And this can be also seen here. This is a scalogram of the magnetic field, of the total magnetic field, uh, using uh, the wavelet analysis. Uh, the details are nicely described in this paper. Um, and this is the, the modulus squared of the, of the wavelet coefficients where we used uh, a Morlet wavelet. Uh, and the, the, we, summed up, we summed up over the three, the three magnetic field components. Uh, uh, here is the, with the yellow box, we would like to highlight the um, overlap, the, the, the regions upstream, the region upstream where the uh, spectrum flattens. And uh, these basically are the, they are the frequencies corresponding to the energetic particles, and this uh, is the shock position. So you can, of course, see the strong compression in the shade region just downstream of the shock. There is the close upstream region, which uh, I hope so. Uh, I hope to manage. <laughs> the magnetic energy here is um, uh, higher than in, um, in this region, and uh, so of course, uh, as we will see later, we should expect uh, some interaction of these energetic particles with the turbulence here. Uh, this is uh, another event, event uh, very similar to the previous one. Uh, again, these are the spectra, and these are the characteristic uh, uh, numbers of, uh, of the shock. In this case, we found actually a bit uh, a little bit, uh, uh, we, uh, with respect to the previous one, uh, the power in the uh, magnetic field fluctuation is a bit higher upstream, also far upstream, uh, than close upstream when we go to very, very large scale. And this can be also noted here. There is uh, also far upstream some, um, <coughs> uh, th there are fluctuations here. Yeah. Just to mention, Bill, that of course, uh, something like this uh, can be also reproduced with the PVI. Of course. <laughs> yeah, just to <laughs> to underline. In, uh, well, I looked, uh, but I didn't find uh, nothing uh, significant. But I have to say that I quickly did this. Probably I can uh, try to redo this and see whether there is also some wave activity. At the first analysis, I didn't find uh, particular features uh, in the helicity. But I tried. And the third one is uh, the crossing of uh, the 14th of July, 2012. Um, uh, and again, this is an, uh, another pretty strong, uh, strong shock. And here the same uh, characteristic I showed for the other one. And this is, again, the, uh, the feature of uh, the magnetic field the turbulence. There is also a pretty high level here. But... Uh, what we also observed is the particle anisotropy, uh, I mean the normalized ion fluxes in nine energy channels, which are this one, organized in eight beams in pitch angle, in order to see uh, effects of anisotropy in the energetic particle. And this comes from the Wind3DP solid state telescope experiment on, uh, on board wind, the wind spacecraft. Fluxes are, as you can see, uh, look at, the, at the, the blue traces. This is downstream. And you see that uh, for all, uh, almost all the energy channel, as you can expect, the particles tend to be m mostly isotropic in pitch angle, OK? Are uh, broadly distributed in pitch angle. Uh, 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 while when you go, uh, get, go close upstream, Again, for low energy particles, there is a, a certain degree of isotropy, but you see that as you go to higher energetic particle, anisotropy in pitch angle increases. And uh, of course, you can find some de degree of anisotropy in the far upstream region where there is this feature of flat spectrum. 
Uh, similar, this is uh, just for uh, the first event I showed on May. I did the similar stuff for the other two with, I have to say, pretty similar result. Just one thing for the event I showed before, this one, the degree of isotropy is, uh, no, sorry, uh, sorry, mistake. This one, uh, where we found much more uh, uh, turbulence upstream, the degree of uh, uh, um, isotropy is a bit higher also in the, the far upstream region because there is uh, all these fluctuations which tend to isotropize to scatter the particles. So See, sure. yes. The blue points, the downstream yeah. points, yeah. Ah, deficit okay. at plus and minus one mm. This can be investigated. I didn't think about this. Yeah, thank you. And yes. Here, uh, as you see, now I didn't plot this, uh, but just looking at the value, basically we are dealing with obli either oblique or perpendicular shocks. You see? Oh, except for this, we, the, here there is a pretty huge spread in, uh, in the error, I have to say. But you see, so we are uh, getting there. Um, yes, how we, did we explain this? I have to say this otherwise. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is the, uh, we interpret this observation with the, with, the the with the sort of velocity filter. We imagine that the parallel velocity, co the parallel component of this, the, the energetic particle speed has to be much greater, uh, greater than uh, uh, the, the plasma speed upstream in the shock frame. This is the plasma speed upstream in the shock frame. So, from this, we can reconstruct it, what? The differential density of uh, upstream propagating particles, which is here. This is the full distribution function. So we aligned basically the uh, polar axis along the upstream magnetic field in order that this alpha correspond to the, to the pitch angle, okay? Assuming that close upstream the distribution function is almost isotropic, we can uh, pass from this to the omnidirectional one, okay? So, and uh, uh, we imagine that the escaping particles uh, travel, traveling along B can go, uh, so uh, can escape if the pitch angle uh, varies from uh, being uh, uh, aligned with the magnetic field to a maximum, a maximum value. So solving straightforwardly this integral, we obtain this. So, there is a, so basically this is the flux modified by this term which comes from the velocity filter condition. What we did, we plotted the flux as a function of the energy um, and uh, we varied the first uh, the theta bn, fixing the, the shock, the, the, up the plasma speed, okay? And this is the behavior. You see that when we go, to, uh, we approach the quasi, the quasi perpendicular geometry, there is a depletion here of the flux in a certain energy range, which is uh, goes uh, from about 70 kV to 600 kV, which is in agreement with the range of energy we observed uh, having a flattening spectrum. So there is here this the depletion. And if we fix theta bn and we vary the shock, the shock speed basically, we find again a depletion uh, when we consider very, uh, of course, very high, um, very fast, very fast shocks. In, uh, we can also define a critical angle, just uh, uh, satisfying this, uh, this condition, the theta bn angle, and of course for uh, theta bn much greater than this, of course the particle cannot escape. They can be either trapped in the turbulence close upstream, close upstream or transmitted downstream. And this is the theta BN, this, this critical theta bn angle as a function of the energy. And you can see that when we approach high energies, 
the escape of condition can be easily satisfied even for quasi perpendicular shock geometry. Okay? So, uh, uh, <coughs> okay, this is uh, almost done. So, these are my conclusions. Uh, we have reported this uh, three shock crossing by Eisenwind spacecraft. We found that close upstream, the spectrum at that scales uh, tends to be close to minus one, suggesting an injection of uh, a magnetic energy there. We find that there is uh, higher energy particles are more anisotropic close upstream than the lower energy particles, suggesting that they can escape easily from this region, while low energy particles are interacting close upstream and tend to be isotropized. Uh, and we have interpreted such observation via velocity filter condition, which uh, leads to this depletion of the flux in a given energy range. It depends, of course, on the theta Bn and on the, the, shock, uh, the shock speeds. That's it. Yes. So, uh, do you have any idea on the space uh, scale where you separate this far region and close region? What is this space? Yes, there is no net separation. That really depends on uh, on uh, sometimes on the event. Uh, in this case, uh, I have to say that we, our eye was highly guided by, uh, by, the fact, uh, by the fact that here you have overlap, uh, these overlapped fluxes. Okay? So for, in this case, for us, far upstream means the regions where they overlap, while close upstream where they separate. But it's not, it not a strict definition of the two regions. So thank you very much. We can move to the... So thanks again, the speaker. Okay, the next speaker of this section is Emilia Jordanova. She will talk about plasma heating in the solar wind turbulence from solar orbiter. Thank you. Hello? Yes, seems working. Okay, so uh, this is the outline of my presentation. So first uh, I will uh, briefly mention the motivation for this whole uh, uh, work. As uh, we heard this morning, um, we know there is a lot of work, especially from simulations coming and some support of simulation uh, observations, that uh, local heating due to turbulence uh, occurs in coherent structures. So, uh, reconnecting current sheets or vortices, um, uh, this kind of uh, structures. But uh, the problem is that we usually, uh, especially in the solar wind, we observe or do measurements with single spacecraft. So, uh, to estimate gradients, you need multipoint measurement. So, we developed a method uh, where we validated uh, the single point uh, proxies for the current, uh, which is the partial variate of increment of, um, of the magnetic field, and for the vorticity, which is the PVI from the uh, velocity. Uh, we validated this with uh, multi-point measurements from MMS in the, in the magneto sheet, and then uh, we um, looked at, at solar wind and uh, we looked for cor correlations and this, uh, these correlations, they are correlations to, uh, with implication to uh, plasma heating. So um, I will show the application of this method and uh, also how this um, uh, is um, applied to different solar wind types from solar orbiter data. And 
Yes, so here one can actually see very clearly, this is a peak simulation. Uh, we have, we see clearly the coherent structure formation. So in this panel, we have the out of plane current. Uh, and this is the vorticity, then we have uh, the relative temperature increase and the, the change in the temperature in isotropy and the relative heat in the ions and electrons. And uh, you just looking by the colors, you see that we have this concentration uh, or the formation of structures. And uh, what is um, uh, really important here is also that we see the temperature parameters correlate well with the, with the current and the vorticity. But if we looked really closely, we will see that the, while the heating is occurring in the uh, regions uh, close to or around the current sheets, they are actually much better correlated with the vorticity. So we have this correlation between the structure, the current sheets, the flow uh, motion, and the temperature. And now, this is where we apply the, the methods with the proxies for the current and the vorticity. So in this super busy plot, this is a measurement of or observation of the CME, uh, CME sheet at L1 by wind spacecraft. So here we have this magenta line is the interplanetary shock. So uh, upstream is the solar wind and uh, peer turp. And then here somewhere, starts the magnetic cloud. Uh, so all this is the sheet region. And if we focus on the top panel, which is the magnetic field, you see that sheet regions of the CMEs are usually compressed and uh, very turbulent solar wind. And you have a lot of changes in the, not only in the magnetic field, but all plasma parameters, and a lot of directional changes as well. And this is reflected in, if you calculate the PVI of the magnetic field, which is the second panel, and then combined with the rotation of the, or the shear of the magnetic field, which in combination with PVI will uh, give you, when you have strong rotation, it, this will be an indication that you are detecting current sheets. Then we can do the same thing for the velocity field, which is uh, the fourth panel, and then we have PVI, V, and the, and the velocity shears. Again, we see that we have quite good uh, activity there. And this is the important panel here now, which shows the correlation between the partial variant of increments of the magnetic field and the velocity. So what is immediately seen that in the vicinity of the shock, we have, very, uh, we, we have not good correlation between these two parameters. So the green line here is, uh, set to 0 0.6, which we chose to be a representation for a good correlation. But then if we move away deeper in the sheath, we have this kind of uh, highlighted yellow regions, which are where we have the discontinuities or the current sheets and the velocity or the vortices. And at the same time, we have, of course, this good correlation between the proxies for these parameters. And at the, if we look at the temperature, we have increases in the temperature in, this, uh, in these groups of structures, where in between them there is nothing happening much. So close to the shock, we have very big heating as well, but there is no correlation between uh, the, uh, these structures or the, this measure. So this means that we have two different uh, heating mechanisms here. One is, this is uh, clearly associated with the shock, and these are clearly associated with this kind of turbulence generated structures. Yeah, so this was, this was uh, just to demonstrate the, um, how we uh, validated the method. And now I am moving to the solar orbiter data. So this is another CME case. Now I'm showing the entire CME measurement. So somewhere here we have the shock. You can see uh, is the, the jumps in the, the magnetic field and the, the velocity, not yes here, and then the, the heating. So this is a complex structure, so and it's not clear where actually the sheath finishes, but let's say somewhere 
here we have some, in the sheet regions you can have also this kind of small scale magnetic flux uh, ropes that are bounded by a lot of discontinuities. And then this is the, the sort of, uh, some sort of a cloud. I looked at some simu uh, simulations from uh, Enlil model and you can see that actually solar orbiter didn't get um, the, f the full explosion, I mean, they didn't get um, to cross the CME through the center, to the, the flux rope, but it was a glancing blow, so it's not very beautiful uh, flux rope. But nevertheless, you can see, actually, that again, they, we have this very clear heating associated in, with the shock uh, and the, the sheet region. And now here I'm plotting again the correlation between the PVI V and B that you saw from the previous slide. But also on top I'm plotting the so-called, um, some sort of integral uh, 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 running window calculated measure of the, from the correlation between the PVI and B and V to see better like the, the general trend to, to compare with the, the temperature. And here on the temperature, you see this green line, which uh, is, I, I smoothed the temperature because we know that solar orbiter measurements uh, uh, of the moments are not, uh, say, fantastic, so I, I don't want to be uh, uh, biased by the small scale fluctuations. We, we are interested in um, uh, correlations anyway. We are not doing point-to-point co uh, -point correlation. Yes. So, yes. Yeah, so you can see here that again we have all these structures. We have the heating associated, and then in the cloud, nothing is happening. And this is not to be surprised. The clouds are smooth structures. No, nothing. Uh, no small scale fluctuations, and they are cold. But once we, s we exit the CME and we are back to the solar wind, we start to, s you, we pick up, picked up the turbulence again. So you get the structures and you get the heating. Okay, next, next example, slow wind. Uh, you see, quite, quite uh, slow wind. So I, I'm going to uh, make you dizzy with uh, this kind of plots uh, all the time. So we, the, the, the way out <laughs> layout is the same for all the examples. We have the magnetic field, we have velocity, PVIB, PVIV, and the rotations and temperature and the correlations between the two. So now in the slow wind, what we see is typical, okay, this will be a disaster. <laughs> uh, so we have typical behavior of so, uh, slow wind, which is a lot of structures, a lot of discontinuities bounding small scale flux ropes. If we look at the correlation between the, um, the PEI, um, magnetic field and velocity, we see these blobs that I was showing in the CME. Exactly, we have PEI activities and we have these blobs and they are kind of following the, the increases in the temperature. While in between them, it's quite uh, uncorrelated with the temperature. And here, a solar orbiter is 0 0.73. So I forgot to say that this CME was at 0 0.36 AU. Uh, okay, so we did, we took the approach of uh, Osman, uh, where we take the peaks of the PVIs and we look the temperature uh, um, dependence from, as a distance from, uh, from time distance from the peak of the PVI. So the difference here is what we do is that we actually uh, try to understand the contributions from the different uh, 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 sort of participants in, in, this, <laughs> in this correlation. So, so while Osman did uh, this kind of uh, dependence only from the PVI of the magnetic field, now we are doing, we're including the PVI from the velocity or the vorticity. We also include the conditioning. So we have here, we consider also only PVI larger than two and also uh, magnetic rotations larger than 20 degrees, which is in the solar wind is quite significant. 
And okay, all these colors are corresponding to all these parameters, but it's important to notice that we see that the larger contribution to the, to the temperature comes from the vorticity, which was shown in the beginning from the, the simulation. If we cut some of the, uh, if we look really at the stronger uh, structures, then we see something different. First of all, you don't have this nice peak that at the center of the structure you will have the highest heating, but it's more like flattened. And then the vorticity is now in the bottom, but instead you have the, the combined effect. So you have the current sheets and the vorticity condition to, to yes, to the current sheets basically with, with um, the angle. So what this, what this tells you that the integral effect of the, the small gradients is significant in the heating here. So it's not only that the, the strongest uh, structures will contribute to the local heating, they might actually, because of the strong interaction, to, to propagate energy in, um, in all directions. Uh, okay, so let me see what I can skip. This is a stream interaction region. So now this is interesting example because we have, now we have higher speed going to, uh, becoming slow wind and then it picks up again to become a more faster stream, 0 0.77 uh, AU. The correlations, now we look. We, you have a lot of these blobs and this general increase of the temperature, which are nicely corresponding. But then you have this, exactly this stream interaction region. So the border, where you have a lot of vertical flows. So huge activity in the vorticity and the velocity shears. Nothing, not so much in the, in the, um, the current or the magnetic field. And of course, you have very little in the correlation here. And we are moving away towards the faster stream and then the correlation picks up and then again you have increase in the temperature. So you have the blobs there, but depending on where you are, uh, at the stream interaction region you, don't, you have this kind of vorticity dominating, which you can see here, uh, but I will skip. This is one month you, uh, wind data at 1AU, same thing. Uh, fast to slow to fast wind, the blobs that are correlating with the temperature. In the, f the slow wind, it's much more intermittent. You have occasionally something, but the fast wind, definitely you have these uh, uh, more structures because the fast wind is pervaded by discontinuities in current sheets and you have the heating there. Um, ah, I'll finish slow wind. Yes, yeah, so this is a, a case where actually this method doesn't work. So um, now we are again back to 0 0.37, really close to the sun. You have the, the fluctuations are purely alphanic. If you plot the velocity and magnetic field, you will see they are absolutely the same. And you can see very low PVI values in the, in the magnetic field and the velocity. A lot of uh, um, the shares, there is a lot of rotations, uh, which is fine, which is similar. Uh, I mean, uh, what is alvenicity? And then, if you follow the integral uh, PVI correlation and you try to see some correspondence to the temperature, there is nothing there. You cannot see these kind of nice blobs that we saw. But if you go to the authentic slow wind at 0.64 AU, there you now you start to see much nicer uh, correspondence between the temperature. Again, we have this kind of uh, uh, correspondence between the structures. So the, I would say the turbulence is more developed. You have all this. Um, the he uh, heating there cor um, correlating with the, with the structures. So, yes, I think uh, maybe I can, can stop because, uh, okay, yes.
I would like to comment one point, that in uh, simulations when we see the coherent structures and the simulation box is 150 ion uh, inertial lengths, then the coherent structures where we suppose enhanced dissipation are very narrow. And now in the solar wind we see that those blobs where we see increasing uh, uh, occurrence of coherent structures those blobs are se many times several hour long. So I, I wonder if we have a simulation box several orders of magnitude larger. I know it is impossible. How the coherent structures and their position would look like. And you have to understand the main, main message from here that when we have very narrow coherent structures, we can have insignificant heating. But when those uh, coherent structures are in very large blobs, then the heating becomes very, very significant because it is, it is uh, occupying large volumes. Maybe it's wrong, but this, this is the result. Other questions? So in the, in the first event that we va validated the method, it, they were in ion inertial lands. It was about uh, from 12 to 50,000 inertial lands. Ah. So it's the, is it correspond to the end of the network? Uh, no, 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 no. It's some sort of <laughs> mesoscale <laughs> thing. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, because uh, also now this this here is like uh, half an hour, some minutes. But if we look uh, in this case, we have hours now already, and then uh, in this ovenic uh, slow wind, we have like uh, one and a half day or something like this. Yeah, you can see here this uh, this part. No. And another thing is, if you take the geometric mean of the, of the dissipation scale and the, and the correlation scale, then you have something like a micro scale. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, yes. 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 And just to touch base with the Parker Solar Pro stuff, it could be that these things also map back to the dominant flux tube size that goes all the way down to. Absolutely. Yes. That yes. doesn't mean that nothing happened between the two. No, places, no, no. Right? no. Exactly. It just means something is modulated. Yes. No, absolutely. But this is very Dragon difficult to. to mm. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Well, we're just saying that these blobs, I'm suggesting they might be just the people are in the closest way. Okay. Thank you.
Now I need to use this uh, oil. Sorry, friends. So just one minute. Okay, we can continue during the coffee break. All the discussion. Just uh, yes. Just we forgot with Silvia to say that there is a, a special issue in frontiers that is encouraging girls researchers leading a, a research. Yes, in space with. Yeah. Yes, we agree. You're not a girl. Okay. So just look at this uh, frontier section, frontiers paper. So, okay, we can move. So the next uh, presentation will be done by Gong Li. The results is from uh, Pogorelov. Okay, so you have uh, 15 minutes plus five. Okay, perfect. So Nick won't be here, so I'm going to give his talk. That means we probably can save some minutes here. And uh, so the, the title of his talk is Pick Up Ions in the Outer Heliosphere and Beyond. Uh, the point is to, if we want to model outer heliosphere, we have this big MHD code. And then uh, the point to have this pick up ions is if you have contribution from coming from interstellar uh, neutrals, and what, how does this affect this dynamics of the system? So you think about this as a global MHD calculation. So uh, the interaction between this uh, interst uh, interstellar medium and the solar wind, it have some structures here. So you can have uh, this termination shock, and then you have this uh, heliopause, and then you have the ball shock. So from here, this interstellar medium, here we have the sun. So in, normally what we do is you consider this as one fluid uh, system. So the solar wind just coming out, you just, just simulate this as one fluid, and then you look at the both energy and the momentum, and then you actually look at this super um, alphenic wind, and then you're going to go through this termination shock, and then you're going to have this uh, uh, subsonic, and then in the heliopause you get into the interstellar medium. So the point about this talk is to see, instead of treating this system as this one piece, so the solar wind coming here, we're going to put in an uh, inner boundary here, the termination shock coming from these neutrals. So this will be pick up ions contribution to this global system. Because this is a large uh, scale, and if you think about the system, this uh, including up to uh, over 100 AU, there's a lot of complications that you can actually consider. One of them is this kinetic, kinetic process. So the neutral particles come in because this, you have charge exchange. There are two sort of a population of these pick up, pick up ions. One of these is photoionization. So that has a high intensity. The photon has a high intensity close to the sun. So you can generate some pick up ions by the photoionization of neutrals in the solar wind. The other piece, which actually I uh, need to go back one slide, is coming from uh, this interstellar medium. You have neutral comes in. They don't get affected by the magnetic field. So they can go freely into the solar wind where the density of the ions is, is high, so you're going to have charge exchange. This is volume filling. It's not only this close to the sun, it's actually everywhere. So that's how the uh, couplings uh, go. So, um, so one of the things is once you have this pickup ions, it's a neutral, so, so they actually have, if you think about it, they, they're going to have a ring distribution in the solar wind frame. So they, they are not thermal particles. So once they get charge exchange, they are one kind of fluid by itself. So you, there are two different ways of doing these pickup ions. You can either treat pickup ions as uh, kinetic uh, 
uh, approach, or you can treat them as a fluid which has a ring distribution, but you can integrate and get all the different moments of that. So now you can write down these uh, three fluid uh, mo uh, uh, equations. You can have this just a plasma, the normal plasma, uh, one fluid uh, model, and then you can put into these neutrals, into these neutrals, they are also fluid by themselves. And then you have this interchange between the uh, plasma and neutral through this pickup ion, so you're going to have a source term coming from the neutral get into this pickup ion somewhere here, and then this one will also couple to the plasma because now this guy is, is charged, so you're going to have this, this pressure coming from this pickup ions. It's going to play a role in the plasma. The bottom line is now you have three fluid, so having this extra fluid coming from this neutral will change the dynamics of the system. So let's see how we're going to model that. So the left panel here is, uh, so this slide basically some, uh, some calculations already. Um, so I would say on the left is all the plasma uh, quantities. So let's see, that's uh, magnetic field, temperature, uh, velocity, and uh, number density. So these are comparisons between model and this Ulysses observations. This is already, so when I see this is a plasma, it's corresponding to the upper part of this first fluid in the, in the last slide. And then you're going to put in this, uh, on the right-hand side, this is on the, the last fluid in the last slide. This is all the neutrals. So again, these are, I couldn't read that. So it's some, this is uh, uh, velocity, this is, uh, Vina. Yeah, whatever you see, so it must be right. Uh, this is, uh, again, this is VR, so kilometers per second. This must be magnetic field, right? So this is magnetic of the magnetic field. So this is basically putting in, once you put in this, uh, the third fluid, what's, a, what's this uh, enhancement? The enhancement, I didn't show the without the pick into, without the pick up on contributions, but this is just to say the comparison is really nice. So, so it's important you have this, uh, the third fluid. This again is this, uh, now once you put into this uh, uh, pick up ions into this MHD equations, you can also look at what is effect on the turbulence. So this conference, we talk about a lot of these turbulence. You can have a, equation to look at how the turbulence energy evolves as a function of R. You can also, so this one will be the energy con content. This one will be the sigma C here, a sigma R, no sigma R, so just a cross helicity. And then you have this lambda, which is the correlation length. So again, all of these parameters depends because you have one new energy source into the system. So this, they're going to be affected because now you have the third uh, uh, component, the third fluid component coming from this, uh, this neutral particles. So um, what Nick did in this, uh, in this case is to, as I mentioned in the first slide, is if you have a termination shock which has a sudden change in all the quantities, MHD quantities, because it's, a, it's, it's think about this as inner boundary uh, when you model this outer, uh, the helio pulse, uh, the helio uh, sheath, you can treat the termination shock as an inner boundary. So everything happens inside, uh, you, you sort of separate and model them. Once you have these parameters, these neutrals, right over here, at the pickup ions, right at this here, you can treat that pickup ions as a driven force, a source term, right over here. So everything here is go from the termination shock uh, uh, out, so we're going to treat this as insert this as a, as an inner boundary. The bottom line is, if you look at uh, the, so this will be the uh, inner helio sheath. So it's not clear here, but this will be this part of this diagram. So you have this right, this is right. Both of this are the inner helio sheath. So you look at the extension is tension of this inner helio sheath. The termination shock, if I look at here, this is slightly, so this will be the termination shock. So, so we are actually looking at here, the inner helio sheath here. So this guy is a little bit further out, so you can see from here very clearly. 
So this will be the inner heater sheath is get pushed out further because the termination shock is is both extending out and also because yeah this the dynamics changed by this uh, pickup ions. The effect is you have this part moved out from this part. It's not that clear, but you can see from here the separation of the inner helio sheath. Uh, this blueish here is this is interstellar medium. So it's going to be get pushed out from here and becomes more clear in this in this simulation. So that's the effect coming out of this. Um, uh, pick up ions. Um, so when you actually look at how to model these boundary conditions, it turns out the pitch up, pick up ions has a, a pitch angle distribution, which can last long enough in the downstream of a determination shot. So this slide to show there are a lot of complications when you look at this in this boundary condition at the termination shock, the pick up ions. When you treat this as a fluid, you really need to worry about how the pitch angle changes. And in order to put that into the code, you make use of these peak uh, simulations or were coming. So this Jadalin et al. Uh, 2020 and 2021, 2022 is detailed calculations of how the distribution, uh, how the pitch angle, for example, and how this ratio of this temperature uh, change as a function of distance from the crossings. So whatever this, this here, you want to lump it into this termination shock. So you want to actually see everything. I'm going to treat downstream up to some distance. Everything here is going to be effectively put into this, this at the termination shock. And uh, this slide is to show it, this is important. In order to actually to get the simulation going, you really need to worry about this mu. It's coming from the pickup ions. It has a much longer distance to vary comparing to this solar wind itself. And this total here is what you put into the termination shock. It's dominated by the pickup ions. It has a strong pitch angle distribution. So that's pretty much all this presentation is. This is to show the in terms of this comparison. Now, one of them is you don't put this, uh, this pickup ion as a, in a, as a boundary at the termination shock, or you compare this as a termination shock. Uh, as I said, you put everything at the boundary. Uh, this is uh, these two parameters differ. So this is the pressure and the temperature. And this shows the difference. So you get this much more extended um, uh, inner helio sheath. So that's, uh, that's how. So I'm going to read through this. Uh, I'm going to leave this conclusion here and, and see whether or not there are questions. <laughs> So, next speaker is Camille Granier. Perfect. So, she will talk about uh, girofluid and girokinetic investigation of the plasmoid instability in collision as current sheets. Hi everyone, uh, do you hear me well? Because I don't speak very loud, I don't know, okay. I think it's okay. Okay, pr closer, okay. So my name is Camille Granier, I'm a PhD student from uh, Université Côte d'Azur and Politecnico di Torino. And uh, today I will talk to you about, uh, I will show you some results of uh, numerical simulations uh, to study the collisionless plasmoid instability. So this is some uh, work done as part of my PhD, but also uh, some work in progress with uh, collaborators. I don't know if you see the cursor, no, ah, okay, so well, I will use the stick. So in this study, I use uh, several uh, modeling approaches, uh, fluid, gyrofluid, and gyrokinetic, and I will start by introducing you the fluid, uh, the result obtained with the fluid approach and the setup that we use. So our uh, fluid model uh, is assuming a strong guide field, so reconnection is taking place in the plane perpendicular to the strong guide field. 
Um, it is uh, describing the electron dynamics, so we have an equation for the electron density and the, the Ohm's law. Um, it is assuming a cold and high mobile ions, so we don't have the uh, ion dynamic, and it is also assuming a negligible uh, beta. Um, it is a collisionless model, so reconnection is driven by um, the um, electron inertia, and we have two independent parameters being the electron, uh, in the electron skin depth and the uh, sonic Larmor radius. So we, we used the Turing um, instability as a, as a, to, to start uh, the, the, the study of the collisionless plasmoid, uh, the collisionless plasmoid instability. So we start from an initial current sheet, which is uh, in unstable to, to Turing modes, and uh, parallel magnetic field lines, uh, and the magnetic field will reverse along uh, x equals zero. Um, so uh, the general idea of the Turing instability is that far from the current sheet, uh, since the current is uh, weak, you have no uh, non-ideal effect to, to drive the reconnection. So um, here you have an ideal region, and at the center of the current sheet, reconnection will take place. Eventually, if, you initial, if your initial uh, current sheet is long enough, you will have a secondary current sheet that will form at your X point. And um, the first part of this work is to characterize this secondary current sheet. So we will measure the length and the width of this current sheet. Um, and we will uh, see their dependence um, uh, of in, in the, the initial parameters, so the electron skin depth, the sonic Larmor radius. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Turing instability, we also uh, look at the dependence on delta prime. And delta prime is a parameter that will tell you um, that is uh, indicating the amount of magnetic energy that is initially stored in your system that will be available to be converted into kinetic energy. Um, so once this secondary current sheet is uh, characterized, uh, eventually it will break into uh, plasmoids. These are uh, tearing mode like uh, perturbations that, we, that will grow and merge. Um, and uh, the second part of the work is to find this, uh, uh, precisely this threshold as a function of the parameters for the, for the, the secondary current sheet to, to be plasmoid and stable. Uh, usually this threshold it is measure, uh, measured as the aspect ratio, so the ratio length to, to width. Um, so I will briefly give a, a very short, non-exhaustive um, uh, introduction about uh, what is already known about the collisional plasmoid instability. So it is known that uh, the reconnection, uh, the resistive reconnection, so the sweet Parker reconnection, is uh, too slow to describe uh, most of the, um, the, the reconnection in nature, such as uh, the classical example is the solar flare. So for instance, if you use the sweet Parker reconnection rate, you will find the reconnection growth rate if you apply this to the solar corona, you will find reconnection rates um, that will take place on time scales of the order of the months of the, or the year, and in reality we observe them on the time scale of the second or the minute. And um, people then show, uh, found out that um, a sweet Parker current sheet that can break into a hierarchy of plasmoid can allow the, the reconnection rate to, to, be, to be faster. So um, then after, the, after that they started to add kinetic effect to, this, to these models. And when you start adding kinetic effects, then you enter a very broad uh, space of parameters, so it becomes difficult to, to identify some thresholds. So usually they, they, they summarize this result in this form of this 2D uh, uh, parameter diagram that was first used in the G. Doton uh, 2011. Uh, they identify two key parameters, so one of them is the Lundquist number, which is uh, proportional to the inverse of the resistivity, and lambda. Lambda is uh, the, the, the length of your system, normalized by the relevant kinetic scale, which will uh, be uh, the ion skin depth or the, the ion sun Larmor radius, depending on whether you have a guide field or not. It will be uh, the ion, ion sun Larmor radius if you have a guide field. Uh, so just briefly on this diagram, you have uh, for a um, resistive uh, regime, you have no plasmoids. As you go to non-collisional regime, you enter a regime with, where you have plasmoids. And as you go on the left of this diagram, you will hit some kinetic scale. And here it was shown by some kinetic simulation of Doton uh, 2006 that uh, um, you don't have plasmoid for um, small, small, uh, for when you are at small uh, scales. And actually, they have this threshold uh, lambda equal 50. In our work, we find the threshold more close to 10 or 20. Something, something. I, can, I think we can go down to 10. So um, the question now is what is you have a purely collisionless uh, um, current sheet and you drive a connection only by, uh, it's only inertial reconnection because it was shown that it provides, it provides very fast reconnection rates. Um, so we use this fluid model 
to uh, characterize first the secondary current sheet. In the first work, we so we start with the, the basic, uh, um, a very simple model with no ions on lamp or radius, and we increase the electron skin. We found that the aspect ratio of the secondary current sheet will decrease as uh, the inverse of the electron skin depth. As you see, the, the geometry of the current sheet will also change a lot. Uh, the current is less uniform along the layers, so you have less um, um, smaller density of magnetic field line that will accumulate along the layer. So this one will be less likely to develop plasmoids. Um, in a second time, we fixed the electron skin depth and we increased the ion sun lamor radius, and we found that the um, aspect ratio will decrease as uh, the um, ion sun lamor radius to the 0.6. Also, the geometry of the current sheet will change a lot as it will take um, a cross shape along the, and, and the current sheet will follow the, the, the shape of the separatrices. Um, then we changed the, the parameter delta prime. So here I'm showing you um, the case uh, with the uh, electron skin depth and uh, uh, no ions on Larmor radius, and uh, three, three different uh, box size along Y. You see that this, delta, this case delta prime equal 14.3 is uh, going to remain stable, and now I'm adding the effect of the ions on Larmor radius. Um, you, you can see this as uh, if you fix DE, so DE D is the same in these two simulations, if you increase the ions on Larmor radius, it can be seen as uh, increasing the bi background electron temperature, so you, in, you, you have uh, an initial condition with an electron temperature that is uh, higher. Um, first, what is interesting is that this case, delta prime equal 14.3, is going to, you, you actually uh, switch from a stable case to an unstable case. So uh, actually the effect, uh, the, the regime rho is larger than D seems to promote the plasmoid formation. And you also have um, a larger number of plasmoids that, that will form. So um, we wanted to, so yes? Uh, uh, sorry? Um, this, the normalization of this, you mean? Uh, it's, it's a characteristic length scale L. Uh, we, we use a normal, alvenic normalization, so time is normalized with uh, the um, alven time, and uh, the, the lengths are normalized by a characteristic length scale, which is, uh, I go back to the equilibrium, the expression of the equilibrium. It is normalizing the, the equilibrium here, so it's the characteristic uh, width of your uh, initial current sheet. So the current sheet is one, the yes, actually, yes. This L is a unity if you want. Yes, also the parameters are normalized by this length. Is, is, is it clear? Uh, okay. So we wanted to summarize those results um, in a 2D uh, parameter space diagram. So now we have uh, the length scale of the secondary current sheet normalized by the electron skin depth and uh, by the ion sun larmor radius. Um, and we found two, two, uh, two thresholds. The first threshold in the case uh, rho s uh, equals zero, uh, we found that it was uh, an aspect ratio of 10, which provides actually, uh, if you use some um, dimensional arguments uh, a la Sweet Parker, you find uh, some growth rate that are a lot faster than uh, the, reconnection, the reconnection rate that you have in the, in the resistive case. And in the case with uh, rho s uh, larger than, the regime rho s larger than d, you actually um, promote the plasmoid to a uh, current sheet that have an aspect ratio even smaller than 10. Um, also, we have, uh, so in, this pa in the paper that has been uh, recently published, uh, Granier et al. 2022, we found also a scaling to approximate this uh, second uh, threshold, the uh, ASAP2, that seems to uh, correctly capture the plasma formation. Um, um, I will just quickly show a very validation of these fluid results with uh, gyrokinetic uh, simulations. So um, the gyrokinetic simulations are performed by a, a collaborator, and uh, we, we, we run the, the, the simulation in the appropriate regime. It is also assuming um, a low beta and a strong guide field, of course. Um, and it allows us to um, validate this, those results, but also to see the role that could play the, the, the closure on the moments. And, um, what, uh, and also if we relax this assumption of uh, immobile ions. And we wanted to see here if those thresholds would uh, significantly change. And apparently, um, the, 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 the threshold doesn't significantly change. And uh, our results are in, in agreement with it. Um, now I will show some results obtained with the gyrofluid model. So um, 
I am adding some uh, finite beta E effects to this, uh, to this study. For that, I am using a gyrofluid, uh, gyrofluid model that is um, uh, also a two-field model de describing the electron dynamic. But now I have some uh, small, small beta E effect, uh, which implies some uh, finite electron Larmor radius effect and also a perturbation of the magnetic field along the guide field direction. Um, also those operators are uh, gyro average operators that can be seen in Fourier space as an exponential of minus k per uh, rho E is the electron Larmor radius uh, squared. Um, <coughs> So first we did some simulation increasing beta. Uh, we are also increasing the mass ratio but keeping the E and rho s squared uh, so fixed. Um, here you have a first simulation, beta equals zero and, and time is increasing in this direction. Uh, you see that you have uh, many modes that are in, uh, becoming unstable in the current sheet. And as you increase beta, uh, it seems that uh, it eventually prevents the, the formation of modes in the current sheet but um, um, we have we have bigger uh, single mode that is growing at the center of the, pl the current sheet. Um, then we, we also compare those results with um, with the gyrokinetic um, simulations. So um, here we are uh, in the marginally stable case. We have a fixed DE and fixed rho S, but a very small beta, and we have a stable current sheet. What we do is we just increase beta, and uh, this current sheet is switching, switching from a stable current sheet to an unstable current sheet, and the results were also validated by gyrokinetic uh, simulations. And uh, the work that is now in progress is the comparison of the uh, energy distribution, because in the fluid and gyrofluid approach, uh, we don't allow some uh, fluctuation of higher order moments, such as uh, temperature. Uh, we, ha we don't have temperature fluctuations. Uh, we don't describe the ion dynamic. And so now we are now comparing how the energy is distributed, because in the fluid approach, it cannot go to some uh, to electron heating, for example, while in the gyrokinetic approach, it can, and we are now comparing this, this um, energy variation. And um, I think it is my, my last slide. So I will uh, eventually leave the conclusion here and I would be glad to take questions. Yeah. Ah, okay, good. So, so yeah, the, the, conc the conclusion is that uh, we have now a, a new phase space diagram for collisionless plasmoid instability that uh, is presented in this uh, paper that has been re um, uh, published um, not a long time ago. Um, also, so our results yield to a, a threshold for plasmoid formation um, that is smaller that was uh, found before by kinetic simulations. Um, we also uh, we we also think uh, a good a good uh, new a good perspective could be to run those simulations in, in 3D because this fluid uh, model seems to be actually accurate and uh, would be actually cheap to uh, not not in terms of computational time would be. Uh, would be uh, actually uh, nice to, to, would be cheaper than, than kinetic or gyrokinetic simulations. Um, and that's it. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, we have time for a few questions. Okay. Start. Okay. I understood the question, but the yes. But here, the the, um, the axes x x and y are normalized by a, le a characteristic length scale L. Ah. Um, Okay, I see. I don't know. I I, I didn't check this. Uh, no, I didn't check this. Uh, we could we could discuss it later, maybe. Other questions? Okay. 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 We can.
Hi, everyone. Uh, in fact, in my PhD thesis at University of Lorraine, I studied tearing mood uh, and magnetic reconnection. But after that, I decided that it will be very nice to explore toroidal geometries and the elegant mathematics of it. So uh, fortunately, I have the opportunity to start a postdoc several months ago at uh, Ecole Centrale de Marseille at University de Marseille. I will present a TABAS code, which is a toroidal accelerated particle simulator to study transport and loss particle, energetic particle in both axisymmetric and uh, non-axisymmetric uh, devices. Here I put two examples of them, the Tokamak axisymmetric device and the non-axisymmetric devices uh, Stellarator. Uh, but however, in both devices, the plasma is toroidally confined by a twisted toroidal magnetic field shown here in a green. However, in tokamak, the boloidal part of this magnetic field is generated by the internal plasma current, which could lead to some current-driven instability, such as uh, tearing mode. While in stellarator, this current confined uh, magnetic field is completely generated by external uh, coils. However, there's advantage and disadvantage for both of them. So to simulate plasma physics, there's, it depends on application of physics and on computational resources. So we have kinetic simulations in which we have a full kinetic solver which solves philosophy equation coupled with Maxwell equation. One example of them, there are a flame 2 2V, flame 2D, 3V, developed by Gizo. And now I'm working on a slim ND, slim ACUD, I call it slim ND, MV, which is, will be full uh, solver in phase space. So it will be one uh, 3D, 3V, and it will be MBI GBU. It will be also multi, uh, for multi species till 1D, 3V, and 2D, 2V. But for 2D, 3V, 3D, 3V, it will be only for one species. At the same time, there are some uh, another codes which benefit from some conserved quantity, like the adiabatic uh, ad variant, uh, variant, invariant here, uh, to reduce the dimensionality of the problem, which lead us under the very big category of zero kinetic theory. Here we have, for example, Jesse La Sancti and other codes. And for example, and for sure, we have the very famous particle and cell codes. In addition, a lot of uh, magnetohydrodynamic fluid. In fact, and we have a hybrid codes which uh, combine with different models depending on the physics. One of them, Flesiator. While in the fusion devices, we have Jorik, Mega, and Coric. In fact, Tabas fall in this category. It's combined, uh, we couple it with both codes. One of them, far 3 d which is a reduced model. Uh, and the another one, it's a Jezela 5D. So uh, the Tabas code, in fact, it's a code that can, uh, follow the uh, can follow the dynamic of energetic particle for the particle itself and also, also in, in the domain of zero kinetics. So it uh, can also follow the uh, guiding center. It's massively parallel on uh, using MBI and GPUs. At the same time, it can work in different uh, coordinate systems. Those coordinate systems can be uh, either simple coordinate systems such as in circular to max, or those coordinate systems obtained by solving kratz shavranov equation using some expansion methods, or for sure the very famous equilibrium uh, derived by using some numerical codes such as vmix, siesta, and disk. Uh, Tabas is, uh, as I said, Tabas was coupled, we coupled Tabas with both far 3 d Gisela 5D. Uh, here, just, I think it's very important to give just, to step for one minute and to explain about uh, geometries in toroidal uh, devices in general. In so fact, you, it solves like test particle like, or you really actually evolve the velocity distribution function? Uh, uh, the, no, it's for only testing the particles, energy alpha particles, okay. uh, for, yes. yeah, for, yes, exactly. So, uh, to stop a minute for about, uh, to speak about the toroidal geometries, in fact, for any coordinate system to be very useful, it should have a simple representation for quantities, it should uh, benefit from any periodicity or symmetric in this system. At the same time, if we can avoid any singular point inside the computational domain, it will be good. If it's aligned with the physics, it's great, as it's the case for straight line, uh, straight field line coordinate systems. It, if it allow 
us to use some energy conserving uh, schemes such as Boris method, it's also good. Uh, to explain it, for example, here I put a realistic, uh, tukamak, a realistic configuration of a tokamak where the nested, where here the nested closed surface are a surface, surfaces of constant magnetic, uh, constant magnetic field. As we can see here in the cylindrical coordinate system RZ5, we have those magnet, uh, surfaces of constant magnetic field. If we have a circular tokamak, here we have a simple, a toroidal, a very simple toroidal magnetic uh, uh, coordinate system where we have rho, the distance from the center, theta boloidal magnetic uh, uh, angle, and we have also phi, which is the toroidal angle. In fact, we notice something very important about this coordinate system. Here R doesn't only denote the distance from the center. It also labels the a surface of a constant uh, with a constant magnetic field. So the question, if we can go from, a, if we can do some uh, coordinate uh, transfer Transformation from this coordinate system to something like that, it will be great. Because this, in this coordinate system, we have a very good alignment also with the physics. To do that, here we can benefit from two additional equations, which are the divergence of, free, uh, of the magnetic field, the div divergence of uh, magnetic field, and also Faraday law, which allow us to go to a straight field line coordinate system. Two very famous, uh, one of them are Hamada coordinate system and Buzal coordinate system. By doing that, we go again to this uh, coordinate system, but now rho doesn't represent the distance from the center of this geometry. Now it's lab it labels the uh, it labels the surface of constant magnetic field. So we can do all of our mathematics and physics in this coordinate system. One big advantage, for example, as an example, for tiering mode. In tiering mode for slab, in slab geometry, we have this condition, the wave vector dot b should be equal to zero. If we go to this coordinate system and we apply this uh, uh, law, we have k, k multiplied with the b. Now this k wave vector, it exists in the boloidal and toroidal plane. So we go to the Fourier space, we have this configuration. Uh, next, as I said, the code, uh, Tabas code, it's uh, first coupled with the FAR 3D code. FAR 3D code has a two version, which is a linear and nonlinear version. It works in Boozer coordinate system, so it benefits from two periodic directions. At the same time, it's a very fast code, which allow us to build a very large uh, training set for machine learning, which I will talk about it later. One of very strong point about this code, it was benchmarked and tested against a lot of toroidal devices in the world, Stellarator and Tokamax. So the code work by, first of all, we have an equilibrium code which solve this equation to fight Boozer, Boozer coordinate system. We only provide the condition for the last closed surface. In addition to experimental profile for the pressure and safety factor, after that it solved this we solve this equation with an equilibrium code. We have R and Z. Those are the surfaces of a nested um, uh, magnetic field. At the same time, we have the metric of the coordinate system, and we have the equilibrium field. So those are the coordinate system in which we solve far 3D solve the equation for as uh, it's, a it's a reduced model, so we have the very usual psi, we have the vorticity, the, ma the pressure, and we have the parallel velocity along the magnetic field in addition to two equations, one intensity equation and one equation for the parallel velocity for energetic particle. So alpha, they could be alpha or for uh, electron cyclotron uh, heating or ion cyclotron heating. And it gives us the uh, profile of this eigenfunction or their dynamic profile if we have a nonlinear system. At the same time, Tabas did the same thing. It started with an equilibrium derived for with a, a numerical code. It built uh, on this equilibrium. We start by calculating the grid. We have, after that, the inverse uh, using the Jacobian and the matrix. We inverse the coordinate system. And before starting our, simula the, our simulation, we adjust the grid. Since if a particle becomes very close to here, we have some points outside this grid which is a problem. So we adjust the grid before starting the simulation. After that, we have a good grid. We initialize the particles. After initializing the particles, we couple it also with var 3D code. We go to the Cartesian coordinate system. We interpolate at the particle position as in particle and cell code. After that, we solve the equation of motion of uh, motions, and we go back to the uh, toroidal coordinate system or straight field line or 
more officially boost our coordinate system here. And we complete doing that. Uh, to explain the problem of interpolation here, if we have a particle which is near the last closed surface, the problem in, uh, in many codes is that when this particle gets here, we have this is the last closed surface, so the points here are not physically defined. So what I have done to really define physical points here, I said, okay, this is not, are not defined, uh, this point is here. What I do, I shifted my square, interpolation square, which could either Lagrange, but not so good Lagrange, B spline interpolation. I shifted the square into the inner side. So here I have a complete square. All the points are defined. I generate randomly a number of points equal to those outside the last closed surface. I interpolate the value of the function at these uh, four points. I solve the inverse problem to find those outside the last closed surface. So now, It's, uh, it's a little bit more complicated. We try to, but we, we can discuss it, but uh, I don't know about this. This is the first time I know it about it. Another issue is that when the particle gets to the last closed surface, we have a computational domain here, so it can be outside. So we check, we have an algorithm that checks the position of the particle, and it chooses the interpolation square, which has the least, num the least number of corrected points to avoid all the effects of interpolation. Then to see the effect, if we calculate this, inter we can calculate these points using some linear interpolation or cubic interpolation. Just to see the effect of interpolation order on the, part the particle trajectory, we have here, I have two, a trapped particle, a banana particle, and this we see here with a cubic uh, interpolation, we have a very nice complete banana particles or a trapped particle, while here using interpolation, linear interpolation, we see that the particle escaped the tokamaks. Uh, here it's a very realistic uh, equilibrium for a D triple I D tokamaks, and escape the tokamaks here. And when zooming on the trajectory of this particle, we see that this type of linear interpolation lead to some uh, numerical drift and the particle escaped the tokamaks. As I said, it's implemented using CUDA and by implementing the CUDA, when we implemented the CUDA on CUDA, we can see that we have about 10, we get about 10 factor of acceleration and we run all of this simulation on Jean Zé supercomputer. Here, an example of the using of the code. Here we have a tiering. It's a very classical, uh, uh, very classical theory of tiering mode in a circular uh, geometry. We have analytical solution for tiering mode here. So we bench the the code. The very first version version of the code was benchmarked against that. So here we can we have a counter bassing uh, particle. We have a trapped particle, banana particles, and we have the co bassing particle. We can see here the main uh, the mean exit probability of the particle from the tokamaks. Uh, as a conclusion, we, what we have done for the several last week, uh, last uh, month is, we in fact uh, upgraded uh, Tabas to, be, to account for re very realistic uh, geometries. At the same time, we implemented 3D based spline to be available uh, using both C CPUs and GPUs. We have a correcting algorithm just to avoid many problems related to the interpolation. And at the same time, we have some results. Uh, we use the code for, we have some results, but not with the tiering mode. We studied alpha and eigen modes in both uh, D triple ID tokamaks and non axisymmetric case we studied for LHD stellarator. At the same time, coupling far 3D with Tabas allow us now to generate a a large training set to use a GANS neural network for some work in uh, Tokamax. Thank you very much. Yes. Would it be possible to, to solve directly in? 
We have it, in fact. We have a, a Ronge Quota coordinate system, but if you notice here, I spoke about policy scheme. Here, and one of nice things about water scheme, it's a conserve, it, it conserves energy, because some, I don't know, because it isn't a simplistic scheme, but it conserves somehow energy. But Ronge Cotta doesn't do that. <coughs> we try it with Ronge Cotta, but for some reason, we try to use, I'm doing that, trying to do some mathematics or metrics to see if we have, we could manage to, in some COVID, in Boozer coordinate system, to have a conservative scheme for Boris, but till now we don't have it. So unfortunately, we do this, uh, here, we do this uh, coordinate transformation to go back uh, to uh, Cartesian coordinate system just to apply a conserved scheme. But we have it in uh, Ronge Cotta, with the Ronge Cotta, yes. One, uh, the diffusive phenomena we are using, it's the, those, any phenomena that lead to a radial electric field, radial electric field of the component. This real, for example, if we have a cheering mode that could lead to a radial component for the, magnet, the electric field, okay, we could have a column force here, Q multiplied with ER. So we have a transport, a, a, a long radial ride action. So the non, when they said non-diffusion uh, transport, they mean, first of all, the transport uh, caused by uh, radial component of E, and the second, there's another transport which results from the velocity across the magnetic field. So those type that lead to transport, radial transport, but there's also the diffusive one when you have uh, collisionality and other type, column also resistivity. I don't know, maybe you can explain it to me, I don't know about this. Uh, but I have a final remark, I, I, sh I think that it can be used in astrophysics somehow, because if we have any closed surface structure, uh, a Boza coordinate system can be established, so we have a closed structure, or almost a closed structure. We, can, we have a, an equilibrium magnetic field. We have some measurement for the profile. So we can go to Boozer coordinate system and we can do this stuff in Boozer coordinate system. Maybe here we have some coordinate uh, transformation because of some problems. But if you want to study some dynamics in loops, you have a periodicity toroidal and a periodicity Boloidal, so you can apply for your transformation, and you have only radial. Uh, and there's a bunch of, of instabilities which occur in this configuration, at least in Tokamax and that's the physics. Just a quick question. Did you ever think to add some electrostatic tools? But since we are at the boundary of this scrap of layer, right? And the last closest of layers. In fact. No, uh, mm -hmm. in fact, it exists here. It's there, right? Because here we are going, we are using two. Far 3D, which solve uh, a system of six equation with Landau closure, and at the same time, there's Gisela Kud, Gisela 5D, which study uh, the turbulence in Tokamak. So they are coupled here. Okay. It's just one part. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much.
Okay, thank you for the introduction. For, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers who gave me the opportunity to present these results, uh, despite of the fact that uh, this talk has actually little to do with uh, astrophysics or, or space physics. Uh, but nevertheless, I hope it might be of uh, some interest, perhaps, for uh, modeling uh, collisionless uh, plasmas. And these are results obtained in collaboration with a number of people who are listed here in alphabetical order, and these are uh, Dario Borgogno, Camille Granier, Daniela Grasso, Thierry Passo, and Pierre-Louis Sulem. So, uh, similarly to uh, fluid models, uh, who are, uh, mm, roughly speaking, derived uh, by taking moments of kinetic equations, so gyrofluid models are obtained by taking moments of uh, uh, gyrokinetic equations. Uh, as described, for instance, in these uh, references. Gyrokinetic equations uh, describe the, the evolution of uh, a distribution function of gyrocenters. And gyrocenters uh, um, have uh, trajectories on a reduced uh, phase space uh, in which the uh, coordinate corresponding to the angle of gyration of an uh, actual particle around the magnetic uh, ignorable. Because uh, gyrokinetic uh, models uh, um, are valid for frequencies much lower than the uh, ion cyclotron frequency, or than the gyration frequency. So one of the advantages of the gyro approach is that in its derivation it uh, avoids uh, complications due to uh, gyro viscous cancellation, which, is, which occurs uh, in an uh, ordinary fluid approach uh, at low frequencies. And uh, uh, similarly to fluid, uh, um, the ordinary fluid approach, also for a gyro fluid model, so you have to face uh, a closure problem if you want to find a finite uh, um, system. So that you need to express uh, uh, higher order moments in terms of lower order moments. However, uh, unlike uh, ordinary um, fluid models, such as those derived from Vlasov systems, for instance, where you need to uh, constrain uh, a finite number of high their moments in terms of lower order moments. For gyrofluid models, you have to um, constrain uh, infinite number of moments in terms of lower order moments. So in this uh, gyrofluid context, uh, we um, wanted to derive a model possessing a, a number of features which, at least to the best of our knowledge, were not uh, possessed, uh, not altogether, by previous uh, gyrofluid models present in the literature. So we wanted to, to derive a model for collisionless plasmas, accounting for equilibrium temperature anisotropies, uh, finite beta, uh, with S uh, here labels um, the particle species, and we consider uh, just two species, electrons and one species of ions. Uh, electron inertia, which uh, can drive a reconnection in collisionless plasmas. We require this gyrofluid model to uh, inherit uh, a Hamiltonian structure from uh, the gyrokinetic uh, parent model in its non-dissipative limit. And this uh, guarantees that no fake dissipation is introduced in the derivation of the model and also helps to uh, identify further constants of motion. And we also consider a local model, so we neglect uh, background spatial gradients of uh, like density and temperature field, which are relevant for tokamaks, perhaps uh, the first approximation less relevant for, for space plasmas. So the starting point for uh, the derivative gyrofluid model is this gyrokinetic model uh, presented by Kuntz et al. This is the gyrokinetic equation. And uh, uh, because we are interested in the, in the Hamiltonian structure, uh, it is, um, we formulated this uh, dynamical system. And for it is uh, uh, practical to, for, to use as dynamical variable this tilde gs, which is a linear combination of the perturbation of the gyrocenter distribution function, uh, tilde fs, plus uh, a term depending on the fluctuations of the um, parallel component of the magnetic potential along uh, a guide. So here I have to provide some uh, definitions. So this gyrokinetic model assumes that the plasma is close to an equilibrium uh, state uh, given by this B Maxwellian, where here I, I emphasize the, the difference between the uh, parallel and, equi and perpendicular equilibrium temperatures. Um, this uh, square bracket uh, is defined here as a canonical between the variables x and y on a Cartesian coordinate system, x, y, z. And uh, a strong uniform guide field is uh, assumed to be along the z uh, direction. 
So for the spatial domain, we consider just a, a box with periodic boundary conditions. And uh, uh, the parallel indicates a parallel um, um, component of the velocity of the gyro centers. And mu s is the lowest order magnetic moment of the gyro center of species s. Qs and ms are uh, uh, charge and mass of a particle of a species s. N0 uh, is the equilibrium um, uh, density, which, as I said, we assume to be homogeneous. These are the already mentioned temper equilibrium temperatures. And uh, this uh, uh, operator, this uh, script uh, J, um, are gyro um, average operators, which are best expressed uh, in Fourier space, where they amount to uh, multiplication operators times the zeroth order Bessel functions and uh, first order Bessel function divided by AS, where AS is the square wave number times uh, this quantity, which actually corresponds to the Larmor radius of the species S. So the gyrokinetic system also uh, contains some electromagnetic quantities, namely fluctuations of the electrostatic potential, uh, of the Z component of the magnetic vector potential, and of the um, perturbation of the magnetic field along uh, the guide field direction. So to close the uh, system, these uh, three electromagnetic quantities have to be expressed in terms of the dynamical variable uh, tilde gs. And this is done by means of three uh, static relations. One of these is quasi-neutrality. Quasi-neutrality, which uh, in terms of a particle distribution function takes this uh, simple, uh, more familiar form. But when written in gyro center, variables takes this complicated form so introduced uh, um, the volume element in a velocity space. And two more relations to close the system are two projections of Ampere's law. Again, uh, Ampere's law, um, in terms of a particle distribution function, has this uh, simple form. But uh, when going to the gyro center representation, the uh, two projections are this uh, more complicated. And here I also introduced uh, a parameter theta s, which measures the temperature anisotropy for the uh, species s and the parallel thermal speed. So this uh, parent gyrokinetic model can be shown to possess a Hamiltonian structure, which means that the equations can be written in this form, where h is a Hamiltonian functional, given here, and uh, uh, this can be shown to uh, correspond when taken in the isotropic limit, so when there is no temperature anisotropy. And when we're written in terms of the um, particle uh, distribution function, corresponds to the generalized energy functional already identified in gyrokinetic models by uh, House, et al., and Shikochiki, et al. And this is the corresponding uh, Poisson, non-canonical Poisson bracket, uh, in terms of which one can uh, uh, obtain the It's a, a B Maxwellian. Uh, so you have an isotropy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was just saying, um, in these two papers, uh, an isotropic, an isotropic limit was considered. And uh, you can say that if you go to the isotropic limit of the anisotropic uh, model, okay. you, you, you get uh, the same energy. So it's, it's an so isotropic limit is a particular limit, but the model has anisotropy. Okay, so to, from this model to derive the gyrofluid model, we follow a rather standard procedure so that we uh, expand uh, our um, gyro center the perturbed distribution function in terms of uh, um, uh, Hermit uh, uh, polynomials for the parallel velocity and Laguerre uh, polynomials for the magnetic mo moment, which includes the perpendicular velocity. And the coefficients of this expansion, Fmn, uh, for each species uh, are actually proportional to the perturbed gyrofluid moment, which become then so the, the dynamical variable of, of the gyrofluid models. And they are labeled by two indices, one for the uh, referring to the parallel velocity, and the uh, uh, second one referring to the um, magnetic moment or perpendicular velocity. So if you insert this uh, expansion into the uh, above shown uh, um, gyrokinetic equation and project along the, the uh, um, basis of Hermit and Laguerre um, polynomials, you obtain evolution equations for your gyrofluid moments. 
Here uh, we consider, uh, we want to obtain uh, this is um, in the first step, uh, gyro fluid model ev evolving uh, just the first two uh, moments, so uh, density and parallel velocity fluctuations. And when, uh, uh, so projecting this um, the equation obtained uh, by this expansion, also some uh, the gyro, kinetic gyro average operators uh, uh, translate into other gyro average operators that I define here with BS uh, given by the squared uh, um, wave number times the thermal squared Larmo radius. Uh, okay, so this is the, for example, the resulting equation for, uh, um, city for, for a species S. So in this equation, uh, uh, you, I emphasized the, here the presence of uh, a moment uh, of a second order in the parallel velocity, a zero order in the perpendicular velocity, and this is uh, somehow analogous to, uh, okay, uh, to, to, the, um, uh, to what happens in, uh, in uh, usual uh, ordinary um, uh, fluid models where you have for the moment of order one, the, mo the equation for evolving the moment of, of order one uh, presents the, depends on the moment of order two. However, for general fluid models, you have also an infinity of moments uh, in the perpendicular velocity. Um, in addition to this, one has on a complicated uh, electromagnetic terms, also depending on an uh, infinite uh, uh, number of terms. So one way to um, uh, close the system, uh, straightforward procedure, was just to set equal to zero all the extra moments. This was a procedure adopted in previous uh, gyrofluid approach. This uh, leads to a Hamiltonian gyrofluid models, but uh, uh, one needs to approximate uh, these uh, electromagnetic uh, terms. An alter alternative uh, strategy that we follow here is to use uh, what we re refer to as a quasi-static closure. And this means that we um, obtain the closure starting from the linear dis dispersion relation of the gyrokinetic equation about the vacuum state and consider it in the limit of a very slow um, uh, parallel phase velocity, slow compared to the uh, therm parallel thermal speed. In this limit, uh, the, uh, in the response of the gyrocenter distribution function in Fourier space is given by this expression, from which one can obtain uh, the corresponding expression for the moments. So the idea is just to uh, have the evolution equations for uh, the first two moments uh, and uh, replace all the infinite uh, higher order moments by this uh, um, by this uh, expression, so induced uh, by the dispersion relation in a, in a specific limit. If one does this, uh, one obtains uh, remarkable uh, uh, cancellations, and uh, which so removes an infinity of terms uh, in the electromagnetic bracket, uh, removes uh, the second order uh, term, which is uh, proportional to parallel temperature fluctuations, so the resulting model is uh, isothermal, uh, in the parallel velocity, and uh, um, so one obtains a closed system. These are the resulting two evolution equations for density and parallel velocity uh, for the species S, written in normalized uh, form. Where here I also introduced the parameter uh, tau perp S, which is a range of perpendicular uh, temperatures. Uh, so the resulting model has the same structure of a previous uh, gyro model, but now it, it accounts for a temperature anisotropies, which is... Me, yeah. but, but therefore, this is a P0 pair. Uh, that P0 that is fixed, right? Cannot vary consistently. No, it's fixed. It's an equilibrium. So there is anisotropy in the equilibrium temperature. So any uh, instability due to an anisotropy is, is discarded. Uh, well, I mean, but, but you can have, uh, like, fi I mean, you can have a fire hose. Uh, okay. Even if it's fixed. Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, you, you can, uh, yes, you, 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 we actually compare with. Oh, yeah, linear instability. Spe spectral instability. So you, then, of course, it does not saturate. You don't have fluctuations in the, in the anisotropic fluctuation, but the linear instability. 
And uh, uh, so the Hamiltonian structure is uh, guaranteed because the, this form of equations falls into a more general scheme for Hamiltonian gyro fluid models. And uh, although here I shown the, um, just the derivation of the first two moments, uh, this procedure can actually be extended to an arbitrary number of moments. So I could, fi I could uh, with the, in the same procedure, obtain moments evolving also the parallel temperature, parallel heat fluxes, and so on. Uh, how am I doing on time? Uh, uh, okay, thank you. Okay, the model is closed by the corresponding static uh, relations uh, obtained just by inserting the closure into the quasi neutrality here and the two other amperes law. And uh, this is the ex explicitly the Hamiltonian structure given by this. Uh, Hamiltonian functional with MS uh, defined as the parallel uh, canonical momentum. And uh, so this, this actually descends di directly from the Hamiltonian of the gyrokinetic model once you insert the expansion with a quasi static closure. And this is the corresponding uh, Poisson bracket, which, uh, in uh, particular in the two dimensional limit, possesses an infinite number of uh, Casimir invariants, which is uh, also analogous to other. The reduced fluid or gyro fluid models such as those by Skep, Pegoraro, Kufshinov, and um, Keramidas, Karidakos, uh, Wellbrook, and Morrison. So, so it has uh, conservation properties. And uh, so just to conclude, uh, we also consider a two field, uh, two dimensional simplified version of this model focusing just on electron dynamics. Uh, the mm, functionals of the um, Electron density and, and parallel velocity okay, form a subalgebra so that the, the Hamiltonian structure is automatically preserved. We assume the uh, so cold ions. So here we removed even the equilibrium uh, uh, anisotropy of the temperature. We brutally uh, simplify the coupling with the ion dynamics, uh, supposing the ion gyro center and parallel velocity are equal to zero, which is actually not a correct asymptotic uh, limit. Uh, unless what you're in the very small beta uh, regime. And uh, one of the things, this two field model for density, electron density, and parallel uh, um, momentum, closed by, again, uh, um, um, quasi neutrality and two uh, Ampere's law. And here, in this normalization, we have uh, DE as the electron scheme depth as a parameter, and rho s as a sonic Larmor radius. And uh, okay. Okay, with, with this uh, simplified model, which is uh, we uh, applied it to investigate, uh, uh, <coughs> among other things, uh, uh, linear stability of uh, uh, collisionless uh, uh, tearing modes, uh, showing, for instance, uh, numerically how uh, the effect of a beta E can damps uh, the uh, growth rate of uh, collisionless uh, tearing modes, uh, and uh, in agreement with the gyrokinetic uh, results. And uh, so this is uh, beta E at fixed rho s and, and uh, de. And uh, whereas uh, uh, the dependence on B for, for fixed uh, mass ratio and uh, electron scheme depth, so where B varying beta E essentially means varying the, the, temp the electron equilibrium electron temperature, shows in a, for, for a small uh, um, beta, uh, a destabilizing role of beta, which, con which uh, confirms, I mean, the, the dispersion relation known uh, um, by, um, by the article by Porcelli in 91. But for larger beta, uh, the stabilizing role uh, uh, is visible, which uh, uh, also um, becomes uh, uh, more important for larger DE which amounts to a uh, stabilizing role of electron uh, finite alarm or radius effect on the, on the collision steering mode. And then we, uh, other um, um, investigations we made, the other application of this model, were to study the nonlinear evolution of collision steering mode, where uh, um, the, in particular the role of the nonlinear gr uh, grad B drift uh, was uh, emphasized. And then, uh, as uh, uh, mentioned by the previous talk by Camille Granier, also um, um, the comparison between gyrokinetic and gyrofluid investigation of the plasmoid instability and the effect of beta, finite beta on it, particular. And uh, I leave you with the last slide of conclusions.
always wondering whether you can start from here in that case to develop uh, a collisional uh, or however dissipative regime using one of those Casimirs uh, as a, an entropy for a epileptic formalism. Uh, do you think it makes any sense from a physical point of view or it is just uh, a mathematical uh, recovery? Uh, I, I don't think any of the Casimir invariants that you have in the 2D case can be associated with an entropy. Um, so you can to the physical entropy. Yes, 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 yes. Because uh, or to sum the up of functional that goes to a maximum and some uh, relaxation takes place. Uh, uh, it's, um, I mean, the, this kind of remarks are a linear combination of uh, density and canonical momentum. Uh, you might want for us. I, 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 don't, I do not have, I don't see a moment, uh, physically some okay. reason to say I want to maximize in particular this quantity okay. uh, as a result of, uh, of extremizing a uh, result of yes, 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 yes. So, I mean, it's uh, probably technically possible. Yes, but but that, uh, what does it mean? Uh, right. yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Let's thank our speaker again. Thank you, thank you very much. Good evening to all ladies and gentlemen. I am Gabriele Celebre. I am a physical PhD student of the uh, University of Calabria with, uh, professor, with supervisor Sergio Servidio and uh, Franco Valentini. And uh, now I will show you our work about the phase, space, the phase space dynamics of the Vlasov of Poisson system, analyzed in several regimes, both uh, collisionless and collisional, and analyzed with uh, the use of the algorithm of the Fourier MIT transform. So we must introduce the fact that, uh, obviously, plasmas are very complex to analyze in general, because they have, can uh, al almost always have uh, some uh, nonlinear uh, effect, between interaction, for example, between uh, 
the, the particles of the plasmas and the, the, the electromagnetic field, and so it can happen a, a full variety of uh, uh, phenomena that are different, that are very difficult to, to describe. So in order to do that, we can, for, for example, use the, uh, uh, the Boltzmann model, so a kinetic model rather than uh, a fluid, a fluid uh, MHD model, how uh, I, we have done in this work. And in particular, for example, we have analyzed a, um, enough sim simplified uh, case, that case 1D, 1B in Vlasov Poisson and Boltzmann Poisson system, with uh, a full variety of uh, uh, initial cases, initial uh, situation that uh, leads to the very different, different plasma regimes. And in particular, for each case, we have analyzed the output result, the, the result of the, um, of the distribution function f, with uh, a Fourier Hermit trans a transform, a spectral transform of uh, uh, both the, x, uh, the physical space, the x space, and the velocity space. In particular, we can see from this expression that starting f is function of x, v, and t. When we transform in the view, in the view space, we uh, tra um, to translate the, the v dip dependence on our index m dependence, and then with a standard fast Fourier transform, we pass from a hermit, uh, Fourier mit coefficient that depends only on the time, the time t. The numerical resolution is uh, done with, uh, as I said before, um, a series of, um, of simplification. In particular, we consider a plasma composed of uh, fixed protons with uh, a particle density that is a fixed constant n0. And zero. And uh, so the only, the only distribution function to calculate is the electron distribution function that we call simply f. And so plasma is magnetized because uh, we, s we talk about the Wasson Poisson regime, and f depends on x, v, and t. We've had periodicity along x. At the equilibrium, so we have the Maxwellian uh, function that we call Fm, and in the general case of, of, in which we are, have also the, um, the collisional term, this is the, the well-known expression of the Lasso Poisson system. So in order to, to solve that, uh, we have uh, had to ad ad dimensionalize the, all the, the quantities using some uh, characteristic uh, lengths and times, such as, for example, the, 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 um, the by-length of the electrons, the thermal, elect the thermal velocity of electrons, the plasma frequency, and so on, and limited uh, the range of, the, of these uh, starred, uh, adimensionalized uh, variables. And in particular, to solve the system that, uh, uh, that results from this normal... Uh, this, uh, for example, in a case where uh, they, we have not the, the collisional term, we can use the, the splitting method of cheng knorr that splits this, uh, the Vlasov equation in two advection equations, one an order over x and the other order v, and so we know the, the, the exact solutions of these two singular equations because uh, er, they are given by these two um, translational operators, lambda x and lambda v. And so, in particular, uh, we combine these two, these, two, um, these two operators in this way. So, m making a, f a first, uh, during a time step of the, sol of the code, an half time step of the translation uh, lambda x, then a full translation of lambda v, and then uh, uh, the other half step equation, where the instruction, uh, the, the information about this lambda v, uh, that is the electric field, is given by the, the Poisson uh, equation that is solved thanks to a, a, standard, uh, a standard spectral, uh, spectral method. So, we can also talk about the Fourier mid transform that we use. We can build, build a, a class of a, a, an orthonormal function that is the PCM, we call it the PCM, that are the gauss hermit orthonormal function that are shown in this plot. In particular, they are the product between the a, a Gaussian and the number M er, hermit polynomial. And so we can see that first the, the PC0 is a, a Gaussian, instead when we increase the, the index m, 
we obtain a, um, a series of, uh, of functions that uh, oscillate on scales that are smaller and smaller. So this means that, such as in the, in the case of transform, a, a contribution of, uh, for example, the perturbation of the, of the equilibrium with a smaller scale corresponds to one that is concentrated mainly of the, uh, the coefficient that have, that have the, um, an, an higher value of m. So in particular, I mean, transform is, uh, some, is uh, simply described by this product that we have uh, estimated with a Gauss quadrature. And so we can also complete the spectral decomposition with an, a Fourier transform instead in the X space with the, the standard expression of, of, the, of the Fourier transform. In particular, we can also spend a word about the collisional term, the F and the T call, that is modeled using the Daugherty operator, that is a, a particular type of, uh, of Fokker Planck operator that uh, is uh, dependent of this nu zero. Nu zero is can be just written in this way, where G is the plasma parameter normalized, obviously, of the system. When it's zero, this term can be neglected, so we, we stay in the collisionless case. Instead, when G is, uh, is increased, also the effect of this collision increases. So we can start with uh, several starting condition, starting from, for example, a, a, a very simple situation of a linear uh, perturbation with a small uh, electric field and also a small uh, perturbation function. Oh, no. And then we have extended the case with a non-linear situation. But we also studied some uh, uh, instability, such as the bump on tail instability or two-beam instability, modifying the equilibrium function. And then we have studied a case where uh, feeding the energy of the, first, of the first electric modes of the electric field, we have created a, a turbulence. And now we can see the result of these seven runs that are reported here, the parameters and the parameter G, the plasma parameter. And in particular, the most important role is due to this A, that is the the, the parameter that represents the amplitude of the perturbation at, uh, at the starting time. So, when this parameter is small, we have a linear situation. Instead, when it's, uh, it's enough high, we have uh, this, in a linear case, or in case of uh, an instability, we start from a seed of, uh, small, um, of small amplitude, and then it can, uh, can develop in, uh, in a case uh, very... Uh, in a case of uh, a strong instability, even starting from a, a small seed. So, for example, this is the, the run number one. This is a linear but collisionless regime, where we have obviously the well-known effect of filamentation of the phase space, as you can see during the time evolution. And uh, the, 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 um, the performance of the Hermit transform transforms this uh, effect in uh, a plot of the square of the Fm average over x in a case where there is a parabolic pattern that has this specific uh, exact form that is one half k0 square t square where k0 is the maximum the, the, the minimum value of the, the, the fundamental wavelength of the of the box we have used and in particular in, it arrives until the, the maximum uh, value of m permitted by our quadrature and then as a uh, numerical bouncing due to the aliasing of the system. And so we can see also that uh, uh, the amplitude of this, uh, of this peak is not constant but is as it follows a power law of minus one half that is due to the nature of the um, of the PCM that we can use. So it is not uh, a dissipation because we, uh, we, we don't have a collision, but it's uh, the, the form of this, uh, of the Fourier Hermit, or the Hermit, uh, Gauss Hermit function, this form, whose amplitude decreases, that, uh, uh, that causes this. Uh, this yes. 
and the maximum value we get to reach is 800 because after that the gauss hermit uh, the the the, the, fall, the, um, the finding of the parameters that we use to the gauss hermit quadrature becomes uh, um, enough difficult to to calculate the roots of the hermit polynomial number 800 and so we start we have a stop here we also used the other uh, we also started from other work that was this, this value as uh, a threshold value, so we use this, uh, exactly, exactly this, uh, this value for the hermit. So I'm just kind of going in that direction. Does it become difficult numerically to build a very high order hermit? Mm, yes. The, 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 the calculation of the quadrature becomes different. The calculation of the roots of to, to build the, the, um, the non uh, the, the non the non spaced non spaced non non equally spaced uh, grid for the for the quadrature. For some special functions, there are clever tricks that people do to be able to go to high order, like for sphere for harmonics and so forth. You can't go to very high order sphere for harmonics like direct quadrature, but there are things that people do in summing to go to like very very high order. Have you investigated whether there are? Mm. No, this no. We have not investigated this this thing. Yes, uh, the integration with the Gauss Hermit quadrature, and so we have we have uh, to find the roots of the Hermit polynomial number 800. So we have uh, simply with uh, some methods, also with Runtor uh, Rapson method, for example, to find these roots with these roots, and then use, the, use them. So, uh, example. Okay. So, in the same instead, we if we pass to the run number two, that is uh, linear but collisional regime, we see we see a clear difference between the is the same uh, the same convexity of the of all the other parameters except g are the same. But when uh, this uh, this cascade reaches the highest m uh, values are uh, this cascade is suppressed because of the of the collision so we can see also the that the that the, um, the emit modes with highest m so the, the smallest uh, velocity scales are most affected affected in a shorter time of this uh, suppression scheme and so you also see that the the power law of before is uh, lost because simply the she has a decay, an exponential decay of uh, of the peak uh, of the amplitude of the peak in the in the Hermit uh, transform. You say, for example, another example is the run number three that is non-linear. So we have uh, no, the first case where there is uh, also a a sort of um, of filamentation, but then is uh, suddenly uh, dominated by the presence of the vortexes created in the O'Neill scenario. So, in this case, we have uh, this uh, situation in the Hermit spectrum, where uh, we have a, a component of energy that travels along the linear cascade, so the parabolic cascade, and also bounces and makes the aliasing. But at the same time, the vortex excites at, uh, in a very uh, short time, also all the available um, velocity, um, velocity scales. And so, we have the contribution of these uh, two different uh, transport uh, method, and uh, then the linear contribution becomes much uh, more broader and uh, smaller in amplitude, and then this disappears, and it cannot more be distinguished from the background, because also the, the aliasing, for example, at long time disappears, the, the filamentation, sorry, the filamentation at long times disappears, and so we also have this, uh, this situation. Instead, for example, if we perform also the, the, Fourier, the, Fourier, the Fourier transform using x, we have a, 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 a plot as a function of j and m, and we see that at the beginning the energy is concentrated at large scales, both in physical space and both in velocity scales, and then it explodes especially on m, like in this case, and then we can also see this, uh, this contribution, this contribution of this uh, main linear cascade, and also that uh, in a, only in a second moment there is also the, the expansion of, uh, over in the direction of J. We can also continue, if also, also run, we have done the same uh, process, the same data analysis. So, for example, we 
we, we can uh, I can see you some uh, some examples very quickly. So for example, this is the run of the bump on tail stability that starts with a seed very slow, very very small, as we can see before. It's can so before, but then also the the we also can see the for the formation of the vortexes. Or for example, the two beam instability when around v equals zero, we have the formation of two vortexes that then merge in one uh, in only one. And then the run number seven is a, say, a case where we have excited ten different uh, ermit, ten different Fourier modes of the electric field, and this uh, provo uh, provokes the, their non-linear interaction and the formation of uh, of a turbulent situation. This uh, corresponds to different Hermit spectra. For example, in a case uh, where the collisions are dominant, is this uh, this run four is a non-linear but at the same time collisional. This case. Simulation, where in the first part of the time we have the same behavior, the, the, the fill of all the available uh, velocity scales, but then we see the, the purple region of the graph that uh, becomes uh, more and more important uh, as time passes. And uh, this dumps not only the, obviously the, the, linear, uh, the linear cascade, but also the non-linear contribution of the vortexes. Instead, in run number seven, we have uh, we have uh, 10 different uh, uh, linear cascades, one for each uh, excited mode, but then they mix, they are dumped, and so on, and this, uh, at, the, at the end we don't see, uh, don't see the, the linear effect, obviously, because we passed in a, in a turbulent situation. Now, in this spectra, we can also calculate some... Uh, some power law that essentially in the non-linear case where the, the advection uh, term is, uh, is dominant, uh, follow the rule uh, 5 uh, over 2, in this case, in this case, in this case, whereas in the two beam instability follow a different law that is uh, 3 over 2. And in particular, we can also see the effect of uh, the adding uh, of the different shape of the equilibrium function also in the Hermit transform that are, that are this... Uh, black line that also that must be considered in the, in the, in the simulation. The Fourier Hermit spectra instead also have a different behavior because, for example, we can have a situation where the maximum, uh, the, 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 the anisotropy is due to the prevalence of the move towards higher m rather than j like in run number five and number number four and number and number five. Instead, when there is a lot of energy, such as in the two beam instability and the turbulent case, we have this uh, diagonal uh, flux that uh, involves both J and M uh, almost at, uh, at the same time. And, uh, uh, and in conclusion, we can also get a, a nonlinear version of uh, a budget law of Shekochin in 2008 that has this form, this is a, a dif differ differential form, and this is this, uh, the integrated form. In particular, we have that this E is the energy of the electric field. F is the sum of this F beta that are the uh, contribution, uh, are energy that are associated to the this is the perturbation of delta F with an exponent beta plus one. And then we have this uh, C beta that are the, uh, some values that uh, are dependent from the collisional term. So when uh, it's collisionless, uh, the system, this, uh, this term is zero. In particular, the sum between the, the energy of the electric field, the energy of the perturbations, minus the energy that is uh, dumped by the, the, the collisions must be equal to a constant. And so we saw that, that uh, in a linear regime, we can also, for example, uh, truncate the, all the, the series F and C at their first term, F1 and C1, that, 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 uh, that correspond to the quadratic term of the, of the delta F. And so we can see that uh, the, the approximation that are the dashed lines follow enough well the the values expected for the all the series that are the solid line, in a case uh, linear such as the run number two. Instead, when we use, for example, we try to approximate this, uh, this series 
at the first term with a turbulent, for example, a turbulent uh, regime, we see that uh, the, the situation is completely different because this, uh, this uh, approximation fails substantially immediately because the, the, the trend of the number one, the, 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 the model number one, is completely different between this uh, several order of magnitude higher than uh, what expected with all this of the sum. And so it, it also cannot uh, uh, respect the energy conservation substantially. And so, in conclusion, we have, can see that uh, substantially we managed to investigate uh, a simplified case that is the Wasserstein Poisson system, but uh, with the high resolution and uh, so an accurate simulation. In particular, we can also have see, uh, see uh, that also with all this, um, this simplification, we have, uh, can have a, a strong variety of, uh, of system, and each of them has a typical Fourier meet cascade that can be measured, uh, for example, in simulation, but also in uh, from uh, starting from the experimental data of the of the of the solar wind uh, missions. And so, uh, this is uh, my presentation.
Bak Shadi talk will be moved as the first talk of the day instead of last. And then everybody will shift by one. So that means we don't have to listen to Sergio first thing. Okay. Good. I can sleep. I can sleep. So Shadi will be nine. Yes. And then Sergio at 10, and then all the others. No, but you could come at 9.25 if you want to hear the first presentation. Yes. Everybody should come.